All right, I think we're in business. So EKGs. So we're doing uh, all about EKGs. So you're not just have to, you don't just have to recognize the rhythm and say, oh, that's sinus rhythm, or that's sinus tac, or that's AFib, or that's VTAC. That's kind of what you learned in physiology as far as the, the P wave, the QRS, the T wave, and maybe what sinus rhythm, sinus bradys, sinus tac looked like. But then now we're going to expand on that, learn a few more rhythms, but also going to understand what the causes of those rhythms are. Why do you have that sinus tac? Why do you have that sinus brady? Why are you AFib? What's the difference, right? So you have to know the causes of AFib, causes of VTAC, causes of asystole, and then you have to learn the symptoms. The symptoms are the EKG strip itself, right? And sometimes there's a few symptoms that a patient might report, and if every fast heart rate report, they report palpitations. My heart, I feel palpitations, right? And then when they get serious, when they get complications of that rhythm, they're going to start getting more serious side effects, more serious symptoms, which we'll go into, right? And then uh, you have to know the treatment for each one of these rhythms. What, how do I fix AFib? How do I fix sinus tachycardia? How do I fix this? What do I expect the fix to be, right? The doctor says give atropine for someone with sinus tachycardia. That is wrong. So you have to recognize that as a safe new nurse, okay? And finally, they know what the nursing interventions are. Luckily, the nursing interventions for every rhythm are pretty much the same, all right? There's very few things that are different, all right? And we test you on, what, on things that are different. So that's a good thing to, to recognize. When we say, oh, this is the only one that does this, that's probably a test question, right? Or this one's different, or this one's deadly, or this one's lethal, this one causes strokes, right? Only one of these rhythms causes a stroke, okay? All right, so EKG. Right? You may see when you Google questions, say in-class questions for EKG. ECG is also good, just K is just cardiac in German. Okay, so EKG basics. You're like, well, these aren't basics. This is all you know, physiology and anatomy. And sometimes we have to refresh it. Some of us haven't taken anatomy and phys for five years, 10 years. Other of us have taken it six months ago and you're like, this is boring, I already know this. Other people six months ago only intellectually vomited the material onto that physiology test and they have forgotten it since, all right? So that's the idea behind understanding the anatomy and phys, and again, understanding this is where you get the why behind why does, why is there an AV node block? Why do people have AV node blocks? Well, we even know where the AV node is and what its purpose is. And SA node, like why does the heart rate faster or slower? So that's the idea behind knowing the anatomy and phys behind it. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the SA node up here, right? Up there in the wet atrium is that? It's the right atrium, right? And the valves and atriums and ventricles, that will be valves, that will be cardiac on the second exam. But uh, right now we're focused on the interior parts of those walls, the SA node, AV node, bundle branch, your AV nodes right here, there's our AV node, SA nodes there, doesn't really show up that great. And then of course we have this big dividing line right here that separates the top half from the bottom half. What's the top half? Atria, what are the bottom half? ventricles. Also, the top half is called supraventricular. When we talk about rhythms, you have ventricular rhythms down here, ventricular rhythms, and supraventricular rhythms up here. So we have tachycardias, which are fast or slow rhythms. Fast rhythms. They can have supraventricular tachycardias or ventricular tachycardias, right? And they have different, they, the cause is pretty, very similar, but uh, you know, the treatment will be different because our goal is to maybe work on the AV node when we're trying to fix SVTs, right? Maybe the atria are way too fast and you have a gatekeeper in the heart and that gatekeeper is the AV node. So let's suppress the AV node so it doesn't let rhythms get through. So you're slow, so you slow down the heart rate when someone's heart rate's too fast, okay? All right, so we're going to the details of the different parts of the EKG, okay? So there's always uh, you know, electrical activity and then what precedes that, or sorry, what follows that is a mechanical activity, right? So your atria depolarize, right? And then you can see that if you put some leads on the chest, those leads are just like really low amplitude magnets and they will deflect, they will go upwards when a positive force goes towards it. So when our atria depolarize, right? Your EKG is gonna see that. And that is called what wave of the EKG? That's the P wave, right? And we can look at P wave morphology. We're not really gonna test you on that, look into that right now. But uh, the P wave is, you can tell different things. You can tell someone has COPD based on their P wave. You can tell if someone has valvular issues based on their P wave. So you get a lot of information from the P wave, okay? 
Just similarly, when you have after the P wave, you have that's the electrical activity. You have atrial contraction, which technically is systole is te technically contraction. But when we say systole, we're really talking about the ventricles. So the ventricles are the really the, the business maker of the heart. 80% of your cardiac output comes from the ventricles, right? That little 20% is that little atrial kick right at the very very end of um, diastole. We kick that blood into the ventricles, and then our ventricles contract. And how did our ventricles contract? We had to depolarize them. We had to send electrical activity through the heart to depolarize that uh, those ventricles, right? So we depolarized it, and then we can. That's a huge. Ventricles are much more m muscular than the atria, so you're going to have much higher amplitude electrical activity as you'll be able to pick up on that little tiny little magnet or lead on the chest, right? So that little that little wave that you, that, that comes for ventricular depolarization is called what? The QRS, right? So our atrial depolarization is there, and then we got ventricular depolarization, and we can recognize that on the EKG, and the ventricles are sick, they're delayed for some fashion, that QRS can get longer and longer, it can get bigger, right? The other reason why that QRS might be big is, or, or I should say, well, the reason why it's thin is because we have highways through the, through the ventricles, right? We have a little highway that goes straight down from the AV node to the right and left ventricle. It's like your 405 and 5. Anybody know LA traffic? Yes, all right, so you got the 405 and 5. You have the 405 going to the right ventricle and the 5 going to the left ventricle, right? And those are your freeways that go through the heart, all right? But for instance, if you have a blockage on the 5 or the 405, Right? That's now you have to go through all the little side streets all the way across to depolarize all the ventricles. Because as we'll learn, all the cells depolarize cell to cell to cell to cell. All right? So that depolarization can be longer if we have some uh, blockage in, those vent in the ventricle. All right? Or if the impulse came from the ventricles. So we have PVCs. What's a PVC stand for? A premature ventricular contraction. So that means we had an impulse that came all of a sudden came from the right ventricle. Bam, PVC. Maybe we tickled it with a central line insertion. We put a central line into their neck. It goes all the way down to their to the right ventricle, and we tickled the ventricle, right? And that caused them to to have a little PVC. All right. So the PVC generated from the right ventricle, generated from the 405, maybe Santa Monica Boulevard, right there. And then it has to go all the way across, across Ventura, all the way over you know, Hollywood Boulevard, and it's going to make it all the way finally over to, what's over there? Eagle Rock, maybe? I don't know. So it has to go all the way over to the, the east side of LA. And it's going to take a second to get all the way across. So our QRS can be prolonged in those situations. Okay? And then our ventricles have to be, and our atria for that matter, have to be set up for the next cycle, right? So they have to be, you turn the light switch on, they're depolarized, and then you turn the light switch off, so they can be turned on again, right? The light switch can't be turned on until it's turned off. So our, our atria will depolarize, the light switch is turned on, and they have to repolarize. And they actually repolarize right in, in the same time as the ventricles are depolarizing. It's, a, it's, a, it's happening at the same time. But the ventricles, we can actually see the repolarization out here on the T wave, right? So the light switch is being turned off, so the ventricles can now be depolarized again, right? So that area between when the light switch is on at the whole at all times is the refractory period, meaning that you can't submit any other activity. But there's a little vulnerable piece right over here, right? As soon as the light switch is like halfway, I don't know if you've seen a light switch spark before, we turn it off and on, off and on, off and on, and you see a little spark at the end. That's kind of that little period right there. Right before when our light switch is coming off, it's vulnerable to uh, <laughs> make create an electrical spark, and electrical spark can lead to VTAC, right? And VTAC is deadly. So that's a, a vulnerable part of this whole cardiac cycle or this whole electrical depolarization, repolarization situation. Okay? So yeah, so we have different intervals in the bottom right corner there. So those intervals, we talked about the P wave, we talked about the QRS complex. Technically, there are different parts of the QRS. When you're like the nomenclature, we're not going to test you on the different nomenclature, whether the S wave or Q wave is the first or second negative deflection after the isoelectric line. No, we're not going to test you on that. We, there's better, bigger thing, fish to fry, which are what's the causes, what's the treatments for these different rhythms. But this will get you to understand why I have a AV node block. When I have an AV block, I'm going to have a prolonged PR interval. And what's the PR interval? It's the measure between the P wave and R waves of some fashion. But it's always the, it's from right here to right here, right? So there's a PR interval. And we'll zoom in more on the PR interval. We have a, actually have a slide dedicated to the PR interval. But that's the time it takes from atrial depolarization to the time it hits the, what? What's this little piece right here? 
the AV node, right? Or until it technically allows the impulse to go through the AV node. Because once it goes to the AV node, we get a what? Once it's going down these little freeways right here, you get a QRS complex, right? So it's going to start changing directions, going negative and positive. You're going to get a QRS. So that PR interval measures the time it takes from atrial depolarization to the time we let an impulse get through the AV node. And if we're on a medication that suppresses the AV node, right, it's going to take longer, right? We could take a beta blocker, some, some calcium blockers, digoxin, et cetera. These drugs will delay the time it takes to get that for that impulse to make its way from the atria to the ventricles, right? And the reason is because it's blocking that AV node. Okay, so there's PR interval and the other important interval. SG segment you'll deal more with in, in MedSearch 3, so you're only in MedSearch 1 right now, right? The other thing is the, the T wave. Sorry, this I don't have the, a ladder to fix the projector to make it go up a little bit more, but uh, or, nor can I bring the screen down further. So down there we've got the T wave, right? And that's just your ventricular repolarization. Also, another important interval is the QT interval, QTC technically, and we'll talk about that. Okay, and that's the and that, and we'll talk about why that's important. Okay, so again, the PR interval, there's a little delay at the AV node, and that will, if you have more and more delay, you can even block the impulse to go going through at all. That's an AV node block. Uh, the worst kind of AV node block is nothing gets through, right? All you have is P waves, and the QRS is going to do its own thing eventually, because our cells have what's called automaticity. So, what does automaticity mean? It sounds like automatic, right? So the cells depolarize automatically if they don't receive an impulse in time. If you don't receive the go, or like if you're like in a relay race, you're like, well, shoot, no one, they didn't come. Now, the, now you're going to go ahead and, do, and finish your leg of the race, okay? Because your body's depending on you to eject that blood and form a cardiac output. All right. Any questions on the electrical activity? Perceive mechanical activity. So this is just that linking up to when we talk about car the cardiac section for exam two. This was what you needed to have a good cardiac output. Okay, so different pathways. So again, the SA node fires off. The SA node is where it all starts, right? Our SA node is right up here, right, right there as well. Our SA node fires off automatically, and at what rate? At 60 to 100 beats. So if someone's heart rate is 60 to 100 beats. It's what's the SA node stand for? Sinoatrial. So it's atrial because it's in the atria, but sino sounds like sinus. That's why it's called sinus rhythm or sinus tachycardia or sinus brady. Well, normal uh, physiological heart rate is sinus, right? Sinus rhythm. So that starts right here in the sinoatrial node, the SA node, and it fires off at 60 to 100 beats per minute. If it's more than 100, it's sinus tachycardia. It's a fast heart rate. If it's sinus bradycardia, it's less than 60, okay? But we do have other options in case our SA node fails. If the SA node fails, then the AV node takes over. If the AV node fails, then the Purkinje fibers take over, or the junction technically, and then the Purkinje fibers. Then go all the way down, all the way to the bottom. Or we can create a little ventricular rhythm at 10 to 20 beats per minute, or 20 to 40 beats per minute. That's really next semester we'll talk about those the really, really slow rhythms and pacemakers and such. Right now we just want to focus on SA nodes, AV node blocks, atrial rhythms and ventricular rhythms, okay? So normally, SA node fires off and then it goes cell to cell to cell, all right? So it goes cell to cell to cell to cell and then it hits the AV node, right? And the AV node allows the impulse to go through, okay? There's a physiological delay and that delay is allowed so that you can actually dump the blood from the atria to the ventricles. If it wasn't there, you, it would, you wouldn't have a time to fill the ventricles uh, to the last little 20 percent, a last little atrial kick. Okay. So again, when one fails, the next one will take over. It goes SA node to AV node to bundle to the junction to the ventricular. So all those things can as their backup system in case your SA node were to go offline. All right. But normally, when we talk about the SA node, it can get faster or slower. We can raise the SA node rate or lower the SA node rate. All right, by, because if we're exercising, for instance, we want to have more blood circulating around. So how do you get more blood circulating around? You can't, you don't just say, SA node, do your thing, right? It has to be, it's an, an intrinsic thing that your body does, right? So we raise and lower heart rate with the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So the SNS is gonna be 
talked about many, many times. When I say SNS, 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 because it has a lot to do with cardiac, a lot to do with respiratory, a lot to do with renal, a lot to do with a lot of things, right? So you really have to know your SNS, and you have to know those receptors that are that are attached to it, right? So we talk about the SNS that they attach to the, they will fire, they will innervate the heart, and they come from the brain, right? Comes from the brain, goes to the heart over here. This is actually the output right there. All right, you got a little sympathetic nerve, goes to the heart and says what? Is it going to speed up or is it going to slow down the heart? What does the SNS do? It's going to increase the heart rate, right? SNS is your fight or flight response, right? When you're scared, when you're anxious, when you are drinking caffeine, when you are exercising, when you're pushing a bear off your, your outside fence, those things are going to raise your heart rate, right? And your body will do that. And how does it know to do that? How does it know that I need to raise my heart rate? Well, just like anything, if you have a little Nest doorbell or you have a little, you know, what's it called, just a, a camera on your door, on your door, you're going to know that, oh, there's something there. I need to EA, hide, because I don't answer my doorbell in 2024, or I need to, you know, open the door. I need to do something about that stimulus that's, that's there, right? So your body has all kinds of inputs. So some of those inputs might be just movement of the leg. If I move my leg enough, I will, my heart rate will go up, right? That's, you have little mechanoreceptors in your knees and your, and your arms and such. Other things are, that are important here are blood pressure, for instance. My blood pressure is low. I want to, how do I fix that? How's my body going to fix if my blood pressure is low? Well, we have little baroreceptors in the aorta. It's always checking the barometer or the pressure in the aorta. If that pressure starts getting low, what's your body going to do about it? So, oh, I guess the pressure is low. I can't do anything about that. No, it has a direct route to the brain. And it says, hey, the blood pressure is low out here, guys. What are you going to do about it? It's like, I know what to do. I'm going to raise the heart rate. How is raising the heart rate going to fix your blood pressure? Well, your heart pumps blood, right? And if I pump blood more per minute, that's called what? That's cardiac output, right? So that cardiac output comes out. If I increase my cardiac output, that will increase my blood pressure. Blood pressure is just the pressure against the aorta, right? Against the arterial walls. So same thing if there's little not only blood, uh, BP receptors out there, there's O2 receptors out there, little O2 receptors out there. So the O2 is low in my uh, aortic arch, in my carotid bodies, then it's probably low in my brain. It's probably low in my liver. It's probably low in my toe, my big toe. So how do I increase O2 delivery? Well, we're going to increase the heart rate. So that's going to increase blood flow. What does blood have in it? Oxygen, right? So same thing, there's CO2 chemoreceptors. We have a slide dedicated to SNS as well. We have all these different receptors out there that will feed into the brain and tell it, you know, I, I, one way you could fix this is raising the heart rate, right? So if I raise the heart rate, that should fix a low O2. That should fix someone that's exercising. That should fix someone that has a high CO2 or a low pH. That should fix someone that has a low blood sugar, all right? Or someone that's anxious <laughs> might, might, might fix that, I guess, all right? So all these things are inputs, and then our brain will output via the SNS, right? SNS fibers, and they will go to the heart, and they will attach to the heart, and they attach the heart specifically on specific SNS receptors. And those receptors are adrenergic receptors or receptors for adrenaline, right? Adrenaline is what gets your heart racing. So that adrenaline and that is your, well, that's an accelerator, right? So you hit the accelerator, that's going to raise your heart rate, and that accelerator is called on the heart is called a beta-1 receptor, right? You have one heart and two lungs, so beta-1 receptors are on the heart, beta-2 receptors are on the lungs. When we talk about lungs and for exam 2, or I think exam 3 actually, we talk about beta-2 agonists that open up the lungs which is good, and raise the heart, raise the respiratory rate, which is good. If we are O2 is low, we want to bring in more oxygen, so that's when we talk about lungs. But for the heart rate, is concerned, we're going to raise the heart rate when it attaches to a beta-1 receptor. So if we have a beta-1 blocker, a medication, a beta blocker, it's going to block beta-1 receptors. It's going to block other stuff too sometimes. It might block beta-2, might block alpha-1s. But we, when, we, when it blocks the beta-1 receptors in the heart, what's going to happen to our heart rate? Increase or decrease? Decrease, because the whole purpose of the accelerator is like where you're never supposed to have like a ball or, or a bottle next to you flying around on, on the car. All right, that bottle gets underneath your accelerator. You're not going to be able to go fast. <laughs> if it gets in your brake, that's, that's more of a problem, I think. But uh, you're going to not be able to go fast. Therefore, you're going to slow down, right? So beta blockers, for instance, are going to block the beta-1 receptors in the heart, therefore causing a lower, higher heart rate. 
a low heart rate, right? That's what beta blockers do. If you have a beta agonist, like when we talk about respiratory, we give beta agonists to them to open up their lungs, but also goes to the heart and causes a side effect of increased heart rate, right? So that's a, because it's attached to beta-1 receptors. Sometimes if people have really, really low heart rates, we can give uh, beta-1 agonists in the form of epinephrine, right? Epinephrine is your body's normal juice, your normal adrenaline juice, right? Epinephrine and norepinephrine get released from where? Where at? I heard ovaries, not ovaries. Where at? <laughs> adrenal, the adrenaline gla glands, yes. The adrenal glands, adrenaline glands. Where do the adrenaline glands sit? On top of your kidneys, little sombreros, all right? They got their cap backwards, they got the sticker still intact, rim not bent. Anyways, they have all those things that, that's the adrenal glands are on top of the kidneys and they secrete norepinephrine and epinephrine. That's your body's natural SNS juice, right? It maintains the SNS nerve activity, okay? Also, you release norepinephrine right down here. You're actually releasing norepi through those little nerve ter terminals on the beta-1 receptor. But your adrenal glands will release that juice and it will circulate through your whole body and it will do, yes, it will raise your heart rate and it has other effects as well, okay? So that's the SNS, right? We, get, we have beta-1 receptors, all right, via sympathetic fibers that will increase heart rate, but it's also going to increase contractility. So not only does your heart rate go up to raise your blood pressure or to raise to out output more blood per minute, but also you're going to increase contractility. You're going to contract harder, all right? The muscles will actually contract not only faster, but harder, right? And it will squeeze more blood out Right? So if you know your physiology, you have end diastolic volume and end systolic volume, you're going to reduce that and you're going to get more stroke volume. Okay? So meds promoting beta-1 activity, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Okay? Dopamine is just a precursor. to It's the building block of epinephrine and, and, and norepinephrine. These are medications we can start on patients in the hospital. We can give someone an epinephrine IV push. We can give uh, norepinephrine via a drip in the ICU. Same thing with dopamine in the ICU. And you'll talk more about these drips and moving them up and down to fix someone's heart rate or blood pressure in bed search three. But this is, we'll talk about epinephrine, for instance, is one of the treatments for someone that has a low or high heart rate, do you think? A low heart rate. If someone has a low heart rate, you can give epinephrine. You can give a dopamine infusion if someone has a low heart rate as well. Okay. The medication we give a lot, though, is atropine. So atropine is a medication we give for someone that has a low heart rate, to, to fix it, right? But atropine does not work on the beta-1 receptors. It kind of goes, you know, it goes a little, it takes an extra step, right? It's an anticholinergic, so it blocks anticholine, right? What is choline? It's acetylcholine. And where's acetylcholine in this whole picture? Acetylcholine is released by parasympathetic fibers. So your parasympathetic nervous system is the break to your SNS, right? You have the PNS, but you have to say slowly, otherwise it sounds like you're saying penis, right? So PNS is the opposite of your SNS. So the SNS is the accelerator, the PNS is your break, right? It's going to break the car or the heart, right? It doesn't do that via SNS fibers, otherwise that would be SNS, right? It does it through parasympathetic fibers or PNS fibers. They go down via the vagus nerve, right? So the vagus nerve has many, many other activities, but it's going to also innervate the heart, and it's going to release acetylcholine down here. It's getting a little busy. I think i talk about this more on another slide. But acetylcholine gets released from your vagus nerve, and that will then attach to your heart, and it will tell your heart to break, right? And how does it tell it to break? We'll talk about that, but it's going to ultimately decrease the heart rate and decrease contractility. It's going to pretty much stop the SNS activity and also lower the heart rate, okay? So acetylcholine is the bread and butter for the parasympathetic nervous system. If you have acetylcholine or you have a parasympathomimetic, what does that mean? Parasympathomimetic, mimetic being mimics, it's the same as parasympathetic stuff, right? So there's some of the drugs we talked about, like in neuro coming up, uh, it's for exam three, actually, but it's like, stop talking about other future exam stuff. All right, so but exam three has, you know, we talk about neuro. We have parasympathomimetics, drugs that will mimic the parasympathetic nervous system. And they are, they will bind to acetylcholine receptors. And one of your side effects of those meds are bradycardia, right? Because that's what, that's what happens. That's how it works normally. So if I give a medication that's going to promote that, I'm going to get more of that activity, right? So acetylcholine binds to the heart on parasympathetic receptors and it will release acetylcholine and it will lower the heart rate, 
right? So meds promoting acetylcholine activity, cholinergics, or paracetamimetics, if you want to impress your friends and, and relatives. But uh, beta blockers, why do they promote acetylcholine activity? I, I thought, what, what, what? How does that work? Well, if I have a beta blocker and I'm blocking SNS activity and blocking norepi, I'm going to have more acetylcholine activity, right? I'm going to have more parasympathetic activity. All right, so beta blockers lower heart rate, cholinergics will lower heart rate, and digoxin is going to lower heart rate because digoxin actually promotes vagus nerve activity. So vagus nerve is my parasympathetic nerve, and that's going to lower the heart rate, right? Also, your vagus nerve, it goes to your gut and makes you nauseous, so, and it can make you vomit as well. We have more vagus activity. So that's why you can, uh, with digoxin, you can have, you have nausea vomiting as a toxicity of digoxin. So when it's too much digoxin on board, they can be vomiting all the time, okay? And their heart rate's gonna be low too, okay? So these meds don't specifically work on acetylcholine receptors, but they will lower the heart rate, such as uh, calcium channel, channel blockers, adenosine, and amiodarone. And we'll talk about our different meds. So this is kind of the precursor to understanding our medications and how they work. And that's why meds are so scary is because you have to apply your physiology. You have to apply how the meds work, uh, what, what the meds are doing. They're either blocking something normal or they're promoting something normal. Okay? And your side effects are going to just fall into place. It's very rare that you can get a, some kind of weird side effect. It usually all kinds of falls in. The puzzle usually always falls in. And I'll point out when something is rare or you just have to know it. Right? But that's few and far between. Usually you can figure out how a disease works or how a why a disease has side effects or symptom X or why a medication has symptom Y, right? And why you should teach them side effect Z, right? So for instance, like uh, beta blockers, they will, or sorry, yeah, beta blockers, they're going to block the beta one receptors and they actually block beta two receptors on the lungs. And that's not good for someone who's asthmatic or COPD. That's not good because that's going to not let them bronchodilate, which is one of our SNS activities, right? So yes, it will help someone's low, uh, fast heart rate, right? Give a beta blocker for a fast heart rate, it lowers the heart rate, but if they have asthma or COPD, that's going to be not good when they have a COPD attack or an asthma attack, okay? All right, any questions on this overview of parasympathetic and sympathetic? All right, so you can change the heart rate with the parasympathetic or sympathetic, which we just talked about, right? But there's other things. So these are causes of an elevated heart rate or causes of a low heart rate. That's what we're getting at here. So we talk about sinus rhythms later. You talk about sinus tac, it's like, oh shoot, I know sinus tac. That's when they might be taking a taking atropine, or they might be taking, they might have epinephrine on board. They had a, a allergic attack and they took an EpiPen and they raised their heart rate. Why the heart why is the heart rate so fast? Well, because they had an EpiPen. Epi binds to beta 1 receptors, raises the heart rate, right? It's mimicking the SNS. So SNS and PNS, that's your gas and brake, right? And then we have electrolytes. So electrolytes can either raise the heart rate or lower the heart rate, right? So potassium has the most effect of all of our electrolytes. So if we're talking electrolytes and you're, you know, or you say potassium, a knee-jerk reaction should say heart, heart rate, right? So because potassium affects the heart, oh, but they might cause racist, restless leg syndrome. That's like, that's not really our, the, our primary concern. When someone's potassium is high or low, it's always heart rate. A question is not going to ask you, oh, they might have some, some constipation. No, it's just going to ask you, like, what's, you know, my first priority is to look at the heart rate, right? What's, you know, feel, you can feel for an apical pulse, maybe, maybe it might be slow. But usually, uh, when we talk about potassium, it's going to change your heart rate up or down, okay? And really, it's when it's really, really high, potassium is going to actually cause a low heart rate. And when potassium is low, it's actually make your heart uh, Ex excitatory, meaning that it's it, any kind of any kind of irritation is going to make it ec have ectopic activity. What's an ectopic activity? What does that mean? Ectopic activity is like a PVC or a PAC, a premature ventricular contraction or premature atrial contraction. Anything can can make it. It's like on edge. I guess is a good way to see it. It's very very on edge when your potassium is low. So anything can make it just go into a spout of proxismal SVT, or anything can make it just go right, right into AFib real quick, right? It doesn't necessarily directly cause tachycardia, but it makes you very high risk for a little tachyrhythmic event, okay? So potassium is really, when you talk about electrolytes, potassium equals cardiac, right? So cardiac is potassium. And then uh, calcium has, is like second place, like a distant second. So like if, 
first through fifth place are potassium. And then once you get to sixth place, now you're talking about calcium. Calcium will, have, will affect the heart as well. And calcium has other effects when it's high or low, but like it has like Chavostek sign, right? Was that high or low calcium? You did fluid electrolytes, right, last semester? All right, it's Chavostek sign and Trousseau's. That was low or high calcium. That was low calcium. That makes you, it's just the same thing as low potassium. It makes your heart irritable. It makes your heart very, very close to threshold to cause it to go off, right? It's very, very on edge. So when your calcium is low, and the same thing when your potassium is low. It makes your heart very, very on edge. Not necessarily making you tachycardic, but you could very well be tachycardic or have a little episode of tachycardia for like three seconds or so. Okay? So, you know, Trubostex is where you tap the cheek and it causes their nerves to twitch. Kind of same thing on the heart. It causes it to twitch, right? And when your calcium is super high, it's kind of the same thing as when your potassium is really high. It's going to cause your heart to be suppressed and it's going to cause bradycardia. Okay? And then magnesium, same story. It's kind of the same nice thing is that all three of the electrolytes have the same kind of um, symptomology when it talks about the heart. When all three of these electrolytes are high, you have bradycardia. When all three of the electrolytes are low, you're at risk for tachycardia and you're at risk for ectopy and PVCs, PACs, and actually you're at risk for a lethal rhythm. Who knows the lethal rhythm that you're at risk for when, you're, when all the three electrolytes are low? SVT. Not SVT. You can have little episodes of SVT, but more, what I, I think I heard it. <coughs> BFib, no? Torsades, right? So torsades is, we'll talk about it's polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. We'll talk about torsades, and that's a deadly rhythm that you want to avoid. So that's why we replace these electrolytes, we replace potassium, we replace calcium, we replace magnesium so that we can have a good heart function. And also you might have some other side effects, but those are the primary, that's the primary reason you're giving these medications to fix that, right? And if you have the choice to give magnesium or give potassium, which one do you give first? Magnesium, magnesium. why? Because why? So how do you remember that in clinical? Because I'm going to ask you in clinical, and some say, oh, I don't know, and they're going to just going to do 50-50. You're going to get a pull a coin out of your pocket and say, oh, it's, it's, it might be potassium, but that's not the right answer because it's magnesium. Why is it magnesium? How are you going to know that for forever? So magnesium is what? It's a key, right? So it's a key down there in the bottom right. It's a key for all the protein channels and enzymes pretty much throughout most of the body, right? It's a major key, major ingredient for enzymes and protein channels to work. And what protein channels are we concerned, for, concerned about right now? You could say the heart, but really we're more concerned about, what's that? No, you're thinking, no. Magnesium and calcium, yes, they have an inverse, they have a relationship, but that's not it. You need magnesium for potassium, why? What is that, what's, what's the connection there? I heard it. Yeah, you got a pump. Where do you have little sodium potassium pumps? You have them in the heart, you have them on nerves, but you also have them in the little divas south of the diaphragm. What are they called? Kidneys. <laughs> you said lungs? <laughs> no, kidneys. Kidneys are, are uh, south of the diaphragm, right? They are, they have little, their whole job in life is to take nutrients from the urine and put it back in the bloodstream or get rid of stuff, right? That's their whole job. So if you want to hold on to potassium, right? And how's your body hold on to potassium? In the presence of, actually less aldosterone. But anyways, if you want to get, hold on to potassium, all right? You have your kidneys will have to slurp it up. And how does it, how do you, how your kidneys slurp it up? They have little protein channels that will take the potassium and put it back into the bloodstream, right? And magnesium is there to do it. So if someone's potassium's low, it's like, well, I'm going to give them potassium. And it's like, well, what's the magnesium level? It's super low, I, but I don't know if I should replace that or not. Well, you need magnesium to absorb the potassium, right? So, and that also works in the gut too, but the kidneys are really, you're, you're, they're getting so much flow per minute, right? And they're the, really the ones that are going to adjust your potassium level, okay? So electrolytes can fix, can either raise or lower your heart rate. And then we have meds. Okay, so we kind of touched on some of these meds. These meds might interact with the SNS or PNS in some fashion, right? So some pathomimetics, or you might see in, in reading, you might see adrenergics, you might see catecholamines. They have like five different names that just mimics the SNS. I think they're in the witness protection program. I'm not sure why they have so many different names, 
all right? But epi, norepi, dopamine that we talked about in the previous slide, all those guys are going to mimic the SNS, and therefore you have a high or low heart rate. You have a high heart rate, right? And you have SA, AB, no blockade, blockading agents. So they block the SA node, they block the AV node. You have a drug that you give that will block it. Well, if you block the SA node, it can't respond to beta-1 receptors. It can't respond to stuff, so therefore it's going to cause a lower high heart rate. A low heart rate. So beta blockers are, are the examples of medications. And then non-DHP calcium channel blockers. And we'll talk about what that means. And digoxin is going to be a medication that blocks the SA node and AV node for when someone has a high heart rate, we want to block it and therefore lower their heart rate because their heart rate's too fast, right? And we got hyperpolarizing agents. So we have to, I'm going to tell you what hyperpolarizing is. It's like, well, just tell me that it lowers the heart rate and get on with it. Well, this is how you can get to the right answer every time so that you understand, you know, kind of apply your physiology and apply those things, right? That's the idea we're talking about here. Okay, so you have medications that hyperpolarize. What does it mean to hyperpolarize? We said we mentioned the word depolarize a few slides ago. What does hyperpolarize mean? It's the opposite direction, right? So for your cells to, to go off, right? Your cells just, just don't go off just because. The light switch doesn't just go on just because. You need a finger underneath the light switch to raise it, to raise it up, and that finger is a stimulus, right? For that light switch to turn on, for us to depolarize spontaneously, for our SNO to, to spontaneously go off at 60 to 100 beats per minute, it needs to depolarize, right? It needs to have a little tiny little stimulus right here, a little stimulus that reaches threshold. And once it reaches threshold, it will depolarize, right? But what if we make, the, make it harder? Make, what if we hyperpolarize it? Make it harder to reach threshold. Well, that, if you're looking at that many complexes per minute, it's going to be less if we, because it's going, to, it's going to take longer for it to reach it. Just like if you live across the street versus if you live in Palmdale, it's going to take you longer to get here if you have to come here 100 times per minute <laughs> or 60 times per minute, right? It's going to take you longer to get back and forth, right? And then once we have this little depolarization here in the SA node, that's going to be the stimulus actually for the next cell right next to it, right? So here's our SA node blown up. So there's SA node. SA node, just blow that up, and that SA node fires off at 60 to 100 times per minute, right? And when it fires off, it creates a positive depolarization next to it, and it's going to depolarize this cell, and that's, that cell is going to depolarize the next cell. It's gonna, that stimulus is going to spread through the whole heart until it hits what? The AV node. The AV node is going to stop everything. So hold on, guys. i got to gather my thoughts, and we're going to let you through. And then when it lets it through, you get what? Ventricular depolarization, which is what waveform on the EKG? That's your QRS complex, right? So you get a P wave, which is atrial activity, then you get QRS complex, which is your ventric ventricles depolarizing. So we can have medications that will hyperpolarize it. And adenosine will actually, sorry, adenosine is going to actually turn everything off, right? Just like when, when anything, anything doesn't work in real life, you just turn it off and on again, right? It's the same thing with adenosine. It's like, when I, it's like hey, my heart's not working, it's too fast. Well, let's turn it off and on again, see if, see if it helps, okay? So that's what they do. You just, you just fire off, you open up all the potassium channels throughout the whole body, including the heart, and it just whoosh, hyperpolarizes to, to, to nobody's business. And then you, the medication only lasts eight seconds, right? Adenosine. So you can't discharge someone on adenosine. That is, every eight seconds, you've got to take this medication, okay? Otherwise, your heart rate's going to be super fast. So that doesn't work. But adenosine is given in the hospital setting. You give it, and it's going to hyperpolarize the heart all the way down to nothing. Literally, the heart stops. They are dead for like three to, th three to six seconds, sometimes longer. That's why you have the crash cart nearby in case they don't come back, right? So they, you just restart the heart. You turn it off and on again, and you can, we'll have a video of what that looks like. It just it goes all the way off, and it boots back up. The window sound. I can't do a window sound. But it just boots right back up, all right? So a hyperpolarizing agent is going to you know, lower the heart rate, OK? Amiodarone works a little bit like that, too, and we'll talk about how that works. OK? Yes? So hyperpolarization, does that make the QRS complex get bigger at all, or it just goes away completely? It's going to slow down the SA node. That's really what's going on. Okay. It's going to slow down conduction through the heart, too. So it's going to take longer for things to get through. Okay, when we talk about amiodarone, it actually prolongs a few intervals. And we'll explain how that works. Okay? And then you can have structural damage. So if you have a scar tissue, let's say we have scar tissue right there, 
that's going to take longer for this impulse to make its way all the way over there. We have a scar tissue right here. It's going to take longer. It's going to depolarize quickly that way, but it's going to take longer to get all the way across to depolarize that whole, uh, that whole heart, right? So you can have structural damage that might cause a um, prolonged intervals, but also might cause uh, arrhythmias like AFib. The only reason why someone has AFib, like a fast AFib versus a fast sinus tachycardia is because they have scar tissue, right? It could be scar tissue or it could be like dilated tissue. So we have like a huge dilated atria right there, right? Because they might have a valve disease, they might have hypertension, they might have something going on that's making their atria big. Well now, normally the heart's expecting the impulse to go from point A to point B right there. But then this guy's like, wait, 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 wait for me. I'm still depolarizing. And now you have an ectopic site. So it might, come, it might display as a flutter, but it might be a fib, which is an unorganized atrial activity, right? And you don't see P waves, you see all kinds of different centers that are going off, okay? So you have NMI, which can cause scar tissue. What's MI stand for? Myocardial infarction or heart attack, all right? And then once they recover from that, if they recover from that, then they get a, uh, they can develop scar tissue. If they didn't seek out medical help within, you know, within one hour, they didn't get a door balloon, door to the balloon time. If you've ever seen in the ER, it's like it's a priority to get a patient that has an MI into the cath lab to fix their heart, right? But maybe they didn't. Maybe they live in Ridgecrest, right? And they took a, you know, two-hour drive down to to the to the hospitals up here, and then they had problems, right? They could develop scar tissue because of that. And that scar tissue is going to cause abnormal EKG stuff, but also puts you at risk for AFib, puts you at risk for PSVT, puts you at risk for VTAC, VFib, all these different things we talk about are all these different abnormal rhythms we talk about that are not sinus will are a result of MI, CHF, valve disease. All these things are causing either scar tissue or ballooning out of the ventricles or ballooning out of the atria, making us at risk for these things. So if you're creating a table on causes of arrhythmias, for sinus rhythms, sinus bradyus, sinus tachycardia, that's the stuff up top. The ANS, is, is, which is the autonomic nervous system, right? Making a higher low, it might be on medications. A medication is not really gonna put you into AFib, right? That's not, not what medications do. They're just gonna block normal physiology. But if someone has abnormal physical structures in their heart, that puts you, that's one of the causes for like VTAC, for instance. It's one of the causes for SVT, one of the causes for A flutter, all the rhythms we have to know for the test, okay? All right, so you can, you can dilate a ventricle, you can dilate an atrium, or you can make it hypertrophied, which means it it's, has more muscle compared to the rest. So this, this one is hypertrophied. And it can cause problems in our electrical conduction, right? Same thing if it, we are dilated, that can cause problems in the conduction through the heart, and therefore we can have problem rhythms, right? All right, and then genetics can be an issue that can cause dilation, hypertrophy, that can cause abnormal conduction pathways and such, which we're not gonna get into like Wolf, Parkinson, White, we're not talking about that. That's an abnormal rare thing that you're, you know, we see like three times a year maybe in all the patients that come to the hospitals, okay? But yes, in, the, in Wolf, Parkinson, White, they have an abnormal conduction pathway that allows the impulse to get through on, on, on the side and cause a really fast heart rate because of it, okay? So a cha changes in all these things will cause electrolyte channels to open or close, right? And when you talk about these little channels in the heart, right? These channels will either make the heart cooler or warmer. And what that means is it will make it depolarized or hyperpolarized. Hyperpolarized being cooler, it's getting colder and colder and colder. It takes more, imp more impulse, more stimulus, make it reach thresholds, right? So we can make it cooler or warmer and electrolytes do that. We have little electrolyte channels, right? That will open up or close. And some of them are on a automatic circuit, right? Those are the ones that are above threshold. They will open, all open up or they will all close and they will allow the, you know, they, they, that's what creates the impulse. We want the impulse to go up, get really, really warm, really, really hot. You want the impulse to get really, really cold so that you can, you know, turn that impulse on again in the future, okay? So we have a pacemaker potential right here and that's automatically firing off at all times, right? And we have a cardiac action potential, which is all your muscle fibers. That's what they look like. And they have the little plateau phase, which is for calcium, because you need calcium to do what? To bind your tropomyosin, displace the actin to make it so that they contract the Z line. Who remembers that, right? So it's gonna do all that stuff to contract. You need calcium to contract your heart, right? And that calcium stored away actually 
and it's ready to go, and it's going to, de it's going to then release and then cause the heart to contract, okay, when it receives that impulse, okay? So we have pacemaker potentials that will affect the heart rate, right? So if our pacemaker, which is our SA node, right, if that is going faster because of medications, for instance, or meth, right, or cocaine, that's also going to, that's a sympathomimetic. That's going to, we have to intake a little bit of meth, a little bump of cocaine, that's going to cause the heart rate to go up, right? And that's gonna cause the pacemaker potential to be more and more depolarized, okay? And the cardiac action potential, all right? That's gonna be the, these little, the cardiac muscles right here, those guys are going to, can increase in their contractility and allow more output of blood if it is SNS activity or less if it's parasympathetic activity. So all these channels are, are moving and they're causing a opening up of channels or a closing of channels. And then we have medications that will open up more channels or close more channels, right? So potassium, you wanna consider as cold water, that's why it's blue there. So when you open up more potassium channels, you're gonna get cooler. You're going to normally bring the cardiac action potential down, right? So it normally brings the cardiac action potential down. So all the potassium channels close, at the beginning right there, and all the sodium channels open, so that makes hot water rush in, because sodium, sodium is hot, if you want to think of it as hot water, and it's gonna come in and make it go all the way up, and then calcium will come across, but then also we have, then all the sodium channels close, and all the potassium channels open, and then we come back down to, to baseline. So you can see the potassium channels are open at rest, and they all close, the sodium comes in, calcium comes in, there's some potassium channels that are open, but then all the potassium channels open, and it, we are now back to our baseline, right? So that's kind of how it, it all works. The reason why I tell you how it works is because when we gave like amiodarone, for instance, amiodarone is a K-channel blocker, right? So it blocks potassium channels. So if I block potassium channels, uh, sorry, I'm saying that right. If I block potassium channels, it's gonna prolong the, the rhythm there, the EKG uh, uh, impulse, right? The uh, cardiac action potential. Okay, so that's our overview of what controls the heart rate. Okay, so we talked about the ANS activity, kind of talked about this already, but uh, you know, we have, we affect those pacers, uh, the SA node, AV node. Okay, there are systemic symptoms that will result, and the reason why I tell you about systemic symptoms is because the SNS not only affects the heart, it affects the blood pressure, it affects the pupils, it affects the sweating, it affects the uh, my blood sugar, all these things we'll talk about in other disease processes. So it's important to understand it now because it's going to be coming back every, almost every disease process. Every disease process is going to be is being manipulated in the SNS in some fashion. For the most part, about 90% of diseases will alter the SNS, right? Like we talk about diabetes and someone gets hypoglycemic, well shoot, low blood sugar is going to tell the brain, the brain say, hey, the sugar's low out there. And yes, it will raise your heart rate and raise your blood pressure, but it's also gonna to go to the liver and to the liver to make more sugar, right? So it's a input, low blood sugar is a stimulus for the SNS and the SNS will fire off. So when someone's hypoglycemic, they have tachycardia, tachypnea, they have diaphoresis as well. They might salivate, I guess, but where's my diaphoresis at? It's on there somewhere, right? So that those are all things that will happen when I have low blood sugar. So you just copy and paste it. Once you learn the SNS symptoms once, that's pretty much before every disease process, unless that disease process is altering one of those symptoms, right? So when I'm hyperglycemic, why do I have SNS symptoms? Well, because low blood sugar stimulates the SNS. Why, why does high blood sugar cause SNS symptoms? So when I'm hyperglycemic, we'll come to, come to learn that it makes you dehydrated. When you're dehydrated, you have a low blood pressure. So someone with hyperglycemia has tachypnea, tachycardia, right? They have pupils that are dilated. They have, they're not gonna be sweaty because they're dehydrated. So that's the little alteration I was talking about, right? So all those things are a, a stimulus for the SNS and that's going to cause the symptoms. So instead of rattling off symptoms for disease processes, you could say, just copy and paste, oh, this stimulates the SNS, right? So that's gonna be the same symptom. If someone's hypoxic and we talk about rest of diseases and someone has hypoxia, well, Low O2 stimulates the brain to fire off the SNS, and when someone is hypoxic, heart rate's up, right? If someone's hypoxic, they're breathing fast because not only does the sympathetic nervous system go to the, to the heart and increase your heart rate, but it also goes to your to lungs and will increase your rest rate and increase 
your, uh, the amount of air you're breathing in, bronchodilates as well. So that's, that's, that makes sense, right? If, we want to, if our O2 is low, how do we make our O2 higher? We're going to uh, breathe more, okay? So what happens when you have an S and S response? It's due to these things, and we'll talk about pH and CO2, uh, not so much next week, because next week we have a, have a holiday, but when we talk about ABGs, ABGs, we talk about O2, CO2, and pH, right? And when those are, when pH is low, when bicarb is low, when CO2 is high, we talk about all these things, that stimulates the SNS. So we talk about ABG symptoms. If someone has metabolic acidosis, guess what? They got tachycardia tachycardia. All right, how do you memorize that? I got tachycardia tachycardia diaphoresis. Oh shoot, he never tested me on pupil dilation, but pupil dilation is also a result of the SNS, right? Those are all an effect of someone that has uh, an SNS stimulus. And when someone's acidotic with a low pH, right? that's going to cause the SS to fire off and they get these symptoms, okay? The other thing that causes an SS response, I'm not sure if you ever took a, a test or you ever asked out a boyfriend or girlfriend or girlfriend or boyfriend and you start getting palpitations, right? Those palpitations are getting diaphoretic and clammy hands, right? That's diaphoresis, you start breathing fast. If you probably didn't notice, but you were breathing fast, right? You had tachycardia, your heart was racing. And what does someone say when they have tachycardia? Someone doesn't come into the, to the hospital or, or you know, don't call up your friends like, hey, dude, I got tachycardia. No, you're gonna call up your friend, you're saying, I got palpitations, I feel like my heart's racing, right? Those are signs of fast heart rate, all right? So that means if you're making a chart or making a constant map, you talk, all your tachycardias have palpitations or heart racing as a symptom, right? They all have pretty much the SNS stuff too. They should be, they might be diaphoretic and breathing fast if they also have sinus tachycardia, okay? The blood pressure will be elevated, and we'll talk more about blood pressure when we talk about uh, cardiac, for example, too. But there's a little introduction to it. When you have an SNS response, your blood pressure goes up, right? We talked about beta-1 receptors in the heart. We have beta-2 and alpha-1 receptors out in the periphery on the vessels that will vasoconstrict and vasodilate, depending on which receptor you're at, and it will cause a net increase in your blood pressure. So when our blood pressure is low, over here somewhere, blood pressure is low, it tells your SNS, hey, you got to raise the blood pressure because the, S because the blood pressure is low. So increasing the heart contra contraction will help, but also it goes out to the periphery and vasoconstricts and vasodilates out there to help out, okay? So cool, clammy skin. Why is your skin cool? We know why it's clammy, because we have SNS receptors, or we have, we, we, the SNS went out to our, our, our uh, I'm trying to say saliva, but went out to our um, sweat glands and caused them to release sweat. I'm not sure why that helps us, but uh, you got sweaty hands now, but why are your hands cool? So you vasoconstrict it, right? Blood not only carries oxygen, it also carries warmth. So if you don't carry warmth, if you're rerouting blood to the important parts, right? The important parts and when you're, what your body feels is important is your heart, your lungs, and your brain. So you're gonna vasodilate those things at the beta-2 receptors, heart, lung, some muscles as well, like the diaphragm, for instance. And it's going to reroute blood away from the skin. So you have cool skin. Right? When someone has an SNS response, they get cool and clammy. And it's the skin gets re blood rerouted from it, and the skin is the biggest organ of the body, right? What's the biggest organ system in the body? The GI tract. That's why when you eat a huge lunch at Subway today, you're going to tune out afterwards because all the blood is now in your gut, right? Away from your brain, away from your primary sources. Unless you want to ask out your friend or you want to get, you, I tell you there's a quiz coming up or something, and then your heart rate's going to go up and now you're going to get some abdominal pain because now the blood's away from there and your, your gut's like, what, what, what about me? So yeah, so you're going to reroute blood away from that GI system. So you're not going to take all that blood away and push it into the, the central systems, all right? The, the brain, which is important, your heart, which is important, your, and your lungs, which are important. And unfortunately, little divas don't get blood. So the body does not feel, it's been, it's objective right there. It says, you know what, you guys have alpha-1 receptors. When it, when it comes to, down to it, we're gonna take blood away from you. And they get upset and they're gonna do their own thing, which we'll talk about, but that's the idea. When you have an SNS response, you're going to have uh, cool, clammy skin, tachycardia, which we kind of explain in depth, and you have tachypnea. Your bronchioles will dilate, specifically at beta-2 receptors. We talk about the lungs uh, later, okay? And then what else? So you get anxious. So when someone has SS response, they usually more, have more anxiety. They have tremors. They have a feeling of impending doom. 
you'll see this on many, many in-class questions. They have a feeling of impending doom. It could be because they have a really, really fast heart rate, or it could be because their blood pressure is really low. It could be because their blood sugar is really, really low. It could be because they're really, really acidotic with their pH being really, really low. So all those things are a symptom of SNS activity. All right. And then uh, pupil dilation. Cool. All right. And then blood sugar. So your blood sugar will rise when you have an SNS response. That's your, one of your goals when you're, when you're running away from a bear. You want to have sugar for the muscles to run away from the bear. All right. So that's the whole idea of raising your blood sugar. All right. You want to keep the blood sugar uh, operational for your brain as well. Not only for your muscles, but so your brain so you can actually run away from the bear intelligently, not just run into a wall. Okay. And we'll talk about more about the blood glucose uh, and diabetes, because that's where we talk about glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis and corticosteroids and such. So we'll talk about that more and uh, diabetes. Okay, so that's the nerve response. All these nerves go out to the different areas and cause that effect. But if we want to sustain that, like when you tr almost get in a car accident, you swing away, swing away and you're in the, in the median and you're cool and clammy, you're tachypnic and tachycardic, and you have a feeling of impending doom and you feel like your chest is, is really, really tight. That's that the reason why it's uh, it sustains for like 10 minutes. Anybody got in a car accident? All right, anybody not had that opportunity yet? Anyways, uh, so when, when that does happen, or you have almost got hit or something, then you feel like you like for t 10 minutes you can't you have to recover. It takes a long time to recoup. It's because your body has not only had that initial response, but you have all the adrenaline juices flowing through the body, and that, all those all that adrenaline juice came from the adrenal glands right on top of the kidneys. Sort of a good picture here, but the adrenal glands release norepi and epi, and that will then sustain the SNS response. Okay. And we'll talk about the RAS system later, but the SNS directly triggers the RAS system, the RAAS. And that all these things intertwine. When we talk about ACE inhibitors or beta blockers or all the other medications, when we talk about cardiac, this is kind of what we're coming back to. So that's why I'm spending a little bit of time on these guys. All right? ADH, antidiuretic hormone, is also involved, but we don't really have medication that affect it, but it will have a uh, be present in the body to help raise the blood pressure, for instance. When blood pressure is low, that will trigger the SNS response. It will trigger the RAS to raise the blood pressure. It will trigger ADH to raise the blood pressure as well. And we'll talk a lot more of these when we talk about CHF, for exam two. And we really, really have to manipulate all of these, these different systems. But we're going to focus on the SNS because that's going to affect the heart rate and all the things that are stimulus right here for um, a, the SNS will raise the heart rate, right? So if someone has pneumonia, right? They're going to, they could have sinus tachycardia. Someone has a pleural effusion pulmonary edema. That could cause atrial fib if they have a heart that has scar tissue or is dilated. Right? It could cause VTAC when you have pneumonia. So what's the underlying uh, mechanism or under, underlying mantra here, or what's the word I'm looking for? Underlying thing here is that hypoxia of any variety. Right? You don't have to memorize pneumonia, pulmonary edema, pleural effusion, uh, pneumothorax, and uh, asthma, and COPD, and emphysema, and chronic bronchitis, and COVID-19, and influenza A, influenza B. No, hypoxia. Right? If their O2 is low, they will have a fast heart rate. That's end of story. That's, that is the key takeaway. Right? If blood sugar is low, heart rate fast. Right? That is what's going to happen. You could say, oh, they got, in, they got Lantus insulin, they got Detamir insulin, they got Aspart insulin, they got MPH insulin, they got, uh, you know, they got a, a glycogenolysis storage disease problem that's genetic. As long as it causes hypoglycemia, I have tachycardia, right? If my CO2 is elevated, I have emphysema, I have uh, decreased respirations, hypoventilation, I have uh, anything that makes my CO2 high, tachycardia. That's it. End of story. Right? So you don't have to memorize all these little things. As long as you understand the operational paradigm, I can't think of the simple word, but that, what's the word I'm looking for? A puzzle piece, right? That's going to, get, to clue you in to what is causing the tachycardia, right? As long as you understand the normal physiology, you can get to the right answer every time. So someone's like really, really tachycardic in front of you, why the tachycardic? Well, it's one of these things. Something's causing one of these things to happen, okay? They could be exercising in front of you. <laughs> they could be increased movement. And you can rule that out real quick. So, well, it's probably not because they're moving fast, right? That's probably not why they're tachycardic. Or when you're like, your friend comes up, it's like, why are you breathing so fast? Oh, I took the stairs. Oh, okay, that makes sense, right? The reason why they're breathing fast, you, you try to catch your breath, you go, I'm trying to breathe slow, but I hope nobody notices that I have, you know, I'm out of, I'm out of shape, okay? So that's the idea behind this. <laughs>
right? Her SNS was firing on all cylinders, all right? So after she gets back inside, like, oh, shoot, I pushed a bear. And she can get feel about for 10 minutes. She can feel a little, little norepi epi surge. All right, so let's take a break real quick, and we'll come back and recap all this physiology junk, and then we'll end with medications for the next section. All right, so the pacer. So we talked about all that little overview slide, had the autonomic nervous system, the medications, the electrolytes. So we're going to go a little bit more detail on one of those, those things because we're going to talk about the medications after this. Okay. So the pacer, the ANS, which we kind of talked about in, in depth, but it is what's causing the action potential to go off on its own. And we have two action potentials in the heart. We have the pacer, which is spontaneously always going off at a certain intrinsic rate. And we can suppress that or we can not suppress that and make it easier for it to reach thresholds, right? So when it reaches threshold right here, it, the light switch is on. That's a stimulus that's going to spread cell to cell to cell, right? So here example is the cardiac action potential. We got sodium and calcium influx into the actual cell and sodium and calcium are hot water, right? So that hot water, when it goes into the cell, when we open up those channels and those electrolytes go across that cell membrane, it's going to depolarize that, that cell. And that stimulus will be the stimulus for the cardiac action potential, okay? So the pacer is going off on its own thing. It's doing its own thing, right? Because it's, when it's actually finishing over here, this one's just beginning on the right, right? So on the left, just to complete the story, we got potassium efflux, right? And what is potassium? It's cold water, right? So when I have a lot of really high potassium level in my body, my potassium level is 7.2, that's going to cause a, that's gonna want to go across the cell membrane because of diffusion. And therefore at, at rest, my, it's gonna cause this to be hyperpolarized, right? So this stimulus, this cardiac action, sorry, this pacer potential finishes, and then we're going cell to cell to cell to cell, and we're depolarizing through the whole heart. And if it's in the atria, we get P waves. If it's in the, in the, in the QRS, if it's in the ventricles, we get a QRS complex, right? And they repolarize too. The movement actually of negative, of, of, of changing polarity can actually cause a T wave, right? So that's the idea. So calcium is influxing because when calcium influxes, yes, it's hot water. So it's going to maintain that little plateau phase. But uh, also the calcium, you need that calcium inside the cell because inside the cell you have muscle contraction, right? And that muscle will contract when calcium enters as well. Okay. So here's a normal SA node firing off at 60 to 100 beats per minute. And then we want to increase the heart rate. We got to make the threshold what? We gotta make it, sorry, we're gonna make it a little closer to threshold and it will go off faster, right? So here's, we depolarize the baseline, right? How do we make that baseline hotter? How do you make your bathtub or your heart temperature hotter? Well, you can make it so that there's more sodium entry at the baseline. You can make it so there's less potassium entry at baseline. And that's what these medications do. They will alter those things. They will open up more channels or close more channels, okay? So what else on that? we can hyperpolarize it as well. So if we hyperpolarize, we can make it, they have, someone has hyperkalemia or someone has increased vagus nerve activity because they took digoxin, right? That's gonna cause the heart rate to be less. So we count the number of blue peaks there, that's three, right? Compared to the number of black peaks, which is hard to see now, but we got what, one, two, three, four-ish, that's less, right? So that's the idea here. That's what the sympathetic fibers are doing technically, and that's what the vagus nerve is doing. It's gonna cause that depolarization and then we get that depolarization as a stimulus for the cardiac muscle to then depolarize and therefore contract. Electrical activity precedes mechanical activity. All right, so there's our SA node right there, and it's firing off cell to cell to cell, and that's gonna depolarize the next cell, and that's gonna depolarize the next cell. It's going, that's the stimulus that goes, spreads to the whole heart until it hits the what? What is it? So it's SA nodes firing off and it spreads cell to cell to cell to cell to cell and then it's all gonna stop where? At the AV node, right? The AV node is the gatekeeper between the atria and the ventricles and it will allow one impulse hopefully through, right? If there's multiple impulses like AFib or A flutter or SVT, it's only gonna let certain ones through. 
if it's letting everybody, everyone through, you got to tell them, you know, we need to stop that. We need to suppress you, right? You're, gonna, you're letting way too many people in. You're not a good bouncer, right? So you're going to suppress them, right? With masking tape, duct, I don't know. No, no, you're going to be using a medication. That's going to be an AV node suppressing agent, right? Right? So we have AV node suppressing agents that will suppress the AV node and let less impulses through. Therefore, any kind of AV node suppressing agent is going to cause what kind of side effect? Bradycardia. End of story. It causes bradycardia because it's suppressed the AV node. The only way you got, med got an impulse through was through the AV node. So if I suppress it, I'm going to have bradycardia. And usually every one of those AV node suppressing agents has a, um, what's the word, framework or a, um, a hold parameter, right? It says hold if heart rate less than 50, hold if heart rate less than 55. Or if someone's on an amiodarone infusion through their IV and their heart rate's 42, it's like, well, shoot, I should probably hold the amiodarone. That is causing, that's an AV node suppressing, that's suppressing the AV node, and it's going to cause a bradycardia as a side effect. The intention was to lower the heart rate, right? They probably had a high heart rate before. Okay. <laughs> All right, so SNO pacemaker potential, sodium calcium is it's the hot water that's causing that impulse to spread. That's the stimulus that's going to cause it to, that cardiac action to go off. And this cardiac action potential right here, that little pod of stimulus is go to the, the next cell. And then each is going to carry all the way down. And again, now the next part of the story is calcium, right? So the impulse spreads across this membrane here, and it's going to hit a little receptor. Right? It's called a DHP receptor or a dihydropyridine receptor. The only reason why I say dihydropyridine is because the medications that all end in dipine. The reason why all these medications end in dipine is because they are di dihydropyridine receptor antagonists. They block that little receptor. If you block that receptor, calcium does not get through. They're also known as calcium channel blockers. All right? And the reason why I bring up DHP or dihydropyridine is we have two varieties of CCBs, two varieties of calcium channel blockers. We have non-dihydropyridine and dihydropyridine. We have ones that block the calcium, this little channel right here. We have ones that don't. All right. So we'll explain that a little more. Okay. So that's the idea behind the cardiac action potentials. They are the stimulus that goes to the next cell, to the next cell, to the next cell until it hits the AV node, and then one impulse gets through and it goes down the ventricles. Again, same thing, cell to cell to cell to cell, and then we're in business. And then we get the contraction of the, the heart. All right, so you can see we have an impulse right here. There's a little SA node. We got an impulse right there. There's that one. We got another one right there. There's that one. It's going all the way through the ventricles, and eventually they're all going to even out and become what's known as isoelectric. Isoelectric is your baseline impulse or your baseline um, resting membrane potential. When there's no cardiac activity, no electrical activity, you're asystole and you're dead, but also we will hopefully have a little SA node fire off and that's our P wave, right? And then we get to the QRS goes off. So we have this, you know, we have an isoelectric line that is important because we measure all of our intervals. Every single interval we measure is always isoelectric to isoelectric, right? When people want to measure like Q, a, a QT interval, they're like measuring to the top of the T. It's like, what are you doing? It's, no, it's, it's always isoelectric to isoelectric. You measure a PR interval, they're measuring like the top of the P to the R. No, it's, it's PR, it's isoelectric to isoelectric. It's actually before the P to the R. Sometimes it's a little tricky when you say QT, is it before the T or after the T? And it's after. But there's a few little memorization pieces like that. But whenever you measure intervals, like a, P, a, a QT interval or a PR interval are the important ones, a QRS interval. A QRS interval is not Q to, to S, no, it's isoelectric to isoelectric, right? That's the QRS interval. I measure a P wave length and T wave length, really not too important nowadays, but if you measure a T wave, you would measure isoelectric to isoelectric, right? Usually the one we, we like is the QT interval, which is Q to T. That's our QT interval. And that's one tells a lot of, a lot of information about the, uh, the way the heart is repolarizing. Because the heart has delayed repolarization, right? The whole purpose of repolarization is to get us back to normal. But remember, we're switching that light switch on and off, on and off, on and off. We have an area that we are at risk for um, a lethal rhythm. Right, if you have an impulse that is right there, as the white light switch is going off, we can go into a lethal rhythm. That lethal rhythm is called torsades, right? So for, for instance, we have a PVC, a little PVC right on that T wave, right? A T wave signifies the, that area where we are at risk, right? T wave is ventricular repolarization. And if as we are coming down off that T wave and we have a little PVC there, 
or you have a, uh, something that's going to interrupt that cardiac cycle, that can cause you to go into a lethal torsades or lethal cardiac rhythm. All right, so torsades de point, if you're French. All right, so that's a lethal, that's, a, that's one of the important causes of torsades. There's other causes of torsades, like I mentioned, low electrolytes, right? Low calcium makes you more ectopic, means, makes you more at risk for PVCs, more at risk for little runs of, of SVT or little runs of AFib. It makes you more depolarized when your potassium level is low or high. Low. Same thing with calcium, same thing with magnesium. Calcium's low, mag, mag's low, K is low. All those things put you at risk for PVCs and PACs, and then that puts you at risk for a torsades if you get a PVC right on top of your T wave. All right, so here we got like in sports. This happened about two years ago, and then I got like three messages from nursing students like, what happened? What happened? Pro football player Damar Hamlin recently suffered a cardiac arrest. Thankfully, he was resuscitated. But what exactly happened? Well, we don't know for sure, but I suspect something called commotio cordis. This is rare. It's when the heart stops beating, not because of a heart attack. There's no damage to the heart muscle itself, but rather a forceful impact occurs on the chest wall at just the wrong time to disrupt the heart rhythm, putting it into ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest. This is so rare because there's only a tiny window of time when the heart is vulnerable. It's really only 40 milliseconds during the ascending portion of a T wave on an EKG. An impact at any other time during the cardiac cycle won't lead to cardiac arrest. All right, so that's a new fear unlocked. All right, <laughs> so that's a, uh, you know, that, that's the vulnerable part of our heart. It is much more rare for it to get hit in the heart, but it's a, uh, you know, more likely when we have like a PVC or when we purposely shock the heart back into a normal rhythm. And what is that called when you shock the heart purposely? It's called cardioversion, right? So when someone has no pulse, you don't care. You're going to shock them, right? But when someone has a pulse, you don't want to put them into a rhythm that has no pulse, right? So that's called synchronized cardioversion. When you are synchronizing to the R wave, actually, the R wave is a big impulse right here, right? We're synchronizing. We're doing synchronized cardioversion for patients with a pulse. And the reason why we're synchronizing is so that we don't shock them on the T wave. The machine is intelligent enough to just do that for us. Okay, but if someone has no pulse, we might just shock them whenever, right? And there's only certain rhythms we do shock. So that's one of the things we can talk about cardioversion. You make a quick table, like do I shock or not shock? It's based if they have a pulse or no pulse. And if they have no pulse, it's based on what the EKG is showing us, right? For instance, if the EKG is showing no rhythm whatsoever, it's asystole, shocking is not gonna work, so we don't do it, right? All right, so calcium and calcium channel blockers, right? So calcium, remember the cardiac action is going cell to cell to cell to cell, and if you zoom in on the cell, we look in there, that little impulse, right, is going to trigger the DHP receptor. And when you trigger that DHP receptor, calcium gets released from its storage area, which is the sarcoplasmic reticula, but it's going to, that calcium can get released, and that calcium is going to then contract the muscle, right? The heart, the heart's going to contract. So if I have a calcium channel blocker that blocks the DHP, is there contractility going to be more or less? Less, right? So when someone has a has CHF or an MI, probably not a good idea to give someone a calcium channel blocker, right? That would be a contraindication. If someone has a really bad CHF, right? CHF stands for what again? Congestive heart failure. If a heart's failing, let me give you medication that makes your heart fail more, right? It's going to decrease, what's the word? Fancy word, inotropy is contractility, right? We're going to decrease contractility when we give someone a calcium channel blocker. So that's one of the contraindications for calcium channel blockers, right? So calcium affects the cardiac atrium potential. So it's what's maintaining this plateau phase and such, but it also is affecting the, um, the contraction of the, the heart. So if it's a DHP calcium channel blocker, it's affecting the contraction of the heart, right? And if it's a non-DHP, it's not affecting the, the contractility. It's really just going ahead. It's just uh, affecting the SA node and the AV node. It's just affecting calcium entry into the AV node. And calcium entry is what? Uh, hot water, right? So if we reduce the hot water entry at baseline, that's going to make our, our membrane what? Lower. So therefore, they have a low heart rate when you get a non-DHP calcium blocker. Okay? So non-DHP calcium blockers, and there's only two of them. Right? And those two meds, meds are called diltiazem and verafinil. 
So they don't end in dipene. Everything else ends in dipene. All DHP calcium blockers end in dipene, which is nice, right? Like amlodipine, nifedipine, nimodipine, nicardipine, right? All these one end in what? Dipene, 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 dipene. All right, so these dipene are the DHP cash channel blockers. They don't affect the SA node and AV node. They affect the contractility of the heart and the contractility of other muscles, such as what? What are the three types of muscle fibers in the body? It's like, shoot, that's about the back to anatomy. Skeletal muscles, so guess what? Patients that take couch channel blockers that are DHP, dipene, feel fatigued. Why do they feel fatigued? Because their skeletal muscles don't work good because you just blocked it with the medication, right? And then what else, what other muscles do you have? We already talked about cardiac muscle. They get, they got a decreased inotropy. What else? Smooth muscles, where do you have smooth muscles at? Next semester, you're, all, you're worried about the uterus. Right now, we're not worried about the uterus just yet. But when someone has active labor, it's like, it's not time yet, it's only 30 weeks. Let me give you a couch channel blocker to slow down the uterus, right? But besides the uterus, where else do we have smooth muscle? You got vessels, right? You got blood vessels, and the blood vessels contract, and that's called what? When a blood vessel contracts, vasoconstriction, right? So couch channel blockers cause vaso. No, couch channel blockers block calcium entry into the muscle, so it cannot contract, right? So it causes vasodilation. So all these ones that end in dipene are for hypertension, high blood pressure, right? They have no effect on the heart rate. They only reduce contractility of all the muscle fibers in our body, okay? So because we vasodilate, we get a low blood pressure, right? And because we vasodilate, we get peripheral edema. Why do I get peripheral edema? Well, your vessels are like a Chinese finger trap. When you open it up, it gets leaky, right? So they get edema. They also get a headache. Why do they get a headache? Because you're vasodilating in a skull, which is a box, right? You're putting more pressure in the box, you're gonna get a box pain, which is called a headache, right? <laughs> so you get a headache, you get peripheral edema, you get fatigue, you get a low blood pressure. That's all of our side effects, aren't they? Of a couch channel blocker. That's specifically the dipene ones. The other ones, the other two, have other, have uh, unique or more unique side effects, or just, or just like bradycardia. Okay, so that's the idea when you understand meds. You just figure out why it has a side effect, right? It's very rare where it'll just a side effect is not explainable. Okay, well you can always say it causes nausea, vomiting, it might cause a little bit of diarrhea maybe. Right? That's that's always a a, a good answer, but really what is like a specific side effect. Like if you look in your drug jug book, it's gonna have every single uh, reported side effect known to man that's ever happened, right? That doesn't help you. You have to know the side effects that are important that you're actually gonna see, okay? So there's two classes of cash center blockers. We have the DHP and the non-DHP. The reason why we delineate them is because of side effects, right? The, the non-DHP side effects are not going to lower your blood pressure. Yes, they could lower your blood pressure if your heart rate gets way, way too low, but that's not their primary effect, right? So we've got non-DHPs. Let's talk about those first because non-DHPs don't affect the DHP receptor. Where's the DHP receptor found? Cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, right? So and there's only two of them, which is decent, right? And they don't have the same last name, which is not decent, but they have rapamil and diltiazem. Whenever you hear diltiazem, it is used to lower someone's heart rate. When you get here rapamil, it's used to lower someone's heart rate because it's blocking calcium entry at the SA node and AV node. That's all it's doing. It's not blocking the DHP. It's a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, a non-DHP CCB, right? Its goal is for arrhythmias. When we come back to hypertension in three weeks, or whatever it is, for exam two, we're going to come back to DHPs, to the dihydropyridines, because those ones are for blood pressure. Non-DHPs are for what? For arrhythmias, fast or slow ones. Fast ones, right? Ventricular or supraventricular ones. Supraventricular, why? Because these affect the calcium entry at the SA node and AV node. If I block, if I give a, if I have some, a ventricular rhythm, that's something going on over here. This I have no effect on it, right? It's, it's not it's out, out of its wheelhouse. But if I suppress the SA node enough with a non-DHP calcium blocker, blocking all the calcium entry, making it more hyperpolarized, making it harder to reach active potential, letting less things through, that's going to help fix SVTs, supraventricular tachycardias or atrial tachycardias. 
and we'll define atri what atrial tachycardias are, which is how this medication works. So we talk about those medications later, and we say, oh, is it non-DHP or DHP calcium blockers? It is, which one affects when someone has a high heart rate? Which one do you give, non-DHP or DHP? Non-DHP, non right? So there are two, and one has a little bit of mixed DHP effect. We're not really getting into that, but both these guys are going to lower the heart rate, right? That is the side effect of these medications, right? The reaction of the SA node is lower heart rate, and the AV node decreased conduction. It's an AV node suppressing agent, right? It's one of our four AV node suppression, suppressing agents, okay? So DHP calcium blockers, that was non-DHP. I'll just spend a second on, on DHP ones. Again, DHP is where? That's at the in, the, in the heart right here, right? That's a cardiac action, that's a cardiac muscle right there in the bottom right. And when we give a calcium blocker, it's gonna block calcium entry into that muscle and therefore make that muscle weak because we have less calcium to contract, okay? So DHP, calcium blockers block DHP, right? They, they are calcium channel blockers, right? And the nice thing is they all end in the same suffix, which is dipene, right? So we have amlodipine, nicardipine, nifedipine. We have all kinds, of, it ends in dipene. It is a DHP calcium blocker. And you can think to yourself, well, shoot, it's gonna, it's gonna raise, it's gonna vasodilate because my muscle can't contract, I'm gonna get fatigue, I'm gonna get headache, I'm gonna get peripheral edema, am I get a low heart rate? Or a high heart rate, or no effect on heart rate? Hmm? You're gonna have a high heart rate. So if you overdose on a calcium blocker, it's, that's, that's a DHP one, it's impossible to have a low heart rate. Why? Because you have to know your physiology, right? So if you vasodilate in your periphery, all the blood just dumps in the periphery, right? And none of the blood returns to the heart, right? If no blood returns to the heart, your baroreceptors are now gonna fire off, right? Your baroreceptors just have blood pressure. When your blood pressure is low, that does what? That goes to the brain. Say, hey, the blood pressure is low, I hear, what are you gonna do about it? So what's your brain gonna do about it? It's gonna send an SNS signal down and raise the heart rate, right? It's also gonna try to vasoconstrict that periphery, but you have calcium blockers there that are stopping that from, ha from act happening. So we can reverse that with glucagon. So glucagon is a reversal agent for calcium blockers. All right. So you have reflex tachycardia. All right. You get vasodilation, like we mentioned. It's going to have peripheral edema. They're going to have some a headache as well. Right. Also, if you vasodilate, that's the primary intention of this medication to vasodilate and lower someone's blood pressure that's high. Okay. And they get reflex tachycardia because the SNS is firing off because the blood pressure is too low. All right. And it's also gonna decrease contractility. It's decreasing calcium entry into all the muscles. So it's not for CHF patients. So if you have a CHF patient that's on this, you have to have a really good reason or it was an error, right? So that's, you know, you want to avoid this medication when someone has CHF, especially if their ejection fraction, which we'll talk about in, um, in cardiac, is, is low, less than 40%, okay? Also, someone that has ACS, what is ACS? Acute coronary syndrome, and we'll talk about this in exam, for exam two for cardiac, but that's someone who's having an active heart attack, right? Someone's having an active heart attack, hey, let me uh, make your heart work less for you, right? That's, that's probably not a great idea, okay? Can I get someone with a heart attack that has a high heart rate, like uh, Viratmil? You could, because it's not going to reduce contractility, okay? And if you open up your drug guide right now, you look at amlodipine, it says bradycardia. It's like, well, shoot, why does it say bradycardia? I thought the professor told me that it was, it was tachycardia. It is tachycardia. It does not cause bradycardia. It did cause bradycardia in someone in Prague, you can micro, right, right there down in Mexico. That guy, he developed amlodipine. He was a monk at the top of the mountain. He's like, oh, shoot, I take amlodipine for my blood pressure, and I got a low heart rate. Well, let me, F.A. Davis, like, let me write this down. <laughs> bradycardia is a side effect of amlodipine. It is not, right? It's reflexive tachycardia, right, it is the side effect for all of our... DHP or non-DHP are DHP calcium blockers. They all cause vasodilation, they all cause headache, they all cause fatigue, they all cause uh, bradycardia? No, they all cause reflexive tachycardia, all right? So if you take too much of that medication, then we can, give, we can reverse it with glucagon, okay? Does that make sense how that, that works? And again, it's like, why are you tell me all this crap? Why don't you just tell me what the side effects are and we can move on to the next slide? Well, you could memorize this. You could just say, okay, you guys, I am lodipine. It's going to cause reflexive tachycardia. And for mill, it's going to cause bradycardia. Next slide. That's, how are you going to learn that? 
No. So you have to understand the why. But don't get lost in all the details. I'm not going to test you on how it causes fatigue, right? It's because the skeletal muscle DHP receptors are blocked, and then therefore the calcium can't leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it can't bind to the actomyosin exercise, and then it can't displace. No, I'm, that is physiology. That is not the, the nursing exam. The nursing exam is patient complains of fatigue and headache and peripheral edema, which medication might they be on? Well, that's, and it wouldn't be Vratmil, right? It would be which? Any one of the ones that end in diping, okay? That's the idea behind understanding the material. Yes? Is this on the reversal for DHP and Mosin? It's more for DHP. And again, I'm not, yes, that's true, but I'm not going to test you on that. I'm not going to say is it DHP or non-DHP, right? This, you are new nurses. I'm not going to test you on little, little fine details. I'm testing you on big things that are, uh, you know, important side effects, important teaching, things that get tested on all the time. And how do you know if it gets tested on all the time? Well, NCLEX questions are a good source, right? Because they, if you go to three different NCLEX books and they all ask about hypotension with, you know, DHP calcium blockers, that's probably what we're going to ask you also, right? All right, what else? So here's an example of couch net blocker right here. So here's say, this, D, this DHP receptor is trying to be activated. He's like, no, you're, stop it. So there's our couch net blocker right there. All right, which kind? A DHP couch net blocker. So he's going in there and he's inhibiting the DHP receptor. Stop it, All right? So that's the idea. All right, so electrolytes, so back to electrolytes. So again, it's hot and cold water. We're not gonna spend too much time on this, but this is, again, your, if you have too much potassium, all right, that's too much cold water. Therefore, I get, that's gonna make my membranes cold at rest and it's make it harder to reach threshold and therefore I get bradycardias, right? So high potassium levels cause bradycardias. Low potassium levels make you more irritable, more at risk for ectopic foci, ectopic beats, such as PVCs and PJCs and PVCs, oh my, right? So it's arrhythmogenic when your potassium level is low. That means you're at high risk for arrhythmias, you're high risk for torsades, you're high risk for VTAC, you're high risk for tachycardias, high risk for little runs of tachycardia, like 10 beats, 12, 12 beats, whatever it might be, okay? And then you can block potassium channels. So before, I think I said, potentiates potassium channels, the amyoderm blocks potassium channels. So like when I block potassium channels, how does it make my membrane colder, right? Well, you are making it, you're increasing the duration of the um, action potential. So here we had a normal action potential, and the red line, we are blocking potassium channels, making it more difficult to come back down to normal, okay? So that means less impulses can be uh, provided, right? If you're, having, if you're in VTAC, for instance, you're going at 200 beats per minute, Right? We can widen that out so less impulses can, can be activated, right? Because the light switch has to be off before you can turn it on again. So you're making it where it's like someone like holding your finger up while, you're, while the light switch, on, light switch is on, right? So that's the idea behind amiodarone. Adenosine opens all of the K channels. It just opens all the K channels, makes everything cold, it turns off the heart, and it only lasts for eight to 10 seconds, and then adenosine's gone, and then now your heart can hopefully reset itself, okay? Low mag is, is going to cause low potassium side effects because you need mag to absorb your potassium in the kidneys. So if you have low mag, you're going to have low K symptoms also. All right, this is just a, almost, it's just the same thing. Okay, and then sodium is hot water. So if you have more, if you open more sodium channels, that's the same thing as like increased SNS activity. So that's the idea, so you're going to be tachycardic. All right, you can block sodium channels. There's certain medications that block sodium channels and that will cause bradycardia, all right? And also, you have sodium channels in your SA node, SA node and AV node, and if you block those, that's basically what you, you've really done. If you, if you zoom in all the way, yes, norepinephrine binds the beta-1 receptor and causes bradycardia, but how did it cause bradycardia? I mean, sorry, it causes tachycardia. If you give beta blocker, it's blocking that sodium channel from 
activating that, so that SA node or AV node, what, what have you. Okay, and then calcium. So calcium, similarly like mag and potassium, is going to, if we block calcium, calcium is hot water, we're going to get a bradycardia. And that's what your DHP or, or your non-DHP do. At the SA node, AV node, they're blocking calcium entry. Your non-DHP are going to cause bradycardias, right? All right, so what else? So you have too much calcium. That can, it's like, well, that's too much hot water. Well, you can destroy the potential, and you can actually cause the heart to stop and become bradycardic. Okay, so you have hot water here, and we got cold water there. And that's, the, that's kind of the best way I can, I can explain when you talk about resting member potentials and increase and decrease of sodium channels and open. You think of what the channel's doing normally. And if it's open, more of them are open, and it's letting more cold water in, I'm going to have a bradycardia. Okay, so here's an overview of our, our meds. We've already talked about which one? Non-DHP cow channel blockers. We kind of touched on amiodarone a little bit. It's a K-channel blocker, right? And it's going to decrease heart rate by prolonging the, rest, the resting membrane potential. It makes this membrane potential longer, so less impulses can get through. So if it was right here, right, if I have six impulses getting through, and if I prolong this, now less impulses are getting through. Okay, that's the idea behind amiodarone. And the, the downside of that, is, of that is it prolongs the QT interval. QT interval is the remember this little downstroke right here was the beginning of the, beginning of that T wave. If I prolong that, that's going to make my QT interval prolonged. So one of the things we monitor with amiodarone is the QT interval. Right, so it's very important you monitor the QT interval because the QT interval gets longer and longer and longer. What happens? you get torsades. That's another important cause of torsades, is QT prolonging agents, medications that prolong the QT, and amiodarone is one of those. Connecting to Zoom, Zoom lost connection. All right, put that in the corner. All right, anyways, so we got uh, amiodarone and then adenosine. Adenosine is a, usually a one rhythm drug it can be used for other ones, but really the rhythm I want you to know it for is PSVT. And why not just say SVT? The P is important, all right? The proximal SVT, which we'll talk about in more detail. The proximal SVT is there to, and when it's, it's a really, really fast heart rate. And what you want to do is you want to kind of reset the heart. And to reset the heart and turn off that really fast heart rate is you're going to give adenosine. It lasts 8 to 10 seconds, shuts everything down, and then it reboots. And hopefully it's at a heart rate that is acceptable, okay? And it does that by being a potassium channel agonist. It binds all the potassium channels, opens up all the cold water it can in the heart, and it turns it off. It just lowers it to nothing, okay? And then beta blockers, we'll talk about more in the next slide, but beta blockers all end in LOL, which is nice. So sorry, my this um, Zoom lost connectivity, so let's just share that again and Oh, it's still recording at least. Good. All right. So anyways, uh, beta blockers all end in LOL. There aren't like non-DHP or DHP beta blockers. Beta blockers are beta blockers are beta blockers, except there are some that, some that affect just beta 1 and some that affect all of them. All right. So there are beta 1 specific ones and there are ones that are, affect beta 2 and alpha 1. Which ones do you think are for the heart? Or for, sorry, for the for a abnormal heart rate that might be fast beta one specific, right? Because you have one heart and two lungs. You've got beta two on the lungs, you've got beta one in the heart. So beta one receptor blockers are the ones that are going to be given for fast heart rates. Okay? We'll talk about those in the next slide. We talked about non-DHP calcium blockers already. It blocks calcium because it's a calcium channel blocker. And then we have DIG. We have a slide dedicated to DIG as well. And DIG is going to block a little exchanger and it's actually going to reduce heart rate. We'll talk about how it works. And DIG actually is going to increase contractility. So a patient with CHF, they, they might get digoxin if they have a really fast heart rate. Okay? So these are the ABC drugs, A, A, B, C, D. So adenosine is, gets a little A because it's only used for one, uh, one arrhythmia. But A, B, C, and D, so A for amiodarone, B for beta blockers, C for non-DHP calcium blockers, and D for digoxin. These are our medications that we will be manipulating that you have to understand. You have to understand what these medications are for, and all of these medications are for fast heart rates, right? Only one of them can be used for ventricular rhythms. Which one's that, do you know? 
do you think? Adenosine is used for PSVT, all right? PSVT only. When someone says PSVT, treatment is adenosine, right? But only one of these works throughout the whole heart, right? Not just on the SA node and the AV node. So beta blockers work on the SA node AV node. Non-DHPC, uh, sorry, CCBs work on just the SA node AV node. Digoxin works in the SA node AV node, as we'll come to find out. It actually potentiates the vagus nerve. Amiodarone, right? You're blocking uh, K channels throughout the whole heart. So it's for atrial and ventricular rhythms. Amiodarone is a jack of all trades. It does a lot of things, right? So that's the, the idea, is to understand the indications for these medications. Like when, when would, I, would this medication be indicated? And you call the doctor and say, hey, doctor, they have PSVT, right? Or at least let's say, let's make it easier. They have AFib and the fat heart rate's like 150. So you say, okay, go ahead and give digoxin. That checks the box. Yeah, digoxin will be indicated. But they said atropine's like, well, A is in atropine. Atropine's not in this list. Atropine's for low heart rates, right? So you gotta make sure it checks out. Someone has like VTAC on the monitor. Doctor says, okay, just go ahead and give, uh, you know, diltiazem, right? So well, diltiazem affects the AV node. It's not going to have any effect on ventricular rhythms. So you wanna know like which ones are, what these medications are indicated for, all right? So anytime you understand, when you would learn a medication, you have to know indications for it. Knowing the class is really important because if you know the class, usually they like LOL, they all end in LOL for their beta blockers. And that will give you, and then you have to recognize, well, it ends in LOL, that's a beta blocker, and it's indicated for supraventricular tachycardias, right? And then the next thing is side effects, right? You want to know for every, medica every uh, medication ever are side effects. And I'll write this on the board as well, sorry. So you want to know like indications, Right? First, we want to know what the class is because the class will tell you some, you, hopefully it has a suffix on it. If they, if they have a good, a good class, has nice suffixes and they all end in LOL or they all end in, uh, like when we get to uh, ACE inhibitors, for instance, which are not for the arrhythmias, but they all end in PRIL, right? But beta blockers all end in LOL, whether it be for hypertension or be for tachyrhythmias, okay? You know the indications, you want to know what the side effects are, right? You want to know what the, um, that's it, right? Side effects and then nursing interventions. Okay, I feel like I'm missing one. Either way, so you want to know what, what it's for, all right? Is it for atrial rhythms? That checks a box. Patient has atrial rhythm, uh, this is a good medication to give, right? Patient has a ventricular rhythm, and those medications are for, those other ones are for atrial. I probably, that's probably, I should probably question that order, right? And then side effects, like, well, shit, I can't question the doctor. What the heck? I, I'm a nurse. What, what does that mean? No, you are a team. You're a team of healthcare providers, and your goal is to, you know, make sure the patient is safe, right? So you are allowed to question the doctor. That's the whole point of being the nurse, of being the RN. And there's no shade at LVNs, but LVNs are trained to give PO medications, trained to give sub-Q medications, trained to do a lot of good procedures, and LVNs are great at doing procedural things. Whereas the RN knows that, that the RN is also trained, all those things. Some of them can be great at things, some of them are not so great. Like they'll say, hey, this is how you put a foley in. Oh, I learned how to put a foley in. Either way, so you have RN does all the things that LVN does, but also the RN is going to question things. The RN knows the side effects. The RN knows the indications. The RN knows the teaching, right? LVNs technically are not supposed to teach. They can teach instructions that have been developed by an RN, but they cannot like just start saying things from left field. It has to be clearly outlined. That's from the Board of Registered Nursing in California, right? So that's the idea behind what the RN does. You you have to know these things, right? It's like, well, why is he teaching me all these things? Like, you know, well, you could just memorize all these things, but you could also, you know, you have to know the reason why you're doing what you're doing, okay? So why do you get in that tangent? Anyways, nurse interventions and uh, indications, and you have to know course, a side effect. So these are for medications, right? We talk about disease processes, it's a little bit different. There's like a few more columns you got to add on, but otherwise that's the, the main idea. Okay, so what else? So we have, those are our medications for the heart. All right, so we'll talk about the two other medications and we'll take a break. All right, so beta blockers and digoxin. All right. So beta blockers, what are beta blockers for? So they can be for high blood pressure, right? They are going to block alpha-1 receptors. Like, well, that's not a beta blocker. Well, they actually do, they, they kind of double dip, right? They can block beta-2 receptors. They cannot block beta-1 receptors. But we also have ones that are specific for just the heart. 
and those are beta-1 specific beta blockers. And those ones are all under the mnemonic of man babe. So here's a man babe. Some of you might have man babes in your life too, right? <laughs> so man babes are uh, beta blockers that specifically lower the heart rate. They don't, their goal is not to lower the blood pressure. Their goal is to lower the heart rate because they only block beta-1 receptors. They don't block alpha-1 or beta-2. They only block beta-1, okay? So heart rate reduction beta blockers our man babe. What is man babe? That is over here, right? Metoprolol, atenolol, betoxolol, they don't use that as much, but bisoprolol we use a lot, esmolol we use a lot. So if it doesn't fit on man babe, it is a mixed beta blocker. It's, it's non-specific. It doesn't just do beta one, it does beta one, beta two, and alpha one, okay? So those ones are carbetalol, levetalol, propanolol, natalol. Those guys on the side there are probably for blood pressure right, because they are doing all the things. They're blocking s and s on all fronts. They are a higher risk for bronchoconstriction for asthmatics. They are a higher risk for masking hypoglycemia symptoms because they are doing all the things, right? They're blocking all of the s and s activity. That's all the beta blockers do is block s and s activity, okay? And s and s bind goes to the SA node, it goes to the AV node, so if we block it there, we're gonna get a lower high heart, low or high heart rate. You get a low heart rate, okay? So they block the SNS and we get a low heart rate. And then when we talk about CHF for exam two, we'll talk about the reason, the other reason why they're great is they stop the heart from being remodeled, right? Your heart thinks and knows how to make a heart, but it's just like when you hire a contractor who underbids the other contractor who costs a thousand dollars more, right? They're not gonna build cabinets that look anything like cabinets, right? They're gonna say, yeah, look, I, I know how to make cabinets and there's, there's the cabinet, right? So in CHF, your body is going to try to repair its heart, repair the heart and heart failure, and your heart failure gets worse if you don't take beta blockers because you're gonna stop the SNS from rebuilding the heart and making a shoddy heart, okay? So we have, when we talk, come back to beta blockers in CHF, there's our, there are specific beta blockers. Your patient's on metoprolol or bisoprolol or carvedilol. One of those three beta blockers is because they have CHF or they have a history of acute coronary syndrome. So there's three specific medications. So we'll come back to that when we talk about heart stuff, okay? So they also block the RAS, which is important for CHF as well, okay? But side effects are side effects are side effects. That doesn't matter if you have a man babe or non-man babe. The side effects are low blood pressure. Now, which one's gonna have the, the most effect on low blood pressure is gonna be the ones that are mixed, okay? Not as prominent with man babe. For the beta one specific ones, beta one specific only affects the heart rate. And why would that have less effect? Why, well, why would just lowering the heart rate lower someone's blood pressure? Because what's the formula for cardiac output? Stroke volume times heart rate, right? So stroke volume is how much blood comes out of my heart, right? And that can be, they could have CHF, they could have all kinds of things affecting that, but it's stroke volume times heart rate. If I eject blood from the heart 60 times a minute versus 120 times a minute versus 20 times a minute, one of those things is gonna have less output, less blood pressure, okay? So bradycardia is a side effect for everything, whether it be man babe or non-man babe. All right, and again, caution with diabetics, caution with uh, asthmatics and respiratory patients because it's going to uh, suppress those symptoms and also is gonna cause bronchoconstriction. And we'll talk more about um, you know, the hypohyperglycemia piece with when we talk about diabetes, okay? The nice thing about this one has the same reversal agent as uh, calcium channel blockers, glucagon. So if someone overdoses on beta blocker, someone overdoses on a calcium channel blocker, glucagon would be a reason or a uh, medication we give to reverse it, okay? So that's the idea behind beta blockers. All right, digoxin. So digoxin, remember we have what? A, A, B, C, D, right? So those are, are medications that are used for um, lowering heart rate, okay? And D is digoxin, and digoxin is gonna lower the heart rate by potentiating vagus nerve activity. It makes more vagus nerve stuff happen. And what's the vagus nerve belong to? The SNS or PNS? The PNS, right? So the PNS is responsible for doing what on the heart? Lowering the heart rate. So if we lower the heart rate, right, increase vagal activity, will happen, right? So increased vagal activity, which is what digox potentiates, gets low heart rate, okay? But it also increases myocardial contractility. Well, that doesn't make sense. I thought if I have more PNS activity, I have decreased contractility. Well, digoxin also works specifically 
uh, these little exchangers, these little channels that exchange the movement of sodium potassium in the heart muscle itself. It actually blocks that channel and it makes it so more calcium stays behind. Because cal calcium has to leave when sodium leaves. And if we make less, we stop the sodium from leaving, the calcium is going to be more, more of calcium will be behind. You have a really robust and prominent sarcoplasmic reticulum. You have more calcium available and you have more contractility. Okay. So what else? So the other thing is with digoxin, you can get toxic with digoxin. So you want to know the, the dig level. If it's too high, you have dig toxicity. So that means you need to re reverse it. Reverse with the glucagon, that'd be nice, but no. You reverse it with what agent? The Joxin Immune Fab, or Digibind is the brand name. And regarding brand names, so I'm not going to be testing you on brand names. I'm testing you on the generic names because A, the pharmaceutical companies have plenty of money. We don't need to advertise any more for them. But also B, the NCLEX is not going to test you on brand names. There'll be no brand name in sight, right? It's not going to say uh, Primacor. It's not going to say, uh, what's another, uh, uh, Low Presser, right? That's not going to be on the, on the NCLEX. So why would I? you know, set you up for failure. So I have to say labetalol, I have to say deltiazem, I have to say rituximab, or I have to say all these different, you know, crazy long generic names that nobody knows, and none of your patients are gonna know. He's like, oh, okay, I'm here for your uh, car carvedilol. They're like, what the heck's carvedilol? Your core egg. Oh, so in clinic, you know, have to, you do have to know the back end, the generic name for your, or your trade name for your patient, because they're not gonna know it. But, you know, we have to test you on the generic name, on the name that got approved by the FDA, not the, uh, the, the brand name that the pharmaceutical companies you know show on the commercials on the TV. Okay, so when someone is toxic, they have too much uh, digoxin. You have to reverse it with which medication? Digoxin immune fab. And how do you know they're toxic? How do you know your patient is dig toxic? Well, a they're taking dig digoxin. <laughs> it's on the medication administration administration record. But what else? They got no low blood pressure, maybe, and even then, not really, because it lowers heart rate. And yes, lower heart rate is lower heart rate times stroke volume, low cardiac output, but it also increases contractility. So it's almost like it's a catch-22, right? When we go back to that previous slide with A, B, C, D medications, all of them lower blood pressure and all of them lower heart rate, but only one little asterisk, so I can't say all, one little asterisk, digoxin actually raises blood pressure a little bit because it actually increases contractility, okay? But you're gonna get vagus nerve activity. And what does the vagus nerve do? It makes you throw up. So you get nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, like, like, well, that's every medication. I thought that was the right answer for every medication. Well, this is like exorcist, or what's the word? Poltergeist? All right, anyways, <laughs> exorcist, yeah, right. Yeah, so I know my movies. So you got, you got, you're like, they're like vomiting all over the place, right? You go in the room, it's like, what is all this? It's like, oh, I got, you know, I, I took so much, too much of my cardiac medication. Well, ding, ding, ding. That is probably digoxin, right? So that's a prominent side effect is this nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. The only reason I'll put nausea, vomiting, diarrhea on a medication for a slide is because it causes profound nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Otherwise, that's the right answer for every medication, okay? And it also causes yellow halos. You notice the yellow halo around the, the slide there. So the yellow halos are also a unique side effect. Can't really explain it that well. Why does it cause yellow halos, not red halos? You can't really explain it. So that's one of those things just like you have to be, you know, you have to be cool at parties and win at Jeopardy when you say yellow halos for digoxin, right? It's also what Van Gogh had. That's why all of his paintings have a yellow halo on them. Okay, he had digitoxicity. Digoxin is also found in a plant, right? And that plant's like the foxglove plant. And he ate it to calm his nerves, to lower his heart rate, right? He had some psych issues. Right, y'all's tore up. He bit his ear, tore up his ear. He wasn't Mike Tyson, was he? Anyways, he, you know, he he went deaf for, for some reason, and then he also saw yellow halos and painted them. Okay, so why would you get dig toxic? Well, you have this mechanism right here. If we increase calcium, they're going to have more calcium available. It's going to be, it's going to, all the calcium is going to go in, and that will potentiate this whole digoxin mechanism, and that makes us higher risk for dig toxicity. Low potassium and low mag. Well, low mag means low potassium but low potassium will also trigger this mechanism, right? DIG binds to available potassium sites, and if I have, and if I have more potassium sites available, I have more DIG available to do its thing, okay? Renal failure, it's, well, that, if you know your renal failure, you know that patients with renal failure have high potassiums, but uh, the reason why renal failure causes DIG toxicity is because less DIG is getting peed out by the kidneys, right? And then other antiarrhythmics can potentiate it, there's also the ST segment might be scooped. So there's other fun things. But the big thing is that it's lowering heart rate and it's causing nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and causing yellow halos, which are showing someone has dig toxicity. 
And obviously, if you look at the dig level, it is high, right? Used to be that the NCLEX would test you and have to give a no all the levels of all, all electrolytes and uh, medication levels and everything. But now it's just, it'll tell you the, the normal range right there, right? Yes? What do you mean by yellow halos? Yellow halos is when you see, like if you, what you see is yellow or you're around your vision. Okay. All right, so let's take a break and come back for EKG basics. I thought that was EKG basics. What the heck? <laughs> All right, so EKG basics, the boxes. All right, so now we're going to go into the actual boxes and what they mean and how to calculate a heart rate. And then we'll talk about the intervals and what those are important for. We kind of talk about some of them, like QT interval is pretty important. PR intervals are becoming important. We talk about the about 80 blocks. So we'll talk about these guys. And then we'll dive, dive into the actual rhythms itself, where, we, again, you have to know the basics, just like a disease process, what causes it, what are the symptoms of it? What are the treatment of it? What are, what are diagnostic tests I might do for it? What are the complications of that, of that disease process or EKG, like death for asystole is a complication, right? And then what are the nurse interventions? What should I do if someone has this rhythm? What should I teach someone? What should I, you know, what, you know I'm not going to reiterate myself and say what are the side effects because, you know, we teach the side effects of this medication. Okay, right? All right, so the EKG boxes, all right? So the little boxes are worth how much? Zero point depends. He's, well, it depends. It depends what direction you're going. If you're going north south, I mean up and down, it's one little millivolt. If you're going left and right, that is in seconds or milliseconds. If you look at a 12 lead EKG, or most physicians are trained in milliseconds, you just got to be able to interchange between that, between that sometimes, right? But going left and right is 0 0.04, right? Point, sorry, I said one millivolt. It's, a, it's 0 0.1 millivolts, right? So if you're going left and right, that's 0 0.04 seconds. So five little boxes is what? 0 0.2. 0 0.04 times five little boxes is equal to 0 0.2. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's the nice thing about that is that when you have those five big, five little small, sorry, five little five small boxes, the lines get a little bit darker. So they're a little bit darker after every five boxes, right? Sometimes you have to, you know, cross your eyes like a magic eye. But for the, when it's a good printout, it's HD, you know, UHD. You can actually see the the thicker line, and those thick between each thicker line is 0 0.2, right? If you have five thick lines, that's 0 0.2 times five, which is one second, right? So the big boxes can t give you a lot of good information because we said five small boxes inside of one big box. Well, we measure PR intervals, right? If it's, if it's bigger than one big box, you've got an AV block. You have an, a, when we talk about AV blocks, they usually always have a prolonged PR interval. So if it's bigger than one box, that's a quick, quick, quick clue that you have a AV block on your hands, right? And then what else? The QRS, we're not gonna really spend too much time in the QRS. All you have to know is if it's prolonged, it's a bundle branch block, not an AV block, but a bundle branch block. But we're not going to differ, and you won't differ them in other semesters either, whether it's a left or right bundle branch block. If you, if, if in clinical you want to know and you want to come to me and ask, we can go over it. But it's not not important. All you have to know is that it is, if it's wide, it could be a bundle branch block. Okay. Yeah, the QRS. And yeah, the PR is wide. It's usually a AV block. And then the QT interval. So the QT interval is tells us how long it takes the heart to repolarize and if it's getting longer and longer and longer they're at risk for what lethal rhythm torsades and we'll talk more about torsades right so another thing you want to notice that all of these are measured what isoelectric to isoelectric isoelectric to isoelectric right so they're always isoelectric it's not any kind of dip or, or, or divot that you're measuring these from it's always str from straight line to straight line okay all right, what else about the boxes? So uh, going up and down is in millivolts, going left and right is in seconds. That's really what we're going to be dealing with. You're not, we're not going to be dealing with, oh, the QRS is, you know, five millivolts. It's not going to be important to us right now. When you study 12 leads after nursing school, then yeah, that you can study that and realize someone has left ventricular hypertrophy or right ventricular hypertrophy. But right now you're focused on little boxes. And all this you learned in physiology, all the little small boxes and millivolts and, and, and uh, intervals and such, right? But we're just going to now go into apply them. If they're increased, 
what does that mean? And what am I going to do about it? If, I, if it's a QT is prolonged, what am I going to do about it? Okay. So again, going up and down is 0.1 millivolts. One small box left and right is the um, is in seconds, right? So PR, QRS, what's RR? It's respiratory rate. What the heck is that? What the heck is an RR? That's how you calculate your heart rate. So R to R is from R wave to R wave. So well, that's not isoelectric, isoelectric. Well, you could do you could do here to here if you wanted to. All you're doing is looking for what the between the dif different QRS conflicts is. The R to R is easier to spot though. So you look from one peak to the next peak. What's the R to R interval? And when you have the R to R interval, that's seconds. And now you can figure out beats per minute by using dimensional analysis, right? So if you know is that's, that's uh, R to R is this many seconds and how many beats per minute, you could figure that out, right? So, but there's an easier shortcut method that we'll talk about, okay? So PR, QRS, R to R interval is important. QT interval is important, okay? And then we talked about the small box and large box sizes. And then strips are most commonly six seconds. When we show you a strip, it's usually six seconds. And you can assume on the test also that if I give you a strip and like it's an irregular rhythm, there's a, there's a way to, to calculate the heart rate. You can say, oh, is this 5.5 seconds or six seconds? It's, six, it's a six second strip, all right? But in real life, if you were looking at a, a readout, you use little hash marks right there. And they denote three seconds of time, right? And or and so that you can, if you have two of those together, you have, of course, six seconds. So just an FY when you're looking at a strip in real life, okay? And if you're looking at an irregular rhythm, you need six seconds to calculate the heart rate, all right? Because you estimate the heart rate based on how many R waves there are in that, uh, that strip, okay? You need six seconds to do the estimation correctly, okay? And then the regular rhythms, though, you can't count, if you can't count the number of R waves in a six second stroke and multiply by 10, which is the, the shortcut for the um, irregular rhythms, you have to calculate the R to R interval, or you can use the 300 method, which is a cool workout back in the early 2000s, all right? But the 300 method is when you, when you have to memorize these, the sequence of numbers, you can not memorize it and do the dimensional analysis every time, but you're gonna be hampering yourself. So there, there is a little quick shortcut to this. So we'll describe these two methods of calculating the heart rate. Okay, so down in the bottom right corner is those for the math nerds, right? If you really want to figure out what the you know beat to beat second is and then how many beats per minute and multiply this and multiply that, that will get you to the right answer. Or you could do that five times. Do the math five times. It's like, well, how much is it for one big box? Well, R, if the R to R for one big box is 0 0.20, right? And I do all the math, I get 300. My heart rate's 300 beats per minute if my R wave was right there. If my heart rate was that fast, it's 300 beats per minute, right? Now, if it was the next big box, I throw the numbers in there, 0.4 seconds, right? 0.40 seconds, not 0.04. But then I put all the math in, I get 150. I put the, do it the, the next box, I get 100, right? The next box, 75. Next box, 60. Why is this important? Because you can just line up a QRS complex with a line, right? The solid, solid line right there, right? And then go out and you can easily see if it's a tachycardia because it's greater than 100 or it's a bradycardia, it's less than 60. You can see where it falls in that, um, that space. So the, uh, I asked ChatGPT for a song that's, that, ma that lines up these numbers that they had poor results. But anyways, it, gets, uh, it was like, it was like doing like Frere Jacques and such. Either way, 300, 150, the 100, and then if it's, if it, your QRS, your next, R, your next QRS complex was less than 100 or was within that space, that you have a tachycardia in your hands, right? Guaranteed. Now, if it's QRS complex followed after that, it was a, a either a sinus rhythm or, or, sorry, a regular rhythm or bradycardia. Okay, so I mean, you can. There's other methods. There's the 1500 and 300 uh, division method where you count the number of small boxes and then divide it by by 1500. Like that takes a long time. Also, you can take 300. All the math checks out over here if you do 300 and 1500. But uh, again, if, if this is a shortcut, so you just memorize those numbers and you'll get to the right answer every time. So we have some little practice questions that will uh, will make this uh, make sense, right? All right, so there's a 10x method. So you have the 300 method and the 10x method. Only one of these can be used for regular rhythms, and that's the 300 method. For irregular rhythms, you have to use the 10x method, which is where you just count the number of complexes, PVCs included, R waves included, 
all those things you count inside of a six second strip and that in both by 10 that is your heart rate okay so first in the bottom left there you see the six seconds right there so if this is like in real life but on the test again i would probably give you just the six seconds i would cut off those other complexes right but if we look at those how many how many complexes we've got right there in the bottom left corner between that and that six seconds in, the, in that six seconds as marked there 10 all right so 10 times 10 is 100 the heart rate's 100 okay it's like why does that not work for regular rhythms it just doesn't because it's there's there's variability there okay so there's a quick way to figure out your your heart rate okay so the first thing to know it note if you're calculating someone's heart rate is is it irregular or regular right if it's irregular i just count the number of complexes and multiply by 10 all right in six seconds not like 20 seconds right and if it was regular then i have to look at the i could measure the number of small boxes and divide and such but if i memorize the 300 150 175 deal that's going to get me the heart rate approximated okay all right do you want to separate in groups or do you want to do this one together all right so this one together the other ones we'll do in groups like the sinus rhythms and such all right so the what is the rate for number one in the top left there so notice that the QRS complex lines up nicely with a big solid line there, right? So if we go out and we look at this guy here, okay? So we got a solid line right there, right? The next solid line, you might have to cross your eyes, but there's that, if the R wave was right there, heart rate's 300. But that's 300, 150, 100, heart rate X equals 75. It lined up perfectly. That's nice, right? Next one, you don't have a doesn't line up in a big box, but it does kind of. It's still a regular or irregular rhythm. That's a regular rhythm. So I could kind of approximate. It's like the halfway point of the box. So there's if a heart rate was right here, it'd be 300, 150. What's next? 100. What's next? 75. What's next? 60. Heart rate 60. That's borderline. It could be bradycardia, it could be just, just on the cusp. We'll continue to monitor, right? So heart rate is 60 for that one. So all we're doing is calculating the rate. We're not interpreting the rhythm right now, all right? Next one, regular or irregular? That's an irregular rhythm. Why is it irregular? How do I know that? So to, comp to know something's irregular, the R to R intervals are different, all right? So what's an R to R interval? It's the distance between here and here, here and here here and here here and here right so if i look at this one and this one if i were to measure that i got my calipers out i spent the extra 20 bucks on ns101 i got about my calipers then i could pull it out and i could say look the, it is even all right it's the same number every time but you can kind of eyeball that for number three right you can see that is not even between here and here right those are different yes all right so this r to r interval and that r to r interval will do 300 150 i'm gonna get different numbers each time right so I just take that six second strip, we'll just assume it's six seconds, and multiply by what? 10. So how many complexes are, complexes are there? Heart rate is what? 90. Okay. Next one, irregular or regular? There's extra space there. I mean, if I cross my eyes and close one eye, it looks like a little bit of extra space there. Right? So it might be just a PAC or something, which it looks like it is. But um, if it's irregular, let's just assume it's irregular. What do I got? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? So heart rate is what? 60. Okay. Next one definitely has some irregularity there. So we've got this little run of SVT at the front, and then we're back to our normal rhythm there. I mean, you can measure the heart rate for the normal rhythm, and you can measure the heart rate for the fast rhythm, because the fast rhythm looks, it looks a little bit regular. But let's just assume the whole thing is irregular, right? So how many complexes do we have in that six seconds trip? 14, what's the heart rate? 140. Okay, top right, what do we got? Is that irregular or regular? That's an irregular rhythm. That's a six second strip we'll assume, right? And then what's the heart rate? 17 complexes times 10 is 170 is the heart rate okay and then next one number seven irregular or regular that's an irregular rhythm so is that uh, how many complexes we got there six so heart rate is 60. okay 
<coughs> Next one, regular or irregular? That's a regular rhythm. So that means we have to use what method? 300. So 300, 150, 100, 75 is between 75 and 100. It's halfway, so therefore it's probably 92. I don't know, right? Let's say 92. All right? That's my heart rate. We know, it, but if it's a, it's a sinus rhythm, spoiler, so we know it's either sinus rhythm, sinus brady, or sinus tech. So what is it? It's sinus rhythm with a heart rate of approximately 92, right? Next one, looks a little bit faster, so it's probably a sinus tack, but uh, how fast is it? Is it like upwards of 150 where I'm concerned that they could be at risk for some uh, hemodynamic compromise, or is it maybe a little bit stable, All right? So this guy lines up with nicely, right? So what's the next box? If there was a QRS complex right there, heart rate's 300. If there's a QRS complex right here, heart rate is 150. If there's a heart if there's a QRS complex right there, heart rate is 100. So the heart rate is between 100 and 150, about halfway, about 127. All right? On the 300s, are only counting the dark lines, correct? Dark lines, yeah. I mean, you can do the other thing where you just count the small boxes and divide it into 1,500, but then you have to use a calculator. It takes time, all right? You, don't got, you have 1.2 minutes for each question. All right, but number 10. What is the sequence? What is the social security number for EKGs? What is it? B. B, all right? I mean, you can go further. I think it goes like a 35 next, but it really, once you're less than 50, you're, 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 you know what you got, okay? And number 11, 3.5 beats in a six second strip. And let's say it's an irregular rhythm. So what's the heart rate? B, 35, right? Three and a half beats in that six second strip times 10 is 35. Which of, what's the width of each small box? Not 0 0.40, but 0 0.04, okay? And number 13, five beats in an irregular rhythm, right? So five beats equals five times 300? No, five times 10, right, is 50. Well, I circled both, I guess. All right, so C. And then 14. Big boxes are 0 0.20 seconds, right? But it's, they've got two options for 0 0.20, so which one is it? A, a big box goes five boxes up and five boxes across, otherwise it's not a box, right? It'd be a, a rectangle. And then distance of two big boxes and two little boxes is what? So two big boxes means I have 10 small boxes, right? There's five small boxes per big box. So what is it? Let's see, 0.48, does that, does that equate? So how much is a small box? 0.04, right? So 0.04 times 12, right? So what's 12 times four? 48.48, okay. Makes sense for rates? Any questions on rates? All right, so the first thing is, is it irregular or regular? And then you look at the strip and see what you got. That's gonna tell you if you have irregular or regular. And then you either multiply by 10 or you use the 300 method, right? Which one do you use the 300 method for? For regular rhythms, right? And irregular rhythms, you count the number of complexes and you multiply by what? by 10. Any questions? All right, so the complex itself. So talk about the intervals that, that, that are present, okay? So again, you measure the, how do you measure rhythm, uh, intervals? They're from where to where? They're from isoelectric, not the Q, but the right before the Q to the isoelectric over here. QT interval is right there, right? QT can be funky because people won't put it before the T wave, it's just after. I don't have a good mnemonic for that, but we only know once the ventricles have officially completed, and that's when the T wave is officially finished, right? And we have the PR interval, which is what? Isoelectric, not the top of the P wave, not the beginning, of the, not the end of the P wave, but before the P wave even lifts off, right? So isoelectric to isoelectric. So we're measuring PR interval. So that is an important, oops, PR interval. Important interval that will let us know if we have a, a 
bundle branch or an AV block? Isn't that to the queue, basically? It is. It's a misnomer. It's to the it's technically to the end of the R, technically. Yeah. So in some, well, I should probably rephrase that. It's probably some some QRS complex could be QRS, they could be RS, they could be S, they could be Q. There's all kinds of different QRS complex flavors out there. So yeah, it should, sometimes uh, there's not even a Q wave on certain QRS complexes. So yeah, it is a little bit finicky. But yeah, it's to the start of the QRS complex. And it's not the halfway through, it's isoelectric to isoelectric, just before it lifts off or just before it goes down for Q wave, for instance. Okay. And then R to R interval we talked about. R to R interval is to measure what? What's the whole purpose of R to R? The only purpose of R to R is to assess irregularity and also assess heart rate. Okay. All right. And we talked about the size of the boxes and such as well. All right, so R to R and P to P intervals. All right, so the R to R interval, you can do the math. You can just do six, the, it all uh, equates down to 60 divided by the R to R interval. And that'll get you to the right heart rate, the exact heart rate. But uh, what we want to know is figure out is it tacky or Brady, basically. And that's what the 300 method will help you. And also the multiple by 10 if it's irregular will help you. Okay, so the whole purpose of the R, purpose of the R to R interval is to let you know if you have a fast rhythm or not, right? Also to tell you if you have a irregular rhythm or not, right? Because if the R to R is different or same, will you have an irregular rhythm? When you have a regular rhythm, what did I just say? If you have an irregular rhythm, what will the R to R interval be? Different or same? Be different, right? All right, so then that's really the only purpose. I mean, if you have your calipers that you bought, right, for 20 bucks, Go for it, right? Otherwise, all you can just fold over the paper and use poor, the poor man's uh, calipers. You just measure the R to R and just kind of slide your paper to the side and see if they march out, see if they are equal, right? If they're not equal, that means the R to R intervals are different, therefore I have an irregular rhythm, right? So who's the poor man? That's us, all right? So what else? So P to P interval. P to P interval is just the atrial rate. So really we are calculating technically the ventricular rate. And people with sinus rhythms, they have the P and the QRS is match, right? P wave QRS, P wave QRS. But some people don't always have that luxury, right? Some people have P wave, nothing. Then P wave QRS, P wave QRS, then P wave, nothing. So they have dropped QRSs. So one of the ways we can see if someone has a um, irregular rhythm is, is that fashion. But also there's AV, what's known as AV dissociation, where the atria are doing their own thing compared to the ventricles. The ventricles are contracted at their own beat of their own drum, literally, and the atria are doing their own thing. So they are literally divorced, right? They're doing their own thing. So like when you have ventricular tachycardia, your ventricles have taken over, right? And they are tacking away ventricular style, which is wide QRS complex style, right? They're, they're tacking away, and you can even just kind of find, find some P waves hidden in there doing their own thing, right? That's called AV dissociation. So VTAC is a good reason to compare. So if you look, so the reason to measure a P to P interval, sometimes it's, it's obvious, but other times you can, like this one right here, if I measure the P to P interval, whoop, why is my P buried in that T wave? That means it was doing its own thing, right? It wasn't P QRS, P QRS. The P wave is doing its own thing and the QRS is doing its own thing. Let me do that different color. Here's the QRS doing its own thing, right? So that's the QRS doing its own thing, that, that marches out, and my P waves march out too. They're, the P to P and the R to R are different. So that's a way to assess for um, AV dissociation. And sometimes you'll see the when the P wave is like that, when it has different, when it's marched out, it's like, well, well there's no P wave right there, but you can see it bumped up that, um, that T wave a little bit. It added some positivity to it, okay? So it's a way to identify third degree heart blocks, which we'll learn about later today, okay? And VTAC, we're not really going to differentiate that here or even in nursing school, but there is technically AV dissociation. The VTAC is doing its own thing, right? All right, so yeah, so measurement of atrial rate. So AFib, can you measure P to P interval? AFib, as we'll learn, has no P waves. It has fibrillatory waves, right? But you can measure an A flutter. Technically, yes, those are F waves, but you can A flutter, you can measure how fast the atria are beating, right? And why is that worrisome? Or why is that needed if I measure uh, flutter waves? If I measure the P to P, like it's really, really narrow. I'm trying to see if I have an example here. I don't have an example of A flutter. Maybe next time I'll put an example A flutter. But I'll point it out later when we talk about A flutter. It has little flutter waves, like three P waves before every QRS. 
And those three P waves, if I measure them, they could be like 300 or 280, right? Now, the AV node is not suppressed. It's going to let every single one of those through. And that's a problem, all right? That's going to cause the heart to be too fast, and you can get a low blood pressure out of that, okay? So that's the idea behind measuring the RDR interval and the P to P interval. Okay, so P waves and T waves, we're really not going to focus on because they, that's going to be more 12 lead area, and that's really after nursing school. But what you got to know for P waves is that every P wave should be followed by a QRS complex, right? Every time there's a P wave, there should be a QRS complex. If there's not, they could be divorced, right? That means they have a third degree AV block usually, okay? And then there are different P wave alternatives. They, they turn into fibrillatory waves or flutter waves. We talk about AFib, A flutter, right? And you really cannot get a PR interval when you have those guys, right? So oftentimes you get EKGs turned in with the mini care plans and clinical worksheets, and they say the PR interval is, point, is 0.12. It's like, how'd you get that? that there's there, you can't get a PR interval with A fib or A flutter, okay? What else? There are morphology things you can point out in clinics. Like, oh, look, they have COPD. Look at that P wave, right? And you can say, oh, look, they have mitral valve stenosis. Look at that P wave, right? You can pick up those things on P waves. T waves, or sorry, P, back to P waves. P waves should be symmetric, right? They should not be abnormal. If they're abnormal, they might have a disease or disorder. Uh, T waves, they are asymmetric. If they are symmetrical, that's a problem, okay? So T waves, they should never be inverted. That's a problem. You should never have inverted T waves. They should not be symmetrical, like I mentioned. They should not be peaked. If you have peaked T waves, that's usually an indication of what? Hypotassium. Of high potassium, All right? If they're peaked and wide, it's a sign of an MI, typically, okay? So negative, they should not be negative T waves, right? There, is, there are a few exceptions, but that's the idea behind P waves and T waves. All right, so the PRI, the PR interval. You have to know the normal, all right, 0.12 to 0.20. I could might as well say 0.10 or 0.08 because it doesn't matter if it's low. It only matters if it is high. If it's greater than 0.20, that means my it's taking a lot longer to get all these impulses through to the ventricles because the ventricles are the QRS complex, right? So that means there's something going on with the AV node. It's suppressed in some fashion. Why is it suppressed? What are some reasons you can think of? Someone's taking too many medications that are suppressed in their AV node, right? What's an example of medication suppressed AV node? What's that? Digoxin, I heard. Digoxin. All right, so digoxin affects the... Contractility and heart rate. Contractility and heart rate. I don't have an extra cookie for you, sorry. All right, so yeah, so AV node is going to be... Let me know if it's good. I bought it. So uh, it's some... I, I told them to make me some cookies for my, for my students. Oh, how old are they? Um, <laughs> I need letter-shaped cookies for my EKG lecture. <laughs> All right, so anyways, PR interval should be great. If it's greater than 0.20, there's a problem there, right? And you measure PR intervals from where? Isoelectric to isoelectric, okay? So it's the start of the QRS, and it's before the P wave. So P, look at this P wave right here, that PR interval. That is ridiculous. Right? So when you have ridiculous P weight, PR intervals, that's usually a sign of a third degree AV block. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we talk about AV blocks. Okay? So short, that could be, you know, we're not going to talk about focus on short right now. But long, that means we have an AV block of some sort. Right? So longer, longer, longer. We'll talk about those with AV blocks. That's usually a second degree type 1. So we'll talk about all these degrees and types at the end of the lecture today. All right? So hold AV blockading agents. What is an AV blockading agent? The Joxin, all right. What else? Veratmil. What's Veratmil? Non DHP couch channel blocker. There you go. All right, so we got non DHP couch channel blockers such as Veratmil. Can, if someone has Veratmil on board and you got the PR interval of 0.28, it's like, well, shoot, I should probably hold this medication, right? And whenever you hold the medication, you have to let the doctor know what you're doing. You can't just be like a cowboy. It's like, no, I'm not going to give this medication. You have to, you have to be, that's, it's, it's, it's sus. So when it's sus, you have to let somebody know, right? Like, I'm going to hold this medication and notify the doctor and see do they still want to give it. And also you need to have, there should be parameters on a lot of these medications. They should say hold for heart rate less than 50 and hold for a PR interval greater than what? 0.20. Usually they do like 0.24, like they'll, they'll allow a little bit of risk versus benefit kind of thing. The benefits outweigh the risk, right? So they're, 
you know, their cabinets don't get made, made inappropriately, right? It's like, oh, I will allow up to 0.24. But as far as we're concerned, we're concerned when it's greater than 0.20, okay? So that's the, the key takeaway with PR intervals. And we'll come back to the other pieces when we talk about AV blocks. All right, so the QT interval. So the QT interval is the completion of repolarization of the ventricles. If it is prolonged, it can lead to torsades, right? So QT is super prolonged here. We can lead to torsades et point. And we'll talk about torsades when we talk about ventricular rhythms, but it's important to measure the QT because why is that important? If it, well, if it's prolonged, I'm at risk for this lethal rhythm, and that's not good. So it's our responsibility to know what the QT interval is before we give a medication, for instance, that might prolong it. Or if I notice the QT interval is prolonged, I say, hey, what's the potassium? Or what's the magnesium? Because that could be prolonging my QT interval, right? So electrolytes are an important thing that prolong the QT. Just being bradycardic itself can prolong the QT, but uh, drugs are things that will prolong the QT. A lot of drugs, like almost every drug has a little bit of QT prolongation. But the drugs we have to pay attention to are down here, right? Are the ones that are going to prolong the QT. And notice amiodarone is on that list, right? So amiodarone is a significant reason that our QT can be prolonged, okay? You'll learn about antipsychotics in psych. You'll learn about uh, antibiotics in MedSurge 2. Antimedics, I think we'll touch on a little bit, but you know, someone's getting nausea medication, someone's getting antibiotics, someone's getting antipsychotics. That's a good question for your clinical instructor to ask you, hey, what's the, if your patient's on the monitor, what's the EKG, right? You know, the QTC, or the QT, sorry, the QT is 0.52. Well, is that bad? Should I hold the medication? You probably should, you should and you should let somebody know about it, right? Now, the caveat with QT intervals is, the QT interval is always going to be longer or shorter whether your heart rate's higher or lower. If your heart rate's low, your QT is guaranteed to be prolonged because it's going to take a long time before each beat. Same thing with the QT is, uh, sorry, in, in tachycardia, the QT is, always, is never going to be greater than 0.45 because what is, what is 0.45? 0.45 seconds, right? So if you do 60 divided by 0.45, that's like 110 or something. So it's always going to be less than that, right? So QTC is, um, corrected for heart rate. So there's a little formula here. You just you just go to MD calc and you just punch in the numbers. All you gotta punch in is the QT and the R to R. And once so you have to have an R to R interval, which corrects it for rate, which R to R is for rate, right? And you have your QT that you measured, you punch those in and you get a, a number. Usually on most 12 leads and most uh, most of the monitor, I think both, both hospitals use the same monitor system, the GE monitor, it tells you the QTC also, as long as you punch in the R to R, right? So you punch those numbers in, it will tell you the QTC. So the QTC is immensely more important than the QT, all right? So why is that, what's the purpose of QTC? It is corrected for heart rate. If someone's heart rate is 60, you can trust that the QT and the QTC are the same. It's just how, that's how the math works out. But if it's anything but heart rate is 60, you have to do QTC, and that will tell you if it's prolonged or not, all right? And what is a prolonged QTC? Greater than 0.45, right? So if it's greater than, if it's QTC is 0.62, and someone's about to get their dose of uh, you know, Leviquin right here, what's the concern? They could have a major adverse cardiac event or a MACE, right? We talk about diabetes medications. Some of them cause, cause MACEs. What's the major adverse cardiac event? Torsades, right? So that's a problem. When you're just giving medications just left and right, you don't realize that they could be at risk for a lethal rhythm, right? And cardiac arrest, okay? And if they also have a hypomagnesemia and a hypokalemia and a QTC of 0.62 and they're getting amiodarone and an antimedic and they're getting Leviquin and they're getting all these things all together, all these are additive. They don't, it's not like one or the other. They all are going to add on top of each other and they're high risk of torsade in that case. All right, so the ST segment, you're gonna focus on that more in MedSearch 3. That's where you look to see, well, the ST segment's elevated. I might have a ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or a STEMI, right? And then you have end STEMIs as well, which is just where the ST segment is not elevated. It's just depressed, right? Or the T wave might be inverted too. So those are called STEs, right? ST elevations or STDs. 
ST depression. Okay, so when you look at the ST segment, sometimes if it's not isoelectric, right, it's up or down, that is a sign that there might be some heart attack happening, right? There's other reasons, but most, the most worrisome thing is that there might be a heart, a heart issue happening. Okay, so sometimes EKGs are only like 60% accurate. So when someone comes with a heart attack and they say, oh, I put them on the EKG and EKG show nothing. Well, they're only 60% accurate. It's, it's only a little bit better than a coin flip, right? So you, it could be really looking at the symptoms is the most important piece. You'll learn about the symptoms more in message three. I think we'll touch on it in, uh, in it for exam two because your patient can have a, a complication of acute coronary syndrome if they have CHF or the like, okay? So the priority if someone has chest pain is to get a 12 lead to confirm. And even then, if they still have the have chest pain, it could be, still be a heart attack. Okay. So ST elevation depression is just at the ST segment, which is isoelectric. So isoelectric. If that's depressed or elevated, that's a sign of um, a heart. It could be a sign of a heart attack. All right. So the QRS. So 0.08 to 0.12. Really don't care if it's less than 0.08. What we care about is if it is longer than 0.12. And some people might argue and, and push up their glasses and say, well, 0.10 to 0.12 is also concerning. That's a sign of uh, you know, ventricular delay. But really, greater than 0.12 is where we are concerned, right? That means the QRS is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That means it's taking longer and longer time to get through the 405 and 5 freeways here, right? Either there's a bundle branch block or there is something that's depolarizing and causing a wide complex, such as a ventricular tachycardia, like a PVC or a VTAC that's causing, it's a abnormal conduction through the heart, okay? And yes, the QRS has different um, morphologies. They can be just an R wave, like I mentioned, just an S wave, just a Q wave, uh, just a QR, just a RS. There are different variations. I'm not gonna test you on that. There are different ways to figure it out, right? But they're not, it's not always gonna be textbook Q first, then R, then an S, right? They're, they can have differentiating looks to them, okay? So more important is, is it wide? Because if it's wide, that means that it could be ventricular. Okay, it could be ventricular in origin. Now the caveat here is that if it's narrow, that means it's always coming from the atria, 100%. There's no way that it came from the ventricles if it is narrow, okay? But what if you have an SVT or you have a really fast heart rate up top, right? A really fast heart rate up top and it's going through the ventricles really fast and they have a bundle branch block. Well, that's going to be wide, isn't it? So there is, you know, that when someone has a wide complex tachycardia, it could be atrial or supraventricular, or it could be ventricular. Okay. So atria, if it came from the atria, QRS is always what? Narrow or wide? Always narrow, no matter what, right? If it's wide, sorry, if it's narrow, it's always coming from the atria. But sometimes you could have AV no problems, you could have conduction delays, you could have bundle branch blocks, and sometimes it can come with the atria. So when you have a wide complex, it's either or. It's either atrial rhythm or ventricular rhythm. You have to do a 12 lead, you have to consult a cardiologist to make sure it's not something, you know, to figure out what it is and what medication they might be on. And again, that's not something we're gonna have you differentiate, like looking at a 12 lead and looking at these things. But what, what is important is that if they have a wide complex, a wide QRS greater than how much? 0.12, and it's tacky, which is like greater than 100, especially if it's greater than 150, where you're really concerned that they could have, be having VTAC, right? It's not our job to figure out, oh, they could have a SVT with a bundle branch block and this and that. That's really, we have to report that. That's, that is critical that we know that Y complex tachycardias could possibly be, v, be VTAC. And VTAC is one of our lethal rhythms, which we'll be going over, okay? All right, so that is the idea behind QRSs, P waves, PR intervals, all these things, right? And again, a lot of this came from physiology. So we're recapping a lot of things here, okay? And then the next thing you have to know about is what does that mean and what do I do about it? So what are the nurse interventions I do for this? Like get a 12 lead is usually the right answer, right? I'm gonna get a 12 lead to figure out what exactly am I seeing? And you know, assess their blood pressure because if a heart, if a rhythm is going off, it might be affecting the blood pressure. Right. My next thing is to again notify provider, but uh, next thing is like, well, shoot, what's the magnesium level? Because my QT is prolonged. What is what medications might they be getting because the QT is prolonged, uh, or if the PR interval is prolonged, what medications might they be getting? Yes. 
Can you interpret the rhythm in the bottom right? Bottom right, it's by Gemini. It's a PAC by Gemini. So you got a, uh, actually it looks a little bit PVC, but it's a, you know, it's a rhythm that's ectopic. It's happening before it should, right? It's happening out of nowhere. Like their intrinsic rhythm, like their underlying rhythm, what they have normally is this guy right here, which comes from the atria, so it's narrow, right? And then they have little PVCs or, P, or, or PACs. We'd have to look a little closer and I'd have to see if there's like P waves there, which there looks like they're, mm, not really, the T waves, okay. Okay. Exactly. I think that's what I was kind of going for here. But yeah, the, the if this was right on top of that T wave, then you can be at risk for torsades, right? That's another important risk cause of torsades. If someone comes in with torsades, it's like, well, why'd they go into torsades? Or like, you're getting a report in the morning, and the nurse says, oh, they had an episode of torsades overnight. So, well, shoot, I got there's like three or four things I got to look at. Say, so first. Do they have like a lot of PVCs? That might be the reason. Next thing is what medications might they be getting? And the next thing is what electrolytes do they have? Yes. Yeah, like that, that could definitely be high risk for that. This over here is, is a supraventricular tachycardia. It's narrow. No way it's a VTAC, 100% no. But over here, this could be ventricular or it could be atrial. We really can't tell until we get a 12 lead. We look a little bit closer, okay? But if that was fast, right, how fast is that? This guy lines up with a nice line right there, right? 300, 150, 100, it's like 125, 130. So that is a wide complex tachycardia. That requires expert consultation. That means you notify a provider so they can look at it and they look at the patient too, see how they're looking and they might require medication, right? If, it's come, if that is indeed come from the ventricles, which is probably not because there's P waves before the QRS complex, then if it was like a ventricular tachycardia, we can give medication for it, right? What medication you can give for ventricular tachycardias? Dentistine is for SVTs. <clears throat> amiodarone. Who said amiodarone? All right, loop gets a cookie. All right, so yeah, so that's the idea behind these, uh, these rhythms. And the intervals, and the importance of the intervals is understanding what, you know, recognizing it, interpreting the information, analyzing the information that's in front of you, and then what do I do about it? What are my, what are the possible causes? What are the possible complications? What do I, what are my nursing interventions I do for it, right? All right, so we'll finish this little section on, on artifacts, and then we'll take another break, all right? So things that are not arrhythmias. So before we get into arrhythmias, where we talk about atrial rhythms and sinus rhythms and ventricular rhythms and AV blocks. We talk about things that are not rhythms, right? Things that are not rhythms, that you can't figure it out, it might be artifact, all right? And what is artifact? It's things that are, are interrupting your EKG interpretation, such as this guy right here. It's like, is that AFib or are they just brushing their teeth, all right? This right here, there's some restor variation on it. They're breathing up and down. The leads are, are on the belly instead of on the rib cage, right? So non-arrhythmias are, are things that you really can't figure out. Like, what is this? I don't know. Okay, so to avoid artifact, the thing you can do is make sure your leads are placed correctly, right? So limb leads, there are other different leads, like so precordial leads, or when you're talking about uh, 12 lead EKGs, there are some extra leads you can throw in the chest, but usually in the hospital setting, we'll just throw two out of those six, right? So our, there are different leads that are need to be placed on the chest. Lim, uh, limb leads are your white, your green, your red, and your black leads. So you got black, you got red, you got green, you got white. Those are your limb leads. As long as they're eight centimeters from the heart, you're fine. That, that is all it requires to get an accurate EKG, right? If you're right on top of the heart, it's not gonna be correct because it's measuring movement of vertices and, and all kinds of other fancy <laughs> physics to get you a good readout on your EKG. Some people put it like on the wrist and the ankle. It's like, okay, you're an overachiever. But the, all you have to do is eight centimeters, right? This needs to be eight centimeters from the heart. That's all you need. And avoid bony prominence, right? Because electricity, electricity does not conduct well through bone, right? It does great through water. And we're made most of it, 70, 80% water, right? So eight centimeters from the heart. And then also hairy chests are not okay, right? You can't be having hairy chests. That's not gonna have good limb contact. You have to be good contact with the skin. And when it contacts with the skin, you would usually want to scrub with alcohol and also 
even mentioned mentioning like scoring the patient. I was like, that seems a little bit extreme. Alcohol is, is good enough, right? And no, no hair. And when you cut hair off someone's chest, how do you document that? Clipped, right? Why don't you document shaved? It would open the skin up. It's a closer shave, and it's and if a surveyor comes in, they're gonna say, "Oh, you shaved the chest. What you you know that you're putting at risk for infection at that point." So clipping is the proper terminology there. Okay. So what else? So um, we got our limb leads, right? And how do you know which one goes where? There's a little cute mnemonic here, right? White on right, smoke over fire, right? And the green one is always the the ground leads. So like when you look at a electrical socket here are the ones that are not in the holes in the ground right there. They have, there should be a third hole, and that third hole is the grounding uh, pin, and that prevents the electricity from just going haywire, right? So usually when you have artifact, the first thing you should look at is the green lead attached, right? If it's not, it's probably the reason, okay? So that's the idea with, the, with your limb leads. And then we have two little brown leads for our, for our, um, our usual boxes that are on the patient. And they usually are in a, you know, on either side of the rib cage, or sorry, of the sternum. Okay, there are different locations. We're not going to focus on that. It's more 12 lead. Where am I doing a V1 or a V6 or a V4? That's more for 12 leads, which you don't learn in nursing school. Okay, so sometimes you can't figure out what the heck is what, right? Is it P wave or QRS or what's what? You can switch the leads. So you can look at lead two or lead three or uh, lead V1 or lead V3 or lead AVL. You know, there's different leads out there that you can interpret EKGs in. Just sometimes a QRS might be flipped. That's really the only difference. You should not have T-wave inversion, right? You should, your P-wave should always be upright. So that's the idea behind uh, looking at your EKG. It could be the, the leads are not placed correctly or we're not in the correct leads. Okay, so there are different kinds of artifact. Right, so we have like interference. Sorry, they got uh, movement right here. So they're moving along. They're maybe moving in the bed, or it could just be the lead is not tightly attached. Right, it's coming loose. Someone did not clip their hair. Right, so it could be also the wire itself is cracked. Right, going into the box, like that could be that could be a problem as well. Okay, uh, it's also they could be shivering. So shivering can cause artifact. Seizing can cause artifact. So the key takeaway here: someone has artifact is what. Just check the patients, check to see if they're okay, right? If you see this on the monitor, you're just like, oh, they, they're, they're okay. They, they, took, they take the monitor off from time, time to time. Mm -hmm. So it could be going in the room and they are asystole, right? And that's happened more than once. I can't tell the amount of times I've seen that, right? Patients have been transferred to the ER over to the ICU, they, and then they take the, all the monitoring equipment off and they transfer from one bed to the next bed, and they put all the monitoring equipment back on, and it's asystole. It's like, oh, are your leads attached? Yeah, they're attached. You got a pulse? No. So now, now we're going to, to CPR, all right? So that's kind of like a transport safety thing, is you always have two sets of leads on the patients before you hand off, okay? Anyways, skin prep is key, all right? If they're hairy, sweaty, salty people, that can be a problem, okay? So don't document shave. You wanna make sure you are clipping the hair. And we should be changing the leads at least every 24 hours. That's going to let us, because uh, the little gel contact on the leads can dry up. So we wanna make sure it's changed every 24 hours and as needed if they are sweaty, okay? Sometimes there's something called like 60 cycle interference. That's where they are playing with a, uh, like a, they have a LAN party going on in the room. You walk in the room, it's like, what is going on here? Can't, can't tell you the, like a handful of time if people brought in their own TV, they got their whole, they got like two computers hooked up or they got their PS5 going. So yeah, you, we can't be doing this. So you're, you know, dad needs to, 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 A, he needs to rest, but also B, this is not, uh, we're, it causes some interference, okay? So that's the idea. This little, this little green lead is your ground lead. That's it. So that's one thing you want to check if you have a lot of artifact going on, right? The 60 cycle interference is when you have other things plugged in. There's a story of, of a, from, went to some conference and the lady was saying, everybody was dying in bed five, couldn't figure it out. It's because the pacer that they plugged in was shorting every time they plugged into the wall because the ground lead was, was not working. Well, that's, that's, that's unfortunate. All right, so let's take a break and do sinus rhythms after the break. All right, so sinus rhythms. I've lost my pen. Where's my pen go? Right there. Nice. All right, so sinus rhythms. All right, so sinus rhythms can be separated into three different types. 
either have sinus rhythm, which is what we should be at right now at baseline. Humans are in sinus rhythm, right? Humans can also get fast heart rates. And usually if it's going through the normal pathways from S node to AV node to, you know, bundle of hiss all the way down, it's a, it could be fast or slow, right? Or normal, right? So sinus rhythm is 60 to 100 beats per minute. If you're faster than 100, it's going to be sinus tachycardia. There's some organizations that want to try to fit, change that, but it's been like this for like 75 years. They want to change sinus tachycardia to 95. It's like, guys, stop. 100 is perfect, right? So yeah, so 100 to 150. It starts, when you start getting up, up higher, you might have something else going on. But usually it's like might be PSVT, for instance. You got to kind of look a little closer and see, they, oh, I don't see any P waves. They, they might have PSVT. And we'll talk about PSVT. But right now we're talking about normal, right? Sinus rhythm. And then if we get less than 60, that's sinus bradycardia. The same evil organizations are trying to change to like 55, right? So just, just make it 60 to 100. It's been like that for forever, okay? So sinus bradycardia, sinus rhythm, and sinus tachycardia. So we're going to talk about each one of these things, each one of these rhythms. And again, we're going to talk about the causes, the symptoms, which are the same, and the treatments, and the complications, which are the same as well for the most part, and nurse interventions, which ironically are the same almost for every rhythm, unless, unless it's lethal. If it's lethal, that changes your nurse interventions. Otherwise, it's always the same intervention every single time that the nurse needs to do. All right, so normal sinus rhythm. So you've heard of sinus rhythm and you've heard of normal sinus rhythm. What the heck's the difference? Can I just say normal or not? Well, the only time you can say normal is if everything is absolutely perfect. That means the P wave's upright and symmetrical, the T wave is upright and asymmetrical, the QRS is less than, less than 0.12, the PR interval is less than 0.20, the QTC is less than point what? Four, five, right? Everything is absolutely pristine. There is absolutely no defects in that rhythm, right? And the rhythm is 60 to 100, right? That is normal sinus rhythm. So that's how you know you have NSR. You can chart NSR, you can say normal sinus rhythm on your EKG strip and turn it in and get a zero on EKGs because you can, cannot turn in normal sinus rhythm for your clinical worksheets or your mini care plans, all right? So you, can, you, you could try, but, that's, but you cannot turn in normal sinus rhythm. That does not show that you've interpreted EKGs. We want you to turn in something spicy, okay? So something that, not too spicy because you can lose points if you misinterpret your EKG, okay? So anyways, if there's any deviation from that, the P wave has P mitral, has two humps on it. That is considered sinus rhythm with two humps. If you don't know what the two humps are, you can ask, it's P mitral. But either way, maybe the QRS is prolonged. It's sinus rhythm with bundle branch block. Maybe it has a prolonged PR interval, sinus rhythm with prolonged PR interval. And as we'll learn today, that's an AV block of some sort, right? Or sinus rhythm with a uh, you know prolonged QTC, sinus rhythm with PVCs, sinus rhythm with PACs, sinus rhythm with a U wave, if you want to be fancy, right? So these are all flavor that we add to sinus rhythm. That means it's not normal because it has something else going on. It's like plain noodles, plain spaghetti noodles. So that is normal sinus rhythm. But if you have normal, if you have plain spaghetti noodles with marinara sauce, that might be an ST depression or an STD, right? So sinus rhythm with an STD. All right, or I add some beet to my marinara sauce that has an STD and a prolonged PR interval. You can have all kinds of things added to it, right? Those are additives to it. If I want to add some Parmesan cheese, that could be some PVCs, right? They could have PVCs and PACs, Parmesan cheese and bacon bits. I don't know what you eat. I, don't judge, I won't judge you, all right? So they could have all kinds of things going on. They could also have prolonged QRS amongst all those other things. And they could have a bundle branch block. Whether it's left or right, we're not going to have you decide right now. That's, that's after nursing school. So that makes sense, sinus rhythm with something, right? You can't just say, my interpretation of this EKG is bundle branch block. That's just like saying, I'm going to eat Parmesan cheese, right? No, you, you have to say, what is the underlying rhythm? What are the noodles? Is it penne? Is it ziti? Is it, you know, is it linguine? Is it angel hair pasta? I don't know, I'm also an expert in pasta. Either way, you have to know what the underlying rhythm is, and then there's other things you can add to it, okay? So PR interval greater than 0.20, it's probably an AV block, right? It's like 99% chance. Here as greater than 0.12, you got a bundle branch block. You got weird beat, extra beats in there. It might be a PVC, PAC. We're not gonna test you on PJCs, but PVCs, PACs, we will. Uh, the PVCs might have a pattern to them, and we'll talk about the pattern, whether it be couplets, triplets, quadruplets, or bigemini, quadrigemini, trigemini, oh my. It might be any one of those things, right? 
patient can have an ST, STD, not like a STD, but an STI, but it could have ST depression amidst their sinus rhythm. Is it, if they have an STD, are they normal sinus rhythm? No, they're sinus rhythm with an STD, okay? I mean, you could be normal sinus rhythm with STD too, I guess, right? Either way, uh, we got peaked inverted T waves. You have prolonged QTC, and that should be, that should, you know, tighten the sphincters because that could, patient could go into a lethal rhythm. So that's, that's concerning. Okay, so that's sinus rhythm and normal sinus rhythm. Normal sinus rhythm is no deficits, nothing spicy. All right, so that's all sinus rhythms. So now we are heart rates less than what to get sinus bradycardia? 60. There's no such thing as normal sinus brady. It's just sinus brady that is slow. How slow? Less than 60. Okay, so it has all the features. It could even be normal sinus rhythm, but it's just slow. It's not called normal sinus rhythm anymore, either, is it? Because it's slow. So to be normal sinus rhythm, you have to have no extra stuff, and you have to be 60 to 100. If you're less than 60 and it looks sinus, meaning that there's a P wave followed by a QRS, right? That is considered a sinus rhythm. Okay, so what causes sinus bradycardia? What makes your heart rate slow? Right, so we can think of drugs or meds. So we talk about different meds, like beta blockers, right? What's an example of a beta blocker? Ends in what? LOL. LOL. Especially the ones that have what mnemonic? Man babe. So man babe is a, they are definitely beta one specific. They are definitely going to lower the heart rates, right? We got non-DHP calcium blockers, right? That's our diltiazem and verapamil. Those lower the heart rate. The DHP ones cause a rise in heart rate. So those ones do not cause sinus bradycardia, they cause reflexive tachycardia. <coughs> Dig lowers the heart rate, like we mentioned. Adenosine is going to lower the heart rate to zero for eight seconds, and then it's going to reboot. And then amiodarone is going to also lower the heart rate, right? It's a K-channel blocker. So meds will do it. And then what about SA node suppression? What if our, how does our SA node get suppressed? Well, meds, but what else? So what if the blood vessel that feeds the SA node gets blocked? So that's called an MI, right? When the blood vessel, the heart, the coronary vessel gets occluded, that's called a myocardial infarction, right? So some MIs present with bradycardia, right? They have chest pain, like really profound chest pain that radiates to the arm or jaw, and they got a bradycardia. It kind of clues in the cardiologist what blood vessel is blocked, okay? So you got hypoxia. Hypoxia, if you have hypoxia because of a clot in the way, or you have hypoxia because there's low, low oxygen going, the heart doesn't know the difference, right? You got a low oxygen of the SA node, you're gonna get bradycardia. And it's really, really low oxygen. It's like, I thought low oxygen caused tachycardia. It does if everything works right. What if your oxygen is so low that the medulla, that is the control center for the autonomic system, dies? Then you can't send out the signal to your SNS to raise your heart rate, right? Same thing if your SA node dies because it has no, no oxygen. So usually bradycardias are a sign of something severe. Something really wrong is happening. Okay, so you have really, really like cause of bradycardia or die. You are dying in front of your in front of your eyes. So they have drugs, right? I for ischemia, which is myocardial ischemia, right? Or they have electrolytes. So ischemia could you could also kind of group in oxygen. Oxygen being low because there's a clot in the way, or oxygen low because their oxygen is low. Okay. So lights. So your potassium is super high. That's going to cause bradycardia. Your mag is high. Your calcium is high. All those things are going to cause bradycardia, okay? If your vagus nerve is tickled, right? What does your vagus nerve do? It's part of what system? Cause part of the parasympathetic, not the sympathetic. The sympathetic raises the heart rate, right? This is parasympathetic activity is increased. So if you have increased parasympathetic activity, why would that happen? Why would you tickle your vagus nerve? Maybe you're coughing too much. Maybe you're, you're doing too much suction on a patient that's not, not quite alert. You're massaging the carotids. The carotids, your vagus nerve runs right next to the carotids. So if you massage the carotid, it's going to cause your heart rate to get lower, right? If you're defecating like Elvis on the toilet, you're going to pass out because you get so bradycardic that you're not going to have enough out cardiac output and you get hypoxic, all right? It happens at least one, you know, three times a month where we have patients that have a vasovagal response, right? They pass out because the heart rate got too low, okay? Hypothermia, if you're super cold, everything shuts down, so your heart rate shuts down as well. And also hypothyroid, you'll talk about that more with, uh, in message three with thyroid disorders. And there's normal way, reasons why you're, you might be, your heart rate might be low, right? When someone's like, heart, you know, blood, heart rate's low in the monitor, and you run in the room, you run in the room, uh, are you an athlete? 
no, okay, so it might be something else. It might be drugs, <laughs> ischemia, or you know, electrolytes, right? So yes, athletes can have lower heart rates. Like who is it? Not Tiger Woods. Who's the other one that's profound? Like Lance, Lance Armstrong, one testy. So he's, uh, you know, he has a heart like a resting heart like 32. All right, but every single beat is like super strong, right? It's gonna support his blood pressure because blood pressure is a component of cardiac output, right? In the bottom left there. So cardiac output equals your heart rate times your stroke volume. So if your stroke volume is beasty, right? Every single beat is going to, com is going to contract and push out a lot of blood. Maybe you don't need such a high heart rate, but not everybody is, uh, not everybody has one testy, but not everybody has is Lance Armstrong and they can't, contract as well as everybody else, right? So they, you know, a normal person, 60 to 100, 50 to 100, 45, they can tolerate a good blood pressure. But once you start hitting under, you know, under 50, that's gonna start causing some symptoms. And what are those symptoms? They're all symptoms of poor cardiac output, right? You have no cardiac output to where? Where does, where does blood go? It goes to your brain, right? If you don't get blood flow to your brain, what do you get? You get confused, you get altered, you get seizure activity, you get comatose, you get stuporous, you get uh, obtunded, you get somnolent, you get semi-comatose, you get, what is the underlying thing? Brain don't work, right? So you could say altered, that, that counts for all those things, right? So a test question could have any one of those 10 to 12 adjectives, but all of those things mean altered, right? So you don't have to memorize all those different things in every single way to describe someone doesn't is not functioning correctly, right? Now, if someone has can't like uh, you know they have psychiatric issues, that's different, right? We're talking about inadequate blood flow to the brain, all right? So you have poor cardiac output to the brain that is altered, right? What about to the skin? Poor cardiac output to the skin. You can get pale, right? The cardiac output is pale. You might get cool and clammy because now we have low blood pressure triggering the SNS and, and maybe it's and the SNS is trying to fire off, but guess what? They got all these beta blockers on board. The SNS cannot do its thing, right? So you get, uh, it could get fatigued, right? If you're very, very fatigued, we could be a, a, a vague symptom that might happen. The heart, you don't get blood flow to your heart because your, your heart pumps blood out, but it also comes right back around and, and perfuses itself during, during diastole. So if you don't get blood flow to your heart, what do you get? Ischemia, but the patient's not going to say, you know, nurse, nurse, I think I'm having ischemia. What are they going to say? They get chest pain, right? So they, they have pain in their chest, right? Muscles will be fatigued. Kidneys, what are the kind of symptoms you get if you have poor cardiac output to your, to your kidneys? Low urine output, right? So the patient's going to ring the call bell and say, you know what, my urine output is low. Right? That's not going to happen. So that, that's something you can find over like two hours, four hours. You say, oh, shoot, the cardiac output, you know, the urine output before was like 75 cc's an hour. And now it's like 20 cc's an hour. That's a sign of the bradycardia really having an effect on their cardiac output. Okay? Or the liver. This is going to just get, it's, it's not really, you can't really, it's, the liver does get cardiac output. Really, it'd be like uh, lab results, like, in, like the enzymes for the, for the liver, they would be elevated. And other, the GI system, where do they get symptoms of the GI system? Hmm? So they got low flow to the gut. They're going to start getting, they might get some abdominal pain. They might get nausea and vomiting because now the gut is not getting its perfusion. It starts freaking out and they start vomiting on you, right? So patients often like, might present with like, like MI. When they have a heart attack, they present with just the vomiting. And you really put on the monitor, the heart rate's like super low and they got a huge ST elevation. It's like, well, that's poor flow to the gut causes them to get GI symptoms, right? The thing we're missing there are lungs. What happens if you don't get blood flow to your lungs or your heart does not pump the blood forward, it just backs up. It's gonna get shorter breath as well, so shorter breath, okay? So there's all the symptoms of poor cardiac output to the brain, altered. Syncope is another word for, for poor flow to the brain. What is, you're not so much altered or stuporous. Syncope means what? They passed out, right? Because they had low blood flow to the brain. They syncopized. They fell over and uh, they passed out. All right. The heart. They got chest pain. They might say they feel lightheaded as well. All right. They have low low flow to the brain. They might say they feel fatigued. Uh, kidneys. We talk about decreased urine output. You got kin uh, nausea, vomiting for the GI. The baroreceptors will try to raise the SNS and try to raise the heart rate, but there might be something keeping it low, such as like an acidemia, a really really bad acidosis, or a really bad high potassium level or really bad high magnesium level, or they're taking digoxin or they're taking another medication that might suppress the AV node, such as what? 
Hmm? You already got a cookie. Who else? Adenosine. What's the, what's the neighbor to adenosine? What's that? Diltiazem is a. Here, you break off a leg and pass it along. <laughs> you said adenosine, but it will it will take a lower lower rate. But what's the other A in, in this group over here? Okay, you got to pass it that way. Did you take a bite or did you break it? Okay, good. All right. I, I select, has to select a group partner that maybe shares cookies with you. I don't know. Yeah, share the cookies. All right. So yeah. So that's the the symptom of poor cardiac output. Okay. Also to go back to the athlete thing, you want to make, wake up every patient that is sleeping, right? So it's like when you see them on the monitor, they're sleeping or their heart rate's low. You can't run in the room, and wake them up every single time. When's the time where you should wake them up? It's less than 42. When you sleep normally, your heart rate can go all the way down to 42. It's going to 41, 40, 39, 38. That is abnormal, right? That's, that's different than people that have one testy. People that have are normal, they are going to be, you know, they're going to have a heart rate will go all the way down to 42. But if it's less than that, that is a sign that they need to be woken up and there's somebody might be something wrong. Okay? You can't be like, oh, he's just sleeping. It's like, no, his heart rate's like 31. That's a problem. Okay? So that's the idea behind sinus bradycardia. And all the symptoms are due to poor cardiac output. Okay. So the treatment. So how do you know when someone needs treatment, right? So those are the treatment there, but what are these symptoms, right? So the symptoms of poor cardiac output uh, that they're gonna report like right away are things you gotta think of as, a, as in a jingle. So you're gonna say chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion. Any one of those means that they have poor cardiac output. Uh, it's all of nursing school. That means poor cardiac outputs, right? They have low blood flow to their brain, which is which one of those? Confusion. They got low blood pressure. They got low perfusion in general. That's hypotension, right? The blood pressure is low. And really the hypotension is really what's going to key us in to see that they really need some treatment. And we talked about some other, when we talk about other rhythms. All right, and the blood, the heart rate gets, that's right, that blood pressure gets less than 90 and they have an abnormal rhythm. That, that tells you that rhythm is causing problems. That's causing issues where we need to step up and intervene. And how do we intervene? This is what we do for every rhythm ever, right? So you I do ABCs. So you do uh, airway. So what's airway mean? It means they're not choking and coughing and causing bradycardia, right? So it's, make sure the airway is good. That uh, breathing means that are there, is there oxygen present, right? So is there oxygen present? And or do they need oxygen? Maybe their oxygen is low, right? When your oxygen is low, you could have tachycardias. When your oxygen is super low, you could have bradycardias, right? So either way, ABCs. And C is circulation. Assess the circulation. How do you assess circulation? Don't say cap refill. <laughs> that could, yes. I'm going to check the cap refill. Watch me. What else? <laughs> What's a better way to assess if someone has a low, um, what did I say? What is C? Low circulation, low, low effective circulation. Blood pressure. blood pressure, right? Check the blood pressure because the blood pressure is less than 90. That rhythm is not being tolerated, right? If they're AFib and their heart rate's 120, it's like, oh, they're fine. 120 is not that bad because you've seen 150, you've seen 180. But if their heart rate's 120 and they have chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, the hypotension is really what's going to gear us towards, well, maybe we need to shock them out of that, that, that rhythm, right? So. Uh, what else? So the next thing, ABCs and then a 12 lead because this monitor we have on them is usually just a, a, a surveillance and then we have to investigate further with a 12 lead. So that's usually the next step is, is going to be ordered as a 12 lead. So you can see what's going on with the bradycardia, what's going on with the tachycardia, right? Do they have some ST depression in another, another set that you might not see on those, on the, on the, uh, just the, the surveillance EKGs, right? And also notify the provider, notify them that something's wrong. You don't just have, oh, they went to sinus bradycardia for like four hours and, uh, and that's all that happened overnight. It's like, well, shoot, why don't you tell me they have, have sinus bradycardia? That's not, not, not okay. Okay. So yeah, so if they have chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, we have to fix the bradycardia. How do you fix bradycardia? You give atropine. What does atropine do? It blocks what? It blocks the... Not the SNS, it blocks the PNS. It blocks the acetylcholine that gets released from the vagus nerve. So we're shutting down the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve causes bradycardia, right? So we're shutting it down. And now if we shut down the, the brake, all we have is accelerator, right? So that means that's going to raise the heart rate. And just a note on dosages. You do not have to know any dosages in nursing school. That is 100% not required of you. 
right? If any teacher is requiring to do that, that is not okay. As the rank class does not test you on it. No one tests you on it. The only exception to that rule is with ACLS medications, like in message three, we teach you some ACLS medications. And the nice thing is that everything's like one, one of Epi, one of this, one of that, right? There are a few other differences, like Amio is like 300 and 600. But other than that, that's message three, doses. There's no other reason to know doses. Sometimes we'll tell you low dose or high dose, like in clinic, like we say, they're on low dose anoxaparin. That's for this reason. Or high dose anoxaparin, it's for this reason. But that's really the only kind of exception to that, where there's no reason to know doses, right? It's just extra memorization, extra material you should not have to know about. All right, so atropine, though. Dopamine. Dopamine is the precursor for norepi and epi, so it makes sense if I give the precursor, they're going to make more of the SNS tools, which is our catecholamines like norepi and epi. And we can give an epinephrine infusion. We can hook someone up with an IV and start epinephrine th via the IV. Okay. All right. So the, I mean, you could fix the bradycardia with those medications, but does that, does that fix the underlying cause? Does that reverse a beta blocker overdose? Does that reverse someone's hypoxia? Oh, they're super hypoxic. Look at they're turning blue. Give them epinephrine. That doesn't that doesn't fix the hypoxia, right? So you have to fix the underlying cause. You have to fix the dye. What's making them die? Is it drugs? There might be some rever reversals for the drugs. Those glucagon, again, we pointed out was for beta blockers and for calcium blockers, right? And really, you would not have bradycardia if you had if you overdosed on a DHP, right? If you overdosed on a DHP, you would have tachycardia. That's just how it how it works, right? If someone has ischemia, they have to go to the cath lab where they intervene and open up the coronary vessels. Right? And one of the treatments for uh, bradycardia after you give all the medications is a pacemaker. So a pacemaker is going to pace their heart at a certain rhythm. So if, they're only, if their underlying rhythm is like 30, you can pace them at 60 to achieve a good cardiac output, right? And then we have different kinds of flavors of pacers, and we'll talk more about pacers in MedSearch 2 where you learn about if they work or don't work and what, what kind of pacer is what kind of pacer. Right now, you just know that you slap some pads on the chest and it can pace them, right? It can fix bradycardias temporarily, right? And then what else? If that does not get fixed temporarily, it just have an old heart, their SA node has died due to old age, they may need a permanent pacemaker, right? So they get implanted with a pacemaker and they then have to live with all the pacemaker rules, which again, that's message two. We're talking about pacemakers, okay? So that's the treatment for sinus bradycardia. And the lucky thing is that the treatment is always given for every EKG when they have what symptoms? Chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion. Any one of those requires treatment. Someone has sinus bradycardia on the monitor and they say, I'm feeling some chest pain. Are you short of breath? Yeah. Are you confused? I don't know. No, no, no. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna ask them, you know, they have chest pain. You, you, then you, what do you do? A, B, C's, what's the C? You can check the blood pressure. And then you call the doctor, hey, they had chest pain and blood pressure is 85 or 42, right? That is a problem. That's, they say, okay, let's go ahead and start an epinephrine infusion or let's give them atropine and see if that fixes it. And then you can then give recommendations and say, hey, I noticed their, their potassium is 8.2. Well, that's a, that's a problem. So they can give you fixes for that. Or you can say they're like, their stats like 84% on the monitor, right? So that's, that's an, an issue. Or they can say they're having chest pain and they had this chest pain when they had a heart attack before. So, well, shoot, it could be ischemia. That could be the reason, right? And they go, so do a 12 lead and the 12 lead shows ischemia and the other leads, right? Because when you're monitoring on the, at the bedside monitor, the nurse's station or wherever, it's only monitoring like two leads at a time. And measures three, you talk about different leads that, that affect the heart. You have 12 leads in different areas look at different parts of the heart. It might be, you might not be able to see it. All right, so sinus tachycardia. So switching gears from slow rhythms to fast rhythms, right? So everything here is going to be, we're going to talk about fast stuff until we get back down to AV blocks. We'll end slow. Right? That'll be our, our mood and attention span also at the end of the, end of the day. All right, so yeah, so sinus tachycardias, so it's just sinus, but greater than what? Greater than 100 beats per minute, right? Greater than 150 equals PSVT, it's not always, that's just suggested, I should point out, All right? So let's put a question mark, question mark, could be PSVT, All right? Then we kind of investigate further and see if they, that might be the case. But uh, what's the cause of someone's heart rate to be fast? Well, it's everything we talked about before is what causes you to, your SNS to fire off, right? So you think of all the things that caused it was low blood sugar, low blood pressure, low pH, high CO2, low O2, right? It could just be movement. It could be anxiety, right? 
It could be agitation, it could be pain. All those things cause the SNS to fire off, right? So all those are SNS activity. Those are natural things you can look for to see if they are okay, right? If blood pressure is low, how do you assess if someone's blood pressure is low? Capri feels great in three seconds, no. What, how do you assess if someone's BP is low? You assess the BP, right? BP is less than what is concerning? Less than 90 really usually requires treatment. The thing with sinus tachycardia is it's sinus, and usually it doesn't require treatment because you, you have to fix the underlying cause. That's usually the right answer for every disease process. Like, how do I fix diabetes? Oh, fix the underlying cause. Oh, you mean diet and exercise? Oh, but anyways, it's, it's usually always the right answer. But here, really, for sinus tachycardia, truly does not get treated unless the blood pressure is low. You usually try to fix the underlying cause. Are they hypoxic? Are they, do they have a high CO2 level? And we'll talk about O2, CO2, and pH uh, in our next lecture with diabetes. Right? So we're going to talk about, oh, shoot, they have metabolic acidosis. That means their pH is low. They're going to present with tachycardia. Right? So fever can do it, infection, uh, SNS stimulation, they're dehydrated. That means you have a low blood pressure, right? And that's going to trigger the um, SNS to fire off and you get a tachycardia, okay? We talk about hypoxia, pain, anxiety, agitation. There could be stimulants. They could take a bump of Coke, right? That, that's a stimulant, that's an SNS stimulant. Methamphetamines are also SNS in a bottle or in a bag or in a rock, right? Those are also, uh, those are also SNS stimulants directly on the heart, and that will cause a tachycardia. It's like, why is your heart rate fast? Oh, it's like, oh, it's like, it's like I thought though. That's well. Let me see your, let me see your smile. Oh, you're missing teeth. Okay, so it might be meth. It might be meth in teeth. All right. So yeah. So there could be drugs, meth, coke. Uh, it could be Coca-Cola, caffeine. All right. So caffeine can do it. All right. Okay, so yeah, so you have, uh, there could be caffeinated things, it could be cocaine, it could be coke. These are stimulants that will trigger the SNS to fire off and raise the heart rate, okay? And then exercise, just moving around, moving your, your mechanoreceptors in your legs and arms and, and doing squats, that will raise your heart rate uh, in of itself, right? So how do you know someone's symptomatic when they have a tachycardia or sinus tachycardia? They got chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, and you have to fix the underlying problem. If the blood pressure is low, we might fix it with some vasopressors, right? And vasopressors, we'll talk about more. Uh, really, we'll touch on it and for next exam, but message three is really we talk about vasopressors, okay? And again, every tachyarrhythmia ever, every time someone's heart rates fast, they're going to complain of tachy, uh, sorry, of palpitations. Right? They say, my, I'm feeling my heart's racing, or I got palpitations. Right? They might show you their Apple Watch, and look, I got tachycardia. Right? That, but they're not, they're not going to you know, hit the call bell and say, I'm feeling sinus tachy right now. Right? But so their symptoms for every tachycardia ever is going to be palpitations. And then, of course, you have to throw them on, do the ABCs. Right? What are the ABCs? Airway, breathing, circulation, and then you're going hit to hit them up with the 12 lead to figure out, well, is it sinus tachycardia or is it atrial, like an atrial rhythm or even a ventricular rhythm, okay? So if they do have really fast heart rate and you can't fix the underlying cause, we might hit them with a little beta blocker, a beta one specific one. But remember all of our beta blockers, oh, sorry, all of our AV node suppression agents, which are ABCDs, all of them will lower the blood pressure. So if the blood pressure is low and the heart rate's fast, you can't give those medications. Yes, they will fix the problem, but one of them you can give if the blood pressure is low. Which one's that? Who said it? All right, to Jackson Cookie. All right. So yeah, so that's the idea behind um, the treatment. When the heart rate is really, really fast, it can cause a low blood pressure. And why does it cause low blood pressure when your heart rate's fast? So I don't have time to fill, right? So you only have X amount of time to fill the, the chambers with blood. And if the heart rate's like 150, 170, 220, there's not enough time to fill the chamber with blood effectively to perfuse the body, okay? Again, if it's symptomatic tachycardia, we always treat the underlying cause with sinus tachycardia specifically. All right, so now we're gonna divide into our groups and then check our work afterwards. All right. All right, so number one, who's our first group? All right, so what is number one? 
sinus rhythm. How do you know it's sinus rhythm? You find if it lines up on a line right here. So again, you just find a complex that lines up. And then what's the rhythm? Or what's the rate, sorry? You got 300. What's next? 150, 100, and just above 75. So it's between 1600 and for it to be sinus rhythm, we have a P followed by a QRS. Is there anything else fancy going on there? Is it sinus rhythm or normal sinus rhythm? It's sinus rhythm because a normal sinus rhythm in lead two, technically the QRS is upright. All right, so this is just sinus rhythm. Okay. Also, that P wave looks a little bit sus. It looks like there's two humps on it almost on some of those, right? So that could be an also another reason why that's not just normal sinus rhythm, okay? So but that QT looks a little bit long too, I don't know. All right, number two, what do you got for number two? Uh, sinus bradycardia. Sinus bradycardia, all right? So this guy kind of lines up. Is there another one that lines up? All right, so you got 300, what's next? 150, 175. 60, it's less than 60, right? It's about a point less, right? So it's definitely less than 60. So is it sinus bradycardia? Yeah, there's P wave followed by a QRS. There's no like AFib or VTAC or anything else fancy. But it is, it, sinus bradycardia can have extra flavor just like sinus rhythm can. So anything else going on there? Like QRS looks a little bit wide, right? What is a wide QRS greater than what? 0 0.12. 0 0.12 is how many boxes? How many small boxes is 0.12? We're in three small boxes. Look at this just there, right? So it looks like one, two box, maybe two and a half, three boxes. So it's getting there. It's concerning. All right, so that'd be like sinus brady with a, you could say prolonged QRS, but it's probably bundle branch block. All right, so what's a cause of, it has a first gravy block too. Yeah, it does. So you see how the, the PR, how do you know it has a first gravy block? The PR interval is prolonged. So when you come, once we learn AV blocks, you can come back to this and that should make sense, right? So you see the PR interval is greater than, what's a long PR interval? <laughs> greater than 0 0.20. So is that PR interval greater than 0 0.20? Well, this guy right here, I'm just line this one up. See, look, look at that guy. It's just right there. It's just, it's just, just after it. So it's like, it might even be 0.20, it might be 0.205. I don't know, but it, it looks, looks prolonged, right? So that's a definition of a first degree AV block. And we'll talk more about AV blocks and how you know it's first degree, not second degree. All right, so we got sinus rate, the first degree AV block and a bundle branch block as well. And how do you know this patient, had, what, what, is some, what would cause this? What's an example cause of sinus bradycardia? They're on a beta blocker, good. And even with the first gravy block, it's really gonna really spice that up. And then what's a treatment for it? Not beta blockers. How would you fix this if they were symptomatic? And how would you know they're symptomatic? Chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension or confusion, right? So atropine I heard, right? So atropine would be the, you guys got saved, look at that. The atropine would be a, um, a treatment for bradycardia. All right, number three, what do you got there? So this guy lines up perfectly. So we got 300, what's next? 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. So it's between 50 and 60, like 57, I don't know. All right, but it's definitely sinus brady. Anything else different there? The QRS looks good. PR interval is less than 0.20. All right, so it looks, looks pretty, pretty decent. All right, so then you got sinus brady. All right, who has number four? All right, what is number four? It looks slow, so it's line one up. That guy lines up, and guess what? You can go backwards. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. It's between 50 and 60, all right? Boxes are boxes. You can go forward or backward, all right? But if you use a different complex, as long as it lines up and you can space it out five small boxes at a time, you're gonna get there. So yes, it's between 50 and 60, you decided, right? Anything else going on with that? That QRS looks different, it looks like low amplitude, but also looks bigger than how many boxes is big? And again, you measure it isoelectric to isoelectric, all right? So it looks definitely encroaching more than three small boxes, right? Greater than how much is three small boxes? Greater than 0.12, right? So we got sinus brady with a bundle branch block. I don't think there's anything else going on. ST segments look good, P waves look good. 
QT looks a little bit prolonged, I would, I'd have to file that through my QTC calculator, right? Or if you find a calculator that can do square root reliably, you can do QT divided by the square root of the R to R. That will, that'll get you there also. All right, sign for the bundle branch block. All right, number five, what is this? Looks fast, but how do I know it's fast? Because fast means greater than what? Greater than 100, right? And then so I got 300, 150, definitely close to 150, right? So it's like 142, right? So heart rate is fast. So is it a sinus tachycardia or an AFib or an A flutter or a VTAC? How do I know? How do I know it's not VTAC? How do I know it's not coming from the ventricles? It's not wide. If it's if it's wide, and if, if VTAC is always wide. I mean, if it's wide, it could be atrial, but uh, I know this came from the atria because it's narrow, 100%, all right? But is it atrial fib, atrial flutter, multifocal atrial tachycardia, something weird like that? Or is it sinus? How do I know it's sinus? I have a P wave followed by a QRS, right? That's how I know it's sinus, right? And sinus rhythm can have extra flavor. It can have bundle branch blocks. It can have AV blocks. It can have prolonged things. Is there anything upsetting with this? Not really. It looks like there's no other deviations. What did I write? Sinus tac. All right, number six. What do we have to number six? Yep, that guy lines up there. 300, 150, 100, 75, 50, 35. So we got, we're all the way down in the 30s. Okay, so that's definitely is it sinus Brady, or what is it? Anything else spicy on it? The PR interval looks decent. So it's not, we're not getting to AV block territory. We got a P wave followed by a QRS. So that's sinus rhythm, right? Doesn't look like a bundle branch block. Looks pretty narrow QRS. T wave looks a little bit elevated. Oh. Sinus Brady. All right, what about number seven? That looks like there's something wrong with it. Who has number seven? Yeah, so we got a, this lines up right there, right? So we got 300, 150, just under 100, right? So we got sinus rhythm with what? We got a prolonged QRS, that guy looks fatty, right? And then also there's something else going on. This guy has an ST depression, right? He has an STD, okay? So we got sinus rhythm with a Bundle branch block with an STD, and he has some T wave inversion too. My T wave is not upright. It's, a little, it's actually a biphasic. I'd say biphasic T wave inversion. Right? It's just not normal sinus rhythm. So when you interpret this, you would not say normal sinus rhythm. That's the key. And when you turn in your EKGs for your mini care plans and clinical worksheets, you're not going to get points taken away if you did not recognize there was a T wave inversion, for instance, or an STD. Well, all we want to make sure is that you recognize something's wrong, right? I mean, if you write a PR interval of 0.24 and, you, and then the interpretation you don't write, there's a first degree AV block, that's a problem. If you write a QRS that is 0.16 and then in your interpretation you don't write, they have a bundle branch block, that's a problem, right? But T waves and STDs, that's going to be more uh, Med Search 3, where we talk about what that means. All right, last one, number eight, or almost last. What do I have for, what do I have for number eight? ST I would not I would argue is not elevated. When we, ST segments again that's going to measure three. There's a certain spot you measure ST segments from that's called a J point, and that looks pretty even. J points right here, so that looks pretty isoelectric. But yeah, that 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 end of the QRS segment is very uh, is under the baseline, so it's not normal sinus rhythm. Do we say it's sinus rhythm or sinus Brady? This lines up 300, 150, 175. It's between 60 and 75, right? So that is not normal. That is sinus rhythm, right? Is it normal sinus rhythm? You got P wave followed by QRS, but that S is very, very deep, deep S wave. All right, so just sinus rhythm. All right, number nine. Is that right? Number nine? All right, what do you got for number nine? Who's number nine? Do we forget number nine? Do we need to do it as a class? So number nine, what is that? Sinus rhythm, sinus brady, sinus tack. 
So it's regular rhythm, so we're kind of heading towards sinus something. And then we got, look at our, this guy lines up perfectly, 300, 150, 100, so between 100 and 75. So that means it's a what? Sinus rhythm. Is that normal sinus rhythm? No, that T wave looks janky. So what is wrong? That T wave is inverted, it is upside down. Okay, it should be upright and asymmetrical. All right, so we got sinus rhythm with T wave inversion. QRS is getting there, but it's not greater than three boxes, three small boxes, right? So sinus rhythm with twee. All right, number 10, what's number 10? Uh, can we uh, sinus rhythm with ST depression? Yeah, the ST is very depressed, right? You can see how that isoelectric line has dipped, right? And it's sinus rhythm because the heart rate is, is between what? Between 60 and 100, right? So yeah, so that is sinus rhythm with an STD. Okay, next one. Uh, sinus tack. Um, Luke said borderline SBT. I didn't. I don't know. Uh, so P wave followed by QRS is really leaning towards sinus tack. I don't know. When we yeah, talk about SVTs, usually SVTs, the P waves are hidden or they're like going up onto the T wave. So this is P QRS, P QRS, P QRS, but we had definitely have something going on here, and that's an ST okay. elevation. Yeah, we said maybe J point because we didn't know if it was STE or. It's STE, it's ST elevation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also you have some PR depression as well. as patient probably has pericarditis. All right, so sinus tack with STE. And you can even argue they also have a PR depression, but we're not going to get into that. That's more per that's later. Okay. All right, next one, number 12. Well, uh, sinus rhythm, is it rhythm? Sinus tack with an R. So how do you know the difference between sinus rhythm and sinus tack? Uh, I didn't have that number in front of me. It, it was, was about 140. So the heart rate is fast. How do you know it's fast? Right, line it up. You got 300, 150. It's definitely it's right up next to 150, right? So we got sinus tack with what? Well, it even says patient moves. All right. So yeah. So that's artifact. Okay. All right. Top right, number 13. Yeah, the QRS looks a little bit long. It's getting the long side, right? Three small boxes. If you look at the first complex there, you got one, two, it's almost hitting three boxes already. So we're getting there to a bundle branch block. So the sinus Brady or sinus rhythm? Uh, sinus Brady, where the bundle branch block ish, maybe. All right? So yeah. So then we weren't asking, like, what's, again, what's a, a cause of sinus Brady? How would you fix it? Infection? No. Infection would cause a tachycardia. If that infection got to the point of severe acidosis and severe hypoxia, you could argue that it caused that, but the first step would be tachycardia. But these are things that cause you to die, right? So drugs might do it. So what's an example drug that might do it? What is it? Calcium blocker. All right, so you already got a cookie, so you can get a, a gummy. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. All right. So, calcium blocker. What kind of calcium blocker? Um, nope. DHB causes reflexive tachycardia. Non-DHB non causes bradycardia. And there's two non-DHPs. What are the two non-DHPs? Just one person, please, so they can get a gummy. <laughs> there, you haven't got gummies yet. Okay, you can pass along. You don't want a gummy. Okay. You already got a cookie, though. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So what? Um, so treatment. How do we fix this? Ideally, if you ask, answer questions, but you can still get your gummies. <laughs> dopamine you can give. Yeah, dopamine is a, a treatment for sinus bradycardia. It's usually a dopamine infusion, like an IV form. All right. Next one, number 14. It looks, it looks pretty fast, yeah. So sinus tax, this guy lines up right there, right? So 300, 150, it's greater than 100, right? So that is sinus tack. So you know, why is it sinus? Because we have a P wave followed by a QRS. 
if we didn't have a P wave or the P wave looked funky, it might not be sinus, right? So what else is going on with that? We got some, whoa, what was that? It's some artifact, some movement, right? Or respiratory variation. Okay, and then next one, what's this one, number 15? Sinus tac, how do you know sinus tac is greater than what? This guy lines up, 300, 150, between 100 and 150. So it's sinus tac because we have a P wave followed by a QRS. There's not much else going on with that, right? So QRS is narrow, P wave is okay, ST is okay, T wave is okay. So sinus tac, what's the cause of sinus tac? Stress, nursing 103. Monday, January 8th, 2024, right? Yeah, drugs can do it. What kind of drugs? Meth, Coke, okay. All right, number 16, what's that? Who has number 16? Anybody? All right, I'm gonna take, my gummy, I'm gonna take the gummies away. All right, what's number 16? So what's the rate first, right? So the rate is what? This kind of lines up perfectly, 300, 150, 100, between 75 and 100. So it's a sinus rhythm of some sort. So anything else going on with it? Hmm? Not really. Really, you have to be technically more than one millivolt or one small box. Looks pretty decent. T wave looks fine. It should be asymmetric. Looks like you could argue it might be symmetrical. This is just normal sinus rhythm. Perfect. Okay. All right. Last page, I think, right? Number 17. Who has 17? Who has 17? You've had an extra 15 minutes to interpret. What is what is 17? So what's the rate first, right? So what's the rate? So it's between 16 and 100. So that means it's sinus rhythm of some sort, right? If you don't have this third page of exercises, you probably have the old PowerPoint. It looks just like sinus rhythm. There's not, not much else going on, right? There you go, sinus rhythm. I'd argue it's normal sinus rhythm. I can't identify what else is going on. So normal sinus rhythm. All right, so then number 18, what's that? It is funky, but what is, what is the official interpretation? Yes. So is there like a certain metric for ST elevation or does it just like... Is there it is, and you'll learn that, yeah, you'll learn ST elevation, ST depression in message three, because okay. that indicates ischemia or infarction, okay. and it's usually greater than one millivolt, and it also depends whether you're male or greater than 45 years of age or not. No, no. Okay. So ST depression, not really, because the ST segment is nice and even, right? But that T wave is biphasic. It is up and down, right? So that T wave is not okay. Is, so they got sinus rhythm or sinus tac? Is it sinus tac? What is it? So this is 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, right? It's between 60 and 75, so it's sinus rhythm. So it's sinus rhythm with a biphasic T wave. And also that QRS looks more than three boxes, right? Does it look longer? Mm -hmm. Right, so you got one, two, barely. So it's borderline bundle branch block. What do we, yep, sinus with a bundle branch block and biphasic T wave. All right, next one, that is ST depression. Look at the, our baseline here and look at the ST depression. So is that sinus tax or sinus rhythm? It looks too fast for sinus Brady, right? So that's sinus tack with ST depression, right? 
All right, and number whatever that is, 20. What is that? That is artifact, right? It's like 60 second interfer interference. It's a someone having a LAN party in your patient's room. It is not a, uh, it's really, I mean, you could interpret it, but you can't really see if there's P waves or not. All right, who's playing Fortnite? All right, 21. Looks like sinus rhythm or is it sinus tech? Is it too fast? Or is it below 100 or above 100? Below 100, so it's not sinus Brady, it's not that slow. So it's sinus rhythm with what? Is it normal sinus rhythm or sinus rhythm with something? I'd say that's peak T waves, right? Those T waves are nice and peaked. Look at normal T waves, look at peaked T waves, right? And peak T waves are a sign of hyper what? Hyperkalemia. All right, what's the next one? That one looks pretty slow. Is it slow? Yeah, that one lines up and it's definitely slow, right? So that's sinus what? Bradycardia. What's the cause of sinus bradycardia? It's like one testy. All right, so it could be an a athlete. All right, or they could be sleeping, but really that might be less than 42. So that might be something else going on. They could be hyperkalemic also, right? All right, next one. We got some, you can't really assess that greatly, right? So you could say some restaurant artifact or artifact in general. All right, and then last one, number 24. So that is pretty fast, right? That is, let's line this guy up right here, lines up 300, it's almost 150, right? So that's a sinus tack. All right, so we'll do the next section and then we'll take a quick break. So we're moving on to atrial rhythms. So atrial rhythms are fast, or sorry, the atrial rhythms are something wrong in the atria, okay? We'll talk about fast atrial rhythms and those are supraventricular or atrial which is another word for atrial, atrial tachycardias, supraventricular tachycardias. That's coming next, right? We'll talk about SVTs at the end of this section, all right? First, we have AFib and a flutter. All right, remember your groups because we'll come back for the next after atrial rhythms. There's another little session, okay? So anyways, we've got atrial rhythms, all right? So AFib or a flutter, they're very, very similar. All right, we'll show you the differences, but uh, there's controlled rate, which is 60 to 100. So that makes sense, 60 to 100. And we have slow rates or slow ventricular response, right? That's SVR. And then we have rapid ventricular response, which is a fast heart rate greater than 100, okay? And if we're greater than 100, rapid ventricular response, you're pretty much now in SVT territory, right? SVT is like an umbrella term that we'll talk about more. It's a, any rhythm that's fast that comes from the atria is supra ventricular, supra meaning on top of, right? So you could have AFib, a flutter that has rapid ventricular response, or you could have PSVT, okay? There are other ones out there and you're not being tested on those. So don't, please don't learn AV nodal reentrant tachycardias or Wolf Parkinson whites or multifocal atrial tachycardias. Those are not ones we're gonna be learning, okay? We're just gonna, there's enough rhythms for you to understand, right? So the rhythm you have to know, sinus rhythm, sinus bradyl, sinus tach, AFib, a flutter, whether they be slow or fast, and then paroxysmal SVT. And the last rhythms we want to know before the, before the AV blocks are your, um, your ventricular rhythms, which are lethal. So it's important you know your lethal rhythms. Okay, so AFib. So AFib, again, can be controlled. The rate is 60 to 100. How do I know that's 60 to 100? Do I line it up? Do I go, okay, that lines up. I'm at 300, 150. No, that doesn't work. So it's irregular, right? That's a clue that you have AFib. If someone says they have an irregular heart rate, Eight times, 8.5 times out of 10, it's probably AFib. That's very, very common, okay? Most common arrhythmia, three million in the United States. So how do you know they have rate controlled, 60 to 100 beats per minute? Count the R waves, not the P waves, because there's no P waves in AFib, all right? So you count the R waves, which are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all right? Nine times what? 30, 300, 75, what is it, nine times? 10, so the heart rate is 90. So 60 to 100 is AFib that is controlled. And that's your whole point with AFib. We used to try for like the last 50 years, try to knock them out of AFib. It's like, we're gonna shock you out of it. We're gonna give you medications to change it. 
but that's like 70% of the time you just go right back into AFib. It's not worth it. It's not not fun for the patient to get shocked either. Okay, so as, all we do is give the medications to lower their heart rate, right? And why was their heart rate high in the first place? It was because every single one of these different atrial activities, these ectopic sites, were getting conducted down the AV node. So if we give them an AV node suppression agent, right, that's going to suppress the amount of impulses they get through and control the rate. If the rate's not controlled, that means every little impulse is getting through, and every little QRS is the ventricle impulse getting through, and then we're going to have a fast heart rate, right? And if their heart rate's greater than 100 and they have AFib, it's called AFib RVR, all right? AFib RVR is just a AFib that is rapid, that is greater than 100, just like sinus tachycardia is kind of the equivalent to that, right? But how you know if it's sinus or AFib, one has fib waves and one has P waves. And what the heck's a fib wave? It's just what, something you can't really discern is a P wave, right? It's just fibrillatory activity. It's shaking. Fibrillation just means uh, shaking, right? So we've lost the atrial kick. So your atria, 20% of your cardiac output is just your atria doing that last little kick right before the, the valves close and it's time for systole, right? So the atria kick and push all the blood it has down into the ventricles. So for atria fibrillating, there's no kick. So we all of a sudden, all of a sudden lose 20% of our cardiac output. We lose 20% of our BP, right? And if someone has is really reliant on that BP and the BP is like 95 and they have CHF, that atrial kick can be the, the difference between someone that's symptomatic and not symptomatic, right? So that little atrial kick is especially important to a CHF patient, right? So what are some characteristics of how do you know someone has a AFib? Again, they have quivering, shaking uh, atria, not ventricles, that's ventricular fibrillation. We're talking about atrial fibrillation, right? The atria are fibrillating and therefore we don't get a nice P wave, right? We get a P wave from many, many different areas, and that's going to be, and they're not organized in any kind of fashion. It's like how we decided on groups earlier, right? That is a fibrillation event, right? So our atria are fibrillating, and therefore you're going to see little kind of little, little activity, but it's not organized. So unorganized fibrillatory waves are a characteristic of AFib. There's that plus the irregularity. So those two things together tell you you have AFib, and of course you have some QRS complexes as well. Okay, so no PR interval. You can't measure a PR interval because there's no P wave to measure from, right? Like which one of those fibrillatory waves do you start from? Do I start from this one or this one or this one or that one? You can't, right? You can't measure PR intervals in these ones. Okay, so there's different types of AFib. There's proxismal, which means it just comes and goes. All of a sudden they go into AFib and they come out of it, right? 50% of the time just it resolves on its own. The other 50% of the time they are stuck with AFib until the underlying cause is fixed. And what causes AFib? is someone's uh, atria that are messed up. They have scar tissue, they have a big atria. So this patient has left atria enlargement, right? So this guy is trying to depolarize the AV node, but then this guy's away from me, and away from me, away from me, away from me. And now you have five different ectopic sites, and now you have AFib on your hands, right? This person is not gonna be proxismal. That's gonna be, that's not something you can fix right away, right? But uh, there can be chronic AFib. When you talk about someone has chronic pain, it's usually like three months, six months of pain. Someone has chronic, uh, sorry, they have a different chronic disorder. It's usually after a long period of time. Before AFib, two days. You got two days AFib, you have chronic AFib, right? And that's key because you have to get treatment for chronic AFib, okay? You can't just live your life with AFib, otherwise you're gonna live your life with a stroke, bed bound, right? So you have to get your, the AFib fixed, right? And how do you fix it? Well, we don't want the heart rate to get too fast because if the heart rate's too fast, your heart, your heart chambers can't fill up. And now you've got chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, right, as a symptom. But the other complication of chronic AFib, of AFib that lasts more than two days, is what? A blood clot that develops. So why do you get a blood clot? Well, this chamber is not able to pump the blood forward. It's just blood that is stagnant, and blood that's stagnant has nothing better to do than to hook up with its mates. So it just hooks up with its mates, says, what are you doing? Nothing, let's coagulate. Okay, cool. And they coagulate, right? And they form a huge clot. And now that clot might make its way down and get pumped out to the brain, or make its way down and pumped out to the lungs, right? Causing an embolism, right? A clot that get, gets made is called a thrombus, and a clot that's traveling is called a what? an embolus, right? So you get a pulmonary embolus. You get a uh, mesenteric embolus. So where's that going? 
going to the gut, causing abdominal pain and bowel death. It could go to the arm, it could go to the leg, it could go to the brain, right? When you have AFib, you have 17 times more likely to get a stroke than someone who does not have AFib, okay? So if someone has AFib that's more than two days, do they have to get what medication? They have to get an anticoagulant to stop the atria, or sorry, stop, stop the blood from coagulating, okay? All right, and then sometimes they can come out of it, but if they don't come out of it, it's called permanent AFib. All right, so the causes of AFib is abnormal atria, physically. The physically, the atria are big. There's a structural change of some sort. There is an MI, or there's hypertrophy, hypertension. If, I have this, if this ventricle is working super hard down here, all right, there we go. All right, this ventricle, sort of. I guess I can't draw anymore. Oh, that's, that's sad. All right, so if that ventricle down there is working super hard, it's gonna, that left atrium is also going to work super hard. All right, this guy's with hypertension is working hard for 70 years, 50 years. Now it's going to start getting hypertrophied, and now this atrium is going to have to work extra hard, and it might get dilated. And now you have AFib on your hands, right? So that's the idea behind AFib. There's a structural irregularity. There can be scar tissue. There can be something, a valve disease. There can be a valve that's stenosed, it's really tight, and now that left atrium is going to balloon out. Or the right atrium might balloon out. Yes? If you have ventricular hypertrophy, do you always have atrial enlargement? Not always. It's, it, can, it can be a, a complication of it. Yeah. All right, so uh, dilation, again, MI, CHF, valve disease, all these things are interrelated. When we talk about cardiac, it's going to sound like I'm repeating myself so many times because it's all interrelated. One thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and it's all going to end up causing complications, right? One of the complications is AFib, okay? So what else? So irritants, what causes AFib, have someone to go into AFib or go into AFib RVR? Well, A, they have to have a structural irregularity, and B, they have to have you know, some, some of these factors that the SNS got stimulated by, right? So they have low O2, they have low, uh, low pH, high CO2, low blood sugar, they have fever, infection, stress, nursing school, all these things are gonna throw you into AFib, right? And hypoglycemia I mentioned as well, all right? And sometimes it's just unknown. We don't know exactly what it is. They could have an abnormal conduction system. It could be genetic, it could be something going on, and they have to go to a special doctor that looks at just the EKG system of the heart. Not a cardiologist, but electrophysiologist, okay? So what's the treatment for AFib? Well, this is also kind of the ABCs, so don't get confused in the ABCs. Part of the ABCs here is the ABCs that we talked about before. Someone has um, too fast of a heart rate, we got to B, bring it down. And that's our ABCs we're used to, right? A, B, C, D, all those medications are AV node suppression agents. All those agents are going to bring the heart rate down to 60 to 100, right? Like we've talked about. But the other thing we do for AFib is we're going to expand our ABCs and we are going to do A for anticoagulation. We have to anticoagulate them if they have AFib for greater than how many days? Greater than two days, right? If they have a history of AFib and they come to the hospital and they didn't take their meds because they're sick and they're older and now they're in, they're in your care, it's like, oh, what, what kind of history do you have? AFib? Well, shoot, we got to start you on your medication for AFib, right? Medication being rate control, right? And also anticoagulation. Right? The patients get sent home on this medication if their AFib is not fixed, right? And they have to continue that medication until their AFib is cleared up, okay? Sometimes the doctors have crazy ideas and they'll try to shock them out of the AFib, but the AFib will just return like seven times out of 10, okay? So that's not really the, the fix for it, all right? But you'll notice that we do have D for direct cardioversion or synchronized cardioversion. And that's usually when they are symptomatic, when their AFib is way too fast. And it's causing problems, it's causing what kind of, how do you know that it's too fast? How do you know the patient's symptomatic? They have chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension is the key, right? They can have chest pain, shortness of breath, confusion. You might just try to give them some medications. Give them metoprolol, right? Give them diltiazem, give them digoxin to lower the heart rate. And that might just be just enough to allow their chambers to fill and allow them to perfuse their, their body, right? But as soon as they get hypotensive, all those drugs are off the table. Oh, but I can give the joxin. Well, no, really, that's, it's, it's, really at that point, it's time to shock them out of the rhythm, right? It's really a aggressive way to, to restart the heart, right? Adenosine will just uh, you know, shut the heart down and, and restart it, but that's only given for PSVT, not for AFib, okay? So 
anticoagulation, what kind of anticoag meds? Again, we'll study more anticoagulation meds in, for exam two with cardiac, but these guys will you know, come back at that point. Usually they start 10A inhibitors. So a Pixaban, they all have 10A in the name, which is nice, all right? So it used to be warfarin, but warfarin was developed in the 40s as a rat poison, and we decided to give it to humans for 40 years or 60 years, and now we're now more cultured, and now we have 10A inhibitors, okay? The complication rate of, because it killed rats by causing them to bleed in their brains, but also humans bled in their brains too, and that was one of the uh, risk versus benefits we had because we had nothing else. But now we have 10A inhibitors, and those are the medications that should be there because we want to stop the risk of forming clots, which is a thrombus, from traveling. So it can be formed in the heart here, and it can make its way to the brain, causing a stroke. For exam three, we'll go over BFAS and, the, and all the symptoms of stroke. Okay, So our goal with the AFib is to make sure they're anticoagulated if it's persistent, bring down the heart rate, and all these ABCD drugs are making sure you hold the door, right? Making sure you are stopping the, the impulses from getting through. All these impulses want to come through the AV node, but now we got to help a, a brother out, and we got to give him some uh, support, right? Give him the Joxin, give him a beta blocker, give him something, okay? And then uh, we could do, we can go to a electrophysiologist and we can do C, which is catheter ablation. They can find the spot that is causing the AFib and they go in there with a little little probe and they cook it out. They cook it at 95 degrees and they, st they scar it up and they stop that ectopic site from going off, right? Usually it's around the valves. That's usually the most common part, common site where they can ablate the, uh, the ectopic site. Okay, and then we have direct current electrical cardioversion, that's DCCV or synchronized cardioversion. Synchronized means that we want to make sure we look at the R waves and we don't shock them in the T wave. Do people with AFib have T waves? Yes, they do. There's always a QRS and a T wave of the, of the ventricles repolarizing, right? But there is no P wave activity, right? Or there is, it's just fibrillatory. Okay, sometimes it's so fine that you can't even see it. It just looks like a solid line, all right? But you know that's irregular and there's no P wave, it's probably AFib. All right, so if they have no symptoms, right? They're not, they don't have chest pain, they don't have shortness of breath. There's really no purpose of doing this anymore, okay? All right, so that's the idea behind AFib. So cardioversion. So this kind of requires a table in itself so you don't get confused, so you know exactly which one is which which patient gets shocked, which patient doesn't get shocked. But when we talk about cardioversion for fast rhythms that have a pulse, it's always synchronized. If they don't have a pulse, we don't care. They're already dead. And it doesn't care if they, it matter if they go into lethal rhythm like torsades. We're just shocking them out of this fast, we're just shocking them out of this rhythm that's causing them to be dead and we don't care, right? But if someone has a pulse, they're talking to you, it's like, okay, I'm gonna give you some sedation because this is gonna hurt, right? So I'm gonna give you some sedation. You have to sign consent because this is gonna hurt, right? And the risk is that we might shock you on the wrong thing because the nurse might not have hit the sync button, right? So, because if they hit the sync button right here, right here this, on this machine, the sync button is right there. This is called a Zoll, by the way, and it's a very popular device. There are other brands of defibrillators, but the Zoll defibrillator or the defibrillator is going to shock them out of that rhythm. How does it shock them out of that rhythm? First, the nurse hits the sync button so that you can see it's detecting the R waves. And why do you want to detect the R waves? So you don't shock them on the what? On the T wave. If you shock them on the T wave, they're going to go into what lethal rhythm? Torsades. So if someone has a pulse, it's always synchronized, right? If there's no pulse, you can do, you can shock them whenever. It doesn't matter. They're already dead, right? So what else? So they need consent for this. They need to also be sedated for this because it hurts and you can you can die from it, right? So it's important they know their risk versus benefits and they know what's what's there and what the uh, you know what the alternative is. And really, the alternative is if you're not symptomatic, you really don't need this. Okay, you should go for a catheter ablation instead. That works. Okay. So indications for synchronized cardioversion in general is yes, fast AFib, fast A flutter, but also a really fast tachyrrhythmia. So a rhythm that's super fast, that's not letting the chambers fill up with blood, and therefore they're getting chest pain, shortness of breath. The key one is hypotension. If the blood pressure is less than 90, we can't give rate control medications anymore. All those medications have what side effect? Low heart rate, right? Sorry, sorry low, low, yes, low heart, that's what you give for, low blood pressure, okay? And then, uh, yeah, so AFib, A flutter is fast. We got SVT, VTAC with a pulse. Can, can be shocked if they have a pulse. 
and then uh, SVT as well. Okay. Sometimes sinusoidal cardia is if you've tried everything else, you've fixed it, you tried to fix underlying cause. Sometimes. Okay. So again, meds cannot be given that we would normally give because all of them lower the blood pressure less than 90. Yes, digoxin you can try it, and if the blood pressure is borderline. But uh, again, if the blood pressure is like super low, like 60 over 20 blood pressure, you're not going to have to digoxin. Okay. All right, this is different from defibrillation, which is just a word people throw around to say that that means unsynchronized cardioversion. That's what you do for lethal rhythms. If someone has a rhythm that's perfusing their brain and perfusing and causing and allowing them to be awake with a pulse, we do synchronized cardioversion. Okay, so there's synchronized cardioversion and unsynchronized cardioversion. When we talk about ventricular rhythms in a little bit, that's we're also going to show you a difference between the two. So you can, because it's it's, it can be confusing. How are you doing, Bill? All right, I think Bill's asleep. Example of cardio version. Okay, here. let's go ahead and get going. Okay, we're about to start here. I wouldn't touch him, actually. So Everyone clear? Presented. All right. Go ahead. He's confused. Okay, hold it down. All right, so he might need another shock, but um, he's not going to remember this because usually sedation will, has amnesia effects, so they're not going to remember that, which is nice. Sometimes you don't have the opportunity to give those medications because they are the blood pressure is too low. Every sedation medication ever lowers your blood pressure. There's not one that raises it. All right, so a flutter, and then we'll take a break. So a flutter is just like AFib, same treatment, same things, same ABCD, same rate controlling medications, same risk for clots, all the same things, except sometimes it is, or sorry, some, it has a feature that you can see those ectopic sites. Before we had fibrillatory waves, you really couldn't tell what was going on. You just knew there's a lot of ectopy throughout all the atria, a lot of extra sites that were causing problems, right? But with a flutter, it has an organized capacity. I would like to see when we say that when we just define groups, we had a flutter. There was some kind of organization to that to figure out what who would be in what group, right? Before you gave the answer for the EKG, which was the QRS complex, right? So sometimes it is organized, meaning that there it's like an organized rhythm, or sorry, I should say a regular rhythm, where it has a pattern to it. It has three uh, F waves, which are flutter waves. Atrial flutter is the only a rhythm that has, has F waves. So you have flutter waves here. You see you have three, three there, three there, three there. Sometimes like that for a long time, three, 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 all the way through. Sometimes it goes back and forth, three, two, three, two, three, two. Sometimes it has no pattern, three, two, five, one, I can't do pi, 3.416. It has a own, its own little, it's irregular, right? And another cute thing that people do when they, uh, electrophysiologists when they're bored, what they do is they describe rhythms as irregular. It's like, yeah, I understand it's irregular, but is it irregularly irregular, right? Or is it regularly irregular? So what that means is that it's, it's irregular. I understand that, but is there regularity to the irregularity, right? So if it's three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, that's irregular, but it's regular. It's, regu it's regularly irregular, right? But if it's three, five, three point one four six point two, whatever, whatever, that is irregularly irregular. AFib is irregularly irregular as well, because there's no regularity to its irregularity. It makes no sense, but just an FYI. I'm not going to test you on that. Don't, don't worry. Okay. But the causes are the same. So it's nice when you're doing a table right here. Ditto. That's it. The only difference is I have F waves. I have flutter, right? So if you recognize, oh, they got, that's a flutter. Why there's so many P waves there? Those aren't P waves. Those are flutter waves. Well, how do I know it's a flutter wave? It has a little more sawtooth appearance to it, a little more teeth-like, right? Compared to a regular P wave, which is nice, upright, and rounded, right? So that's a flutter. And this is an example of differentiating them. If you have to play this video 12 times, I won't judge you.
the little asterisk in there is there's sometimes a flutter can also be irregular irregular okay all right i think that's it for atrial then we'll come back and talk about supraventricular tachycardias <laughs> Oh, look at him go. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> supraventricular tachycardias. So uh, SVT and VT are two different things. So SVT means it comes above the atrium, or supra to the atrium, or sorry, supra to the ventricle. Supraventricular is above the ventricles, whereas ventricular tachycardia is the ventricles are going way too fast, right? So ventricular tachycardias fall under our ventricular rhythms. We talk about V. Uh, ventricular rhythms, VT is one, right? We're still up in atrial rhythms and we're talking about SVT. Okay? So, supraventricular super tachycardia is just an umbrella term. SVT used to mean just one specific rhythm, which was PSVT, but now it's been downgraded. PSVT is a type of SVT. Okay? <coughs> so, the rhythms you have to know are AFib, A flutter for atrial, you have to know PSVT. And you have to know, of course, rapid and, and rapid AFib, rapid A-flutter. You don't have to know about, um, actually, it's proximal SVT, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. There we go. So all you got to know is uh, rapid AFib, A-flutter, which is just a AFib, A-flutter greater than how many beats per minute? Greater than 100, right? So we're, we're two-thirds of the way there. The other SVT that we have is prox uh, yeah, proximal yeah, atrial tachycardia. So it's going to be a fast... Uh, atrial rhythm that is a uh, proximal, and we'll describe what that looks like. Okay, so what else on this? Technically, sinus tachycardia is a is an SVT. It's a, it came from above the ventricles and it's fast, right? But we don't typically group it into that into that category. All right. So unfortunately, my mic died, so I got to carry this with me a little bit closer so you can hear me as well. So atrial tach, so supraventricular tachycardias again, they are. It can be sinus tach, they can be uh, proximal SVT, which just means that we have a um, really, really fast heart rate that's coming from the AV node itself, right there at the AV node. It's not really higher where we can see P waves, so therefore there's no P waves for PSVT. All right, that's kind of the only difference between ST and PSVT is one has P waves, one doesn't. Right, and also PSVT usually is a lot faster. It usually is more than 150, usually is up to like 220. It's a really, really fast heart rate, right? So when someone has a heart rate of 200, it's like, do they have PSPT? That's usually what it is. And also, it's narrow, because if it was wide, it probably it might be VTAC. Remember, we had the little asterisk that sometimes SVTs can have wide complexes, okay? The other thing, unique thing about PSPT is it's the only arrhythmia that we can use non-pharmacological interventions for. We can do things that are uh, not medication-based, not shocking-based. We're going to shock them out of it. We can do things to the patient to take them out of that rhythm. No other rhythm you can do that, right? So PSVT on the next page, we'll talk about those non-pharmacological things you can do for the patient, right? So AFib, a flutter, we talked about as well as the previous section. And if that heart rate is greater than 100, that is a SVT, not a PSVT, but a SVT, a supraventricular tachycardia, right? And then we have just FY, this, we're not going to test you on these, but it's, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, wandering atrial pacemaker is no longer, WAP does not mean wandering atrial pacemaker anymore since like 2020. Mm -hmm. So it, once a WAP is faster, that's called a multifocal atrial tachycardia. So sometimes you can tell the P waves, they have different, they're coming from different parts of the atrium. It's not so much a flutter yet, but you can see with each P wave, it looks different. Like, why is that P wave upright? Why is that P wave down? Why is that P wave going above and below? Okay. And that is, happens to be faster. It's called multifocal atrial tachycardias. And there's AV nodal re tachycardias. Just you might, if you look at other sources and other books, you can skip over those sections. That's just why I'm, I'm pointing it out here. Okay. All right. So the treatment for these guys, all SVTs is ABCD drugs. So you want to lower the heart rate because it's fast, right? The only exception is we can do non-pharmacological. So the, the, the key piece for all disease processes is always do non-pharmacological first. Diet and exercise is a good answer, but that's not going to fix this. Uh, but you're going to be doing anything non-pharmacological you can do, and then we do pharmacological, then you do surgical, and you might do some other more invasive things. So it's always least invasive to most invasive. That's just how things work, right? 
So uh, the only one of these rhythms that you can do non-pharmacological things for is PSVT. All right, so SVT treatments, or I should say PSVT specifically. All right, so PSVT. So PSVT, if their blood pressure is greater than 90, right, so that means their blood pressure is good, but they have this really, really fast rhythm. What do they need to complain of? They have a really fast heart rate. And it's got palpitations. My heart is racing, right? So you can tell, and then if you look at that, look, look at the EKG, and you say, well, your blood pressure is good. But uh, you know, I understand you have some chest pain, it's a shortness of breath, and you might be a little bit confused right now. You can't really say your words. But uh, let's, let's go ahead and do some maneuvers. Let's do some vagal maneuvers. All right. These vagal maneuvers are non-pharmacological, things we can do to the patient to fix their fast heart rate. Because we did an EKG, we saw, oh, they're an SVT. The heart rate is 200. There's no P waves. That is paroxysmal SVT. And we can fix that by stimulating the vagus nerve. What does the vagus nerve do? It's going to go to the SA node and AV node and suppress it, right? So it's a non-pharmacological way to fix a fast heart rate, right? So you can exhale, so you can go to the, into the room and say, okay, exhale against a closed glottis. Closed glottis, exhale against it. What does that mean to the patient, right? So you have to be able to you know, give them instructions. And what that means, you might be blowing through a syringe, right? The smaller, the better. That's more resistance, right? So they're exhaling against a closed glottis. So it's like, pretend like you're defecating. What does defecating mean? I don't know. So you have to, you know, you can, this is one of the easiest things to grab a syringe, okay? The best thing, the one that works better, though, than just blowing through a syringe is what's called the modified Valsalva, where they blow through the syringe and then you tip grandpa upside down, all right? So you go ahead and do say, blow through the syringe. It's like, okay, whoa, and you're going to tip grandpa upside down, okay? So this is an example of that. So you see, look at the heart rate up there. It's 214. So heart rate's 214 back there. It's like, oh, Grandpa, you got this, right? So he blew through the syringe, and then he breaks the SVT there. <laughs> and they're going to grab two nurses to us to have them hold them like that. I'm kidding. <laughs> While they like this, do they have to still blow through the syringe? But... Yeah, they blow through the syringe first right there, and then they tip them over. No. <laughs> so I put this on a loop, but unfortunately I cannot turn it off. Hold on. All right, so that's what you do for a modified Valsalva. They blow out through the syringe, and then you flip them upside down, all right? And then another thing you do is carotid sinus massage, all right? So the carotid sinus is uh, right here by the carotids, by the neck, and then they just massage it. But you got to make sure they're less than 45 years old. Otherwise, you could have plaques there, and you can cause a stroke, all right? So you got to make sure they're 45 years of age or younger, and then... If you're, you, know, you can listen first to make sure there's no occlusion because you don't want all that plaque to dislodge and make its way up to the brain. Okay? And then it wasn't until the year 2000 until the American Heart Association took out the recommendation to do a circumferential DRE, which is a digital rectal exam. All right? So you flip the guy upside down. It's like, whoa, what's that? Or so they say, you know, it's almost cold, cold gloved finger was, was the recommendation until the year 2000. For like 30 years. It's like, okay, we're going to be doing, we're going to be, you know, circling and doing that guy. All right. Back in uh, Japan, that's a, that's a pastime for the young school kids. They do concho and they go, and that's, that's, that's supposed to be a cool thing. In America, it's called sexual harassment. All right. But if all that stuff doesn't work, then the next thing is pharmacological, right? So we try non pharmacological first and then non pharmacological and then pharmacological, right? So after concho, doesn't work, then pharmacological. So I skipped it. I can't go back, unfortunately, otherwise I lose all the audio. But on the bottom left, on the bottom of the screen, it shows the, the echo of someone of someone's heart, and they get they get the adenosine, and then it just stops, then it reboots. Okay. So what was I going to say about that as well? So adenosine again, it lasts for eight seconds, and you have to give it super fast. All right. So how to give adenosine? Just know you have to give it fast. You will give it practice-wise in message three, not this course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, it could be fine, AFib, AFib fine. All right, so the reason why it is AFib is because, A, it's irregular. You got irregularities in these intervals here, and you really can't see the fibrillatory waves, but I mean, if you had to guess, this is AFib. When le next semester we learn about junctional rhythms, they don't have P waves either, but junctional rhythms are regular, so that's one of the ways you can tell the difference. But if you have an irregular rhythm, it's probably AFib, all right? All right, next one. I didn't ask if it was controlled or slow ventricular response or rapid. So the first one actually going back with how many complexes we got? 80. Got a rate of 80, so that is controlled. controlled. So I'd probably add controlled there. All right, controlled. Okay, and then the next one is a what? It's AFib with rapid ventricular response. Good. AFib RVR, AFib with rapid ventricular response, and what's the cause of AFib RVRs? Chronic AFib with fever. Yeah, you could have chronic AFib, and then you have, or you have something that someone has structural disease, someone has a problem with their their heart's uh, uh, structure. You got dilation or hypertrophy or scar tissue, and they have some SNS response, right? It could be MEP to a SNS actual SNS response, right? Or they have anxiety or fever, et cetera. Okay. All right, number three. Um, we put course AFib with RVR. Yeah, you could argue it's AFib. I mean, it's trying. It looks like it's trying to go into a flutter, but uh, yeah, it's not. It's unorganized. It's not nice and neat like flutter. Like the next one, that's perfect flutter right there, right? The, those flutter waves. Look at those flattened waves. Anyways, we got lead number three is AFib what? RBR, because it's faster than 100 and it's irregular. That's what clues us in that it's AFib and not sinus, right? You say, oh, it might be sinus rhythm. Look at that, that fourth complex. It looks like there might be a P wave in QRS, right? But that's just kind of like what somebody says, like, if you're trying to, to argue that's it, the other ones are dispute, disputing evidence, okay? All right, and then we got number four. Yeah, perfect A flutter. And is it slow, regular, or medium? Rare. No, I'm kidding. Slow, regular, or RVR? So the you know this one is a regular A flutter. So we can use the 300 method here, right? Because it has regularity to it. Okay. <clears throat> Number five. Uh, PSVT. So PSVT. Yep. I don't see a P wave there with QRS. That that. Little comp upright complex before the QRS is the T wave still finishing. All right, that's the T wave there. There's no P wave here. No P wave and fast equals PSVT. All right, so what can we do to fix that? What's a treatment for that? Concho or well, Sava for more culture. Right, I think we're more culture than Japan. I'm just saying it's more more it's more accepted here to do carotid massage or do a you can dip someone's face in ice. That'll work too. Okay. <laughs> Less frowned upon. And then uh, what else? We got uh, so, so the cause of the PSVT. It could be some ectopic site. It could be something that's causing a rapid response like that, which would be what? Something SNS related, such as where it did fever. What's another one? Got it. We said infection. Anxiety. All right. All right. Next one. What's number six? A Looks like a flutter, and it's irregularly irregular. There's not really a pattern to that. Okay, so is it fast or slow? If that's a six-second strip, that is, looks a little bit fast, right? Three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So a flutter at a rate of one twenty. So that's a flutter RVR. Okay. All right, and next one. What's that? Yeah, it's a little bit tricky. And again, on the test, it'd be very clear. On the quiz, it'd be very clear if it's a flutter or not. But this looks like the end of the um, of the T wave. The T wave is kind of 
biphasic. Okay, it has an up and a down part to it, right? So that would make it what? Yeah, so it's, I would argue this is probably PSBT, but I'd also argue that we should get a 12 lead, and that would really tell us which one, one it is. Okay, and number eight, that looks regular or irregular? Irregular. Looks irregular, so that's, you can bet money at Vegas that it is a fib, not a flutter. A flutter, you can see F waves, right? Or sawtooth waves. A fib, you can't, it could be really, really fine, a fib. If you switch the leads to a different lead, you might be able to see those differentiary waves. So is it a fib RBR, a fib SBR, a fib normal? What is it? So it's faster than 100, right? And what's the cause of that? And also, we got a little extra flavor there too. It's extra side of meatballs, right? We got a bundle branch block, right? Because usually, supraventricular tachycardias are narrow complex. If they're wide, it could be a um, a bundle branch block, or it could be something lethal. So that's why, you know, giving a, doing a 12 lead is important for this patient. And everybody knows what a 12 lead is, right? Versus a 12 lead is a formal test we do, a formal diagnostic test we do to make sure that what we're seeing on the bedside monitor is what we're seeing. Okay. All right. And then next one, number nine. PSPT. So PSPT is pointing to something. It's pointing to a little tiny little P wave, I think, buried in the C wave. All right, so basically you don't have P wave PRS, you have you have a either maybe it might be a buried P wave, but it's it's definitely not visible. So that's a PSVT. How can you fix PSVT? You can cardiovert them when? When would you do cardioversion? When the blood pressure is less than 90, right? Adenosine is going to lower the blood pressure, so it's going to stop everything. It's going to stop the heart, and it also vasodilates. That's why you may get a flushing sensation. When you get it for dentistry. Okay, so this patient, if they had a low blood pressure, less than 90, they would then we would skip non pharmacological. Like, wait, I'm going to do carotid massage. No, their their blood pressure is way too low. You got you've already skipped all those pieces. Now you can't give medications either because the medication will lower the blood pressure. The next step is what is electrical shock of some sort. All right, so we have to shock them. How if they have, and they probably have a pulse here, but if they have a shock and we're going to sorry if they have a pulse and we're going to shock them. What's the button we have to press on the, on the machine? Yeah. It's synchronized. So it's synchronized cardioversion. All right. And then top left there, number 10. A That's a flutter. Well, that looks like a you know, sinus tack, but the, the, the sawtooth appearance of the flutter wave is what make, brings us to saying that it's a flutter. And what's the rate on that? It looks pretty regular, so we can use the 300 method. So what is it? So less than 100 or more than 100? It's almost, almost exactly 100, right? So it could be you know, borderline. If, again, on the exam or the quiz, it'll be very apparent if it's fast or slow. All right, so a flutter one to one. And next one, looks like they're trying to flutter. Looks like it could be flutter. Is it flutter or fib? It's, it's hard. I mean, you have to maybe get another, you get a 12 lead to see if other leads really cor corroborate it. What did I say? Just AFib. If you, if you have to guess, you know, that's usually the law of averages. It's AFib. It's irregular. You really can't tell. Like, if you're looking at between 11 and 12, definitely 12 is flutter. Like, if you really had to you know, write home about something. All right, so number 12 is a flutter. What kind of a flutter? So it's slow particular response, right? <clears throat> and it had, does it have regularity to it? It's one, two, three, four, five humps, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven humps? No. Okay. Variable, and it's slow particular response. So how do you know it's slow? Well, it's irregular, so what, can I, what method can I use? The 300 or the 10x method? 10x. So yeah, one, two, three, four, five times 10 is a rate of 50. Next one. Um, yeah, that's 13. That's us. Sorry. Um, I put it as SVT because the rate's above 200 if you use the R to R, but... Yeah, that little hump before the, the QRS complex, I would, I, would, I would not argue that's a P wave. So the P wave sometimes can be buried inside the QRS complex with SVT. So again, on the exam or quiz, it'll be very, very clear. It's not going to be something like, oh, maybe that's it or not. It's a... Uh, this is PSVT because the P wave is not great. It's not a 
a P wave you can write home about that say that that's a actually, and again, that's why you do a 12 lead to see is it really this or not, okay? So the blood pressure is greater than 90 and they have this rhythm, what can you do about it? What would you expect to be done about it? What is that? Give adenosine. Adenosine. Okay. So adenosine okay. is the drug you give for PSVT, right? Can you give the other drugs? You could, but they are, this is usually short-lived. So usually adenosine is the one you want to reboot the heart. There's been a, a specific, there's been a re-entrance thing around the AV node. It's, it's going haywire and we got to just reboot the heart. Okay. Took the blue screen down. All right. And then number 14. Um, I struggle with this one a little bit because it could be like a one-to-one, -one, but in reality, because it's uh, almost at the 300s, it's like 250 to 300s with the R to R because it's regular. I would go the PSVT again. Yeah, since it's regular, it's probably a superventricular tachycardia that's you know, probably paroxysmal. Again, like when the heart rate's fast. And we don't know if it's PSVT or A flutter with a one-to-one -one response or all these other fancy things. Sometimes they will give adenosine to slow it down enough so they can see what's going on. Okay. And also T waves are a little peaked. Mm -hmm. Okay. And all right. Then, and then you can see the difference between 14 and 15, right? So 14 is nice and regular, whereas 15 is nice and what? Irregular. Irregular, right? It's irregular and fast or slow or controlled? It's uncontrolled for sure. It's uncontrolled, which is what? Slow or fast? Fast. Fast, right? So it's a fib or flutter? Fib. Why is it not flutter? I mean, it doesn't have to be the regularity piece. It's just you have to like have clear sawtooth lines, right? Sawtooth waveforms. Like you can see, like in 16, uh, that is probably not the best example, but either way, uh, it's a fib RVR, right? And then the next one, number 16. So it's like, well, which part of the rhythm to, to assess? The first half or the back half? The back half is normal. The first half is not. It's a little run of an abnormal rhythm. The little run of what? PSVT. There's no P waves there. That's just a whole huge T wave, right? So we got a run of PSVT, and the rate is pretty fast. Like it's almost it's hit up like almost 250, right? They're gonna feel their heart race. All right, and the last one, or what is this next one? Number 17. We have 17. This happened last time, right? What happened with 17? It was a, we had it. Um, um, There's actually a trick. There's one I'm not going to test you on. All right, notice the P waves are different. Okay? So this one is a coming from somewhere else in the atria. It's a wandering atrial pacer. <laughs> All right, top left, 18. There's actually some ST segment changes there. See, the ST is elevated here, so normally this everything should be baseline, but we got some elevation there, right? What is that? There's not really a P wave there, right? The P wave is not really a great. So what is it? So it's PSVT with ST elevation. What about the next one? That is definitely a fib. Those, those P waves aren't, aren't great. They're not, also not flutter waves. So it is a fib. What, what kind of a fib? So is it rate controlled? Yeah, rate is 70, right? Because there's seven complexes. So what about the next one, number 20? Yeah, it's a very, very slow way flutter, right? And then the final, or the bottom left there? AFib. That is AFib. You can see there's the, that slow A flutter and a slow AFib, right? FIB literally has filmatory waves. You can't really ascertain that they have any kind of organization. Just like comparing 22 and 23. They're both RVRs. Which one's AFib? Which one's A flutter? <laughs> So 22 is a fib because it's irregular. That, that's a really big clue. But the other big clue is the flutter waves. That's the other sawtooth appearance. Compared to 24 is just regular old sinus tack, right? Because th those aren't flutter waves. Those are just that's a regular P wave.
Is 22 regular? Regular? Uh, yeah, there's a, I would argue, I would say that more a fib than anything. Yeah, let's change that. Because there's a, maybe you can say a little run right there. Yeah. But let's just put that a fib. A fib RVR. All right. And then next one, 25. A flutter. A flutter. That's a nice, clear uh, flutter waves. And it looks a little bit slow, but is it more than 60? Yeah. It's 70, right? So it's rate controlled. And the last one is worrisome because the QRS is prolonged. So anytime you have a wide complex tachycardia, we always say it's ventricular tachycardia until so proven otherwise. So how do you prove it otherwise? You have to go do a full 12 lead EKG to see if that is a um, SVT or it is a VT, right? And that's the segue to the next session for ventricular tachycardias or ventricular rhythms. Okay, so in MedSearch 3, you're going to learn algorithms and how to put it all together, right? But that's not our job here. Our job here for this course is just to know what are the causes, what are the symptoms, what are the treatments, and complications. And of course, nurse interventions that I might do for these patients, right? So we have VT, which has uh, two varieties, monomorphic and polymorphic. And polymorphic has another name. What's another name from polymorphic VT? That is torsades. Okay, we've kind of touched on torsades a couple of times, but we're gonna have a slide dedicated to that, right? And then we have asystole and PEA. So these are all ventricular rhythms. These are rhythms that are the ventricles not working good, right? So it, it might be working too fast, right? And that uh, fastness is coming from the ventricles itself. The FTP the, is, has gone haywire. There's been a little source here in the, the heart, and it's, it's the one that's causing an overriding the underlying rhythm. So they have a ventricular tachycardia, it could be a reason. You get a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia coming from different parts of the ventricle, more than one. Okay, And then V-fib, that's just like A-fib, but it's not the atria that they're relating, it's the ventricles that are fibrillating. Which one's worse? V-fib, right? The ventricles are fibrillating, they're not ejecting the blood which is 80% of your cardiac output, right? So you're, not, you're missing a lot of that cardiac output, all right? And then we have asystole, which is no ventricular activity at all, right? We have a flat line. You might have a little bit of P waves in there, a little agonal breath, uh, not breath, but ag agonal beats, but basically we have a flat line, right? And that's a, um, that's called asystole, or without a systole, contraction, right? And then we have PEA, pulseless electroactivity. That's where they have, you put on the monitor, they have an EKG, but you feel the pulse and there's nothing, right? So why would that happen? Why would that even, how is it even possible? Well, if your heart is a, a, wash, or it's a, wash, a wash of potassium, there's potassium all throughout your heart, that if you have too much potassium, it makes you super bradycardic, and then you, your light switch cannot turn on anymore, right? Hyperpolarizes to the point where you can't reach thresholds, okay? And then that's gonna, so the heart muscle itself cannot contract. You might see some electric activity trying to contract it, but it's not going to be able to. Okay, so there's a, there's important causes for these ones. The nice thing about these, the causes are all the same, right? Yes, the S and S is there, but there's what we call what are there H's and T's, and H's and T's are the causes for all lethal rhythms. So you all, and the reason why that's important is because H's and T's are reversible. We can fix it right then and there to try to get them out of these rhythms. Okay, so we're doing our a table here. H's and T's are the causes for ventricular rhythms, right? And of course, for torsades, we have extra other little things we've, we've talked about throughout today. And then for uh, what else? For, for the treatment. The treatment is you might shock the, the lethal rhythm or you don't shock, right? So that's differentiating what the treatment is for each one of these ventricular rhythms. All right, so VT. So ventricular tachycardia, notice it's a wide complex because it came from the ventricles, right? And so, well, it could come from the atria and it could be a bundle branch block also, but whenever you have a fast, wide rhythm, you always assume it's VTAP until proven otherwise, okay? And again, I'm not gonna fool you on the test and give you a SVT with a bundle branch block, all right? So we have monomorphic VT and we have, which it means just, it's just regular VT like at the top of the screen there, or we have polymorphic VT, but notice there's a third one here, because when you have VT, you can have a pulse or you can have no pulse, right? And there's a difference between the two. One, you're, you're going to shock them both, but one, you want to synchronize it because they have a pulse. 
and one you want to just shock them because they're dead. They have no pulse, right? So which one do you shock just willy-nilly? You don't really have to worry about synchronize or, or whatnot. They have no pulse. If they have no pulse, you're going to do unsynchronized cardioversion, right? And also polymorph PT usually does not have a pulse. Sometimes it might go into it just briefly, but if it's sustained, they have no pulse. You've got to shock them out of it immediately, right? Same, what's another lethal rhythm that have to, you have to shock them right away in the previous slide? Unsynchronized like? Is V fib. V fib, you just shock all of us, you know, no matter what. V fib, they have no pulse guaranteed, okay? Unless they're off the monitor. Please don't shock your patient without the monitor, okay? So here's VT right here, and see they lost a pulse there. They're gonna, you know, now, oh, sorry, they shocked them, and now they're back into a sinus rhythm or sinus tack even, all right? So they're V tack, and there they shocked them, a big white little complex right there, and then now they're back into a regular rhythm. And that's the goal. If they have a pulse, you hit the what button? The sync button to provide synchronized cardioversion. Why is the voltage low right after they shock them? Well, nowadays we have better machines that, are, that you can do a lower voltage with. Usually it starts like at 120 volts. So that's a, you can, joules actually, so you can do a lower lower threshold. Back in the day, like 20 years ago, you had to, you started all the way up to 360. And you could use paddles to, or like in the movies. Nowadays you just throw, slap the pads on them and you can use lower joules. Okay, so the causes of all of our ventricular rhythms are H's and T's, right? So H's and T's are reversible causes of these lethal rhythms. So instead of, we, before we did always ABCs, now you're going to switch gears if they lose a pulse. If they lose a pulse, we're not worried about airway breathing anymore. It's like, why are we not worried about that? Because you're worried about circulation, which is CPR, right? So the priority for these patients is CPR if they lose a pulse, okay? So what else? So what causes this is H's and T's, and usually there is something abnormal with the tissue. <clears throat> there might be scar tissue, they might have ischemia, like an MI, they might have a, um, something like a really, you know, some electrolyte issues usually are torsades, but it's not unheard of that that could cause VTAC as well. Just like when you have like hypoglemia, you're very, very irritable, you could go into VTAC, right? So the features of VTAC, it's always wide, and you have what's called AV dissociation. So that's where the P waves and QRSs are doing their own thing. It really has to be <coughs> slow enough for you to be able to see that. Lethal VTAC is really, really fast. Okay. So also PVCs, what's a PVC again? That's a premature ventricular contraction. When you have three or more of those in a row, that's called technically VTAC. That's concerning when there's three or more in a row and we have to intervene. Okay. And again, there's types. There's monomorphic. Which, is, which, can, which can have a pulse or no pulse, right? And then you have torsades, which is our next slide. So torsades is, there's many causes of torsades, but they usually don't have a pulse with torsades, and we have to fix that, okay? So a patient will be symptomatic with VTAC, right? Even with VTAC with a pulse, they're gonna be really sick. They're gonna have what symptoms? Yeah, chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, any one of those things they can have with VTAC, with a pulse, right? They're not going to be sustaining for long. They might transition to VTAC without a pulse. Okay, so the fix for VTAC with a pulse, if they have a blood pressure greater than 90, we can hit them up with amiodarone. Why can't we do digoxin? Doesn't digoxin protect cardias? Because digoxin and beta blockers and those guys all work on the AV node. We don't have an we don't have an atrial problem. We have a ventricular problem. Our ventricle is going haywire. If we give digoxin and suppress the AV node, it does nothing, right? The problem is the ventricles. So we got to do something that's going to block all the cells, and that's what amiodarone does. It's a potassium channel blocker. It's going to prolong the refractory period so that less impulses get through and lowers the heart rate and hopefully gets them out of the, the VTAC. Okay, so that's with a pulse. If you have a pulse, you have good blood pressure, you can give amiodarone to hopefully fix it. But what if the blood pressure is less than that? You can give amiodarone? No, that's a contraindication. You don't give a medication that's gonna lower the blood pressure to someone that has low blood pressure, right? So in that case, you have to do, you have to shock them out of the rhythm and that's called synchronized cardioversion, right? And then we have pulseless VTAC. You have VTAC on the monitor, you have this wide complex tachycardia here. And what do you do then? You have to chain gears. We're not doing ABCs anymore. We're not worried about airway breathing circulation. We're worried only about circulation, right? So the whole, whole purpose of here is to maintain circulation. How do you maintain circulation? 
is CPR, right? And we try to reboot the heart with epinephrine, right? Epinephrine is going to supercharge the heart, right? To try to get them out of that VTAC. All right, it's like, well, isn't tachycardia, wouldn't epinephrine cause tachycardia? It's like, you know, you're already dead, so why not just try epi? Let's see if it works, right? And it might even be kind of phased out in the future because it it's actually causes more problems than good. But the, the fix for this is CPR and epi. If someone has no pulse and they have VTAC, they're really dead in front of you, the, the priority for the nurse is to do CPR. That's why you're all BLS trained, right? Is to make sure that someone loses a pulse in front of you, I got to be doing CPR, right? And then now the next step is like, well, do I shock them or not shock them? That's what we're learning now because you got to throw them on a monitor and see what the EKG is, right? In the mall, you just have the, um, what's it called? The, Zol, the, um, the AED. And the AED does its own interpretations. It's interpreting, do they have asystole or do they have VTAC? If it's VTAC, it says shock advised, right? If there's asystole, it's not going to shock. It's a resumed compressions, right? So the priority is CPR, epi, and you can hit them as an amiodarone too because you know they have VTAC, okay? And if, as fast as possible, you have to do unsynchronized cardioversion. Why don't you do synchronized cardioversion? Because they're already dead. We don't care if we, we shock them on the T wave or not. We are just going to shock them, and hopefully it reboots the heart. Okay? So you can see there in the middle there, you got this VTAC up there, right? That VTAC's really pronounced, and then it's going. We're going to shock them as soon as possible, right? Still going, still getting the pads in place. I guess that's just VTAC. Okay. Oh, that, that we shocked them at the beginning there. All right, anyways, the goal is to shock them as soon as possible, but maybe you don't have an AED. The priority is to do BLS and CPR, and you go get the AED, right? And then they bring it there, and then hopefully they can shock them out of that rhythm. Okay? So H's and T's are reversible things. So these are all kinds of, of uh, what's it for? Of, uh, sequelae of S and S, or that's a bad adjective. But you have these are all uh, really, really severe S and S things, right? You have really, really severe hypoxia. That's, that triggers the SNS, right? So we can try to fix that hypoxia. Maybe they have a really, really bad pneumonia or COVID-19 or something, right? Hypovolemia, they're bleeding out everywhere. We can try to fix that by restoring blood and fluids. Hydrogen ion excess, we're going to talk about next time with ABGs. And if they have really, really high acid levels, that can cause VTAC. It can also cause some of our other lethal rhythms too. Hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, both of them are very, very, when they're very severe, it can cause VTAC or, or other lethal rhythms as well. Hypothermia, we're not really touch base too much on that, but uh, tamponade, that's a also some kind of more trauma. But toxins, you got prolonged QT, you got too many what kind of medications? Too many what? Antiemetics. Too many antiemetics, too much reglin, too much metoclopramide, too much a medication that's going to coin, prolong the QT or too much amiodarone, all right? And then we got uh, tension pneumothorax, which is just a pneumothorax that's pushing and suppressing the blood pressure, and then thrombosis. We got a PE because they have a large, they have atrial fib that wasn't getting what kind of medication? Anticoagulants, right? And then a MI. So if they have an MI in front of you, the priority is to try to open up that coronary vessel with a cardiologist, right? But our priority in the meantime is to do CPR and you know, let the doctor know, oh, they're, they're here for an MI. So, well, shoot, that might be the reversible cause. We can try to fix it at the bedside or bring them to the cath lab to fix it. All right, so that's the idea behind VTAC. And the priority is to do a pulse. Very good. Do CPR. Okay, um, uh, we want nice, steady compression. Look at trap. That CPR that'll save a life. Oh, thanks. You know, I used to be a lifeguard. That is a <laughs> What did you do? I don't know! Where am I? You were too good at CPR! You saved my life. How could I ever repay you? You saved me! You saved me! No, Maria! Why didn't you save her? I tried! You have to have steady compression Stop tape. Somebody it. help me! I don't have any arms! <laughs> What's happening? Oh. oh my god. What did you do? Trap no! Alright, CPR is priority. Alright, so polymorphic VT. So polymorphic VT is torsades, right? We present pronounce torsades de point correctly. 
that's where you get you know, down there in the bottom left. That's what you look like, right? You grab, grab your cape, grab your, your cane, right? So it means turn to the points in uh, French. So if you, this is the point right here, you're just going up and down, right? So that's the idea behind torso. It looks like VTAC, but it gets bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller, right? And what caused it? We've mentioned some of these things. We have a prolonged QT, prolonged QTC, right? And that's prolonged. That can lead to torsades, and that's a um, that, that's of course deadly and lethal. They're going to lose their pulse, and we have to again do CB. You know, we're doing compressions first, okay? And then uh, what else causes torsades? We have a low um, electrolytes. What electrolytes are low? We got potassium, we got mag, calcium. Those when those are low, that can cause torsades. Uh, we have a um, RNT phenomenon we talked about. We have a PVC that's right on top of the um, QRS complex, right? The PVC right in this area right here. I think someone had a PVC to pr precede it. But all those things can put you at risk for torsades. So the fix is to do compressions. We're not doing ABCs anymore. We're not worried about pr providing oxygen. We're worried. Our worries provide CPR and epi as soon as possible, right? And we got to fix the underlying cause. It's, it could be H's and T's, but really it might be, you know, it might be magnesium being low. So sometimes we just give magnesium just in case, right? You might give epi, or you would give epi with no pulse, but then amiodarone. But wait, doesn't that prolong the QT? So <laughs> you have to figure out what the cause is. We're not give more amiodarone if amiodarone caused a prolonged QT. We have other options, okay? So we're gonna stop QTC prolonging drugs so it doesn't happen again. So what's a prolonged QTC look like? Greater than what? Greater than 0.45, right? So here's actually a PVC, and that's what the R on T phenomenon. We have a PVC right on top of the T wave. All right, so VF, ventricular fibrillation. So whenever you have V-fib, you have to D-fib, right? So we shocked, we shocked three out of five of our lethal rhythms. So those three are VTAC, torsades, and VFib. You do not shock the other two. What are the other two? Lethal rhythms, asystole, and PEA. So VFib is fibrillatory fibrillation of the ventricles. Right? The ventricles are fibrillated. They're not pumping out blood. And the cause, just like VTAC, is H's and T's. And we have to fix that. Right? They, they will not have a pulse with VFib, guaranteed. Right? So it's just CPR and epi, CPR and epi. And CPR and epi is the answer for every patient has no pulse, right? No pulse, CPR and epi. That is the fix, right? Someone starts CPR, you give epinephrine, right? That is the priority. And to shock them or not shock them depends on what the rhythm is. Is ready to connect. Okay. Let's connect you then. All right, so VFib priority is to DFib. All right, we're still recording there. All right, sorry, we had some technical difficulties. All right, any other questions on VFib or VTAC? Yes. What are H and T's? H and T's were on the VTAC slide. Those are in that bottom right corner, the, purple, the orange and blue. So H and T's are hypoxia. What's another T? Tamponade. Uh, tamponade. You got thrombus. You got uh, hypothermia. So let's see what happened here. There we go. All right. So the priority here is to defibrillate as soon as possible. Where's my cursor at? Yeah. All right, so VFib for DFib. And uh, they don't have a pulse with this in this situation. That rhythm looks sus. Code blue, I yeah, see you. <laughs> Okay, fam, what's the tea? 64 year old simping for Jesus. Bill, those compressions are dank. Not me saving a life while manifesting sinus rhythm. Vibe check. Tell me you need shock without telling me you need shock. Big yikes. Squiggly lines. Find a shock. This ain't it, chief. 
Everybody ghost. Full send. A year done. Ratio. Right, so big L. If you didn't understand example. the assignment, uh, code it's canceled. All right, so we talked about Cardi version. This, all, this is a summarizes Cardi version. What is synchronized versus unsynchronized? So synchronized is the patient has a pulse or no pulse. They have a pulse and they have a fast heart rate, right? <clears throat> and then unsynchronized is where they have a um, they have no pulse. We're just going to shock them no, no matter what. And the job of the nurse is to make sure we hit the sync button or not hit the sync button. Also, the job of the nurse is to make sure everybody's clear so nobody else gets shocked, right? So you have to make sure you shout all clear. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem. They're going to have an arrhythmia of their own, right? You might shock them on the T wave and cause what? Or sides, right? So, yeah, say I'm clear, you're clear, and then these little markers are going to be there when you have synchronized or unsynchronized cardio version. When you care about the, the shock at the right time is with synchronized cardio version. Okay? If they volunteer for this, they should be getting sedation and consent, right? Because it's going to hurt. All right, so we're going to work through the, the problems and finish up um, the AB blocks here. <clears throat> so usually I'll, I'll if you separate you on the groups, but we'll go ahead and do the problems together. <laughs> all right, so the last two things that we don't shop, these are lethal, right? Asystole, no heart rate is lethal, right? So you have a you have nothing to do but do CPR and F. That's the only thing we can do. We're not going to shock it. It has no, no effect, right? You'll see in movies, they'll shock all the time, but they have to have something that's shockable to be able to, to bring them back from, okay? You might have a little algorithm before this where they have some kind of activity, but it will eventually lead to a flat line like there on the, on the right hand side. Right? So the cause is the same for all these really just H's and T's. You try to fix something that might be broke, all right? And then I check the patient. They might just be off the leads. They might also do CPR someone who's just sleeping, right? <laughs> the leads came off. But if they are unresponsive, just like your BLS, it's just like, are you okay? Are you okay? No, it's like you have to hit the code blue button. Otherwise, you'd be doing their doing compressions. But like, Where's everybody at? Right? So hit the code blue button is our priority, and then we do uh, CPR and epi and thoughts and prayers. There's nothing else we can do for ACEs. Right? If they get our pulse back, great. Right? And then PEA is just as bad. Right? It's PEA, you're not going to shock as well, or you're not doing any kind of cardioversion. Causes are the same, the treatment's the same. It's CPR and epi and thoughts and prayers. There's nothing you can do for that. You have to try to reverse it as much as possible. I've been looking to see, do they have hypoxia? Are they cold? Is there, what's their potassium level? All right, you can look at those things and try to fix the underlying problem. Otherwise, they, that's, that's it. All right, if they do get return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC, then we're going to do uh, what's called TTM, targeted temperature management, where you are protecting the brain for as much as possible, as much as possible the next three days, all right? We used to cool them, which was called therapeutic hypothermia, but now we found out that it kills more patients than good, so we don't do that anymore. So it's just a, you just maintain the temperature so they don't get fevers, they don't get cold and such. Okay. And also, if you are doing a code for more than 20 minutes, you're doing, someone's, you're doing a CPR for more than 20 minutes, there is, it's futile. So often, oftentimes, it's still, you know, keep going, keep going 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. All right, in reality, we might do that with someone that's really young, but you know, usually after 20 minutes, there is no, no good outcome. Okay, and then PEA, pulse electroactivity. Again, that's, uh, there's something on the screen, there's something on the EKG, but they have no pulse, right? So really, it could be any rhythm, except for our legal rhythms, basically, right? We have asystole, yes, that's P, that's not really electroactivity. But if they have VFib, VTAC, that is electroactivity, and that's, we can do something different for that, right? Otherwise, everything else is All right, so let's do number one together. So what is that? So you have to recognize lethal rhythms. That is, that is critical as a new nurse, right? You'd be able to say, is that lethal? Yes. What do I do about it? I'm going to do CPR and epi for every lethal rhythm. And then you, know, then you have to say, well, do you have to shock or not shock it? That's the treatment. Okay. So one is VTAC, right? Number two, what is that? That is unorganized, there's no QRSs, that is B what? B fit. Next one. So we got a really wide complex and it's tachycardic, right? You measure complex to complex, it's more than what? 
almost 200, right? So that is a Y accomplice that party, which is VTAP, that's a proven otherwise, right? Plot number four. How colors are plots because they're twisting? That is definitely. There's fibrillation there, but it's not fibrillation between the QRS complexes. It is. Yeah. It is VF, ventricular fibrillation. Okay. And then what's the top right? A systole. I mean, it looks like there's some activity there, so they might shock that. And I say it's always fine VFib, but uh, it's likely A systole. All right. Next one, number six. And again, on the test, it'll be very, very clear if it's VVIB or a Sicily. It's not going to be one or the other. So this looks a little bit like torsades, right? Let's see what I put there. And also, we had, yeah, we had a PVC right on top of that T wave, right? And then next one, number seven. We got a wide complex for sure, right? And is it fast? There's 300... 150, 160 or so. So that is a fast ventricular tachycardia. So it's a VT until, until proven otherwise. How do you prove it? A 12 lead and a cardiologist will help you out. All right. What's number eight? Also, yeah, if, this, if these were PVCs, you got more than three in a row, that is also a uh, VT. So this is also, whoa, we're twisting of the points. That's called torsades. What about this one down here? We'll kind of skip that one. That's a little more advanced. But there are other clues to see if it's VTAC. All right? So these are examples of medical dramas here. All right, VFib is not normal. All right, so let's skip that one. All right. Number 10, what is that? So yeah, this part definitely is asystole. Sometimes I mentioned that it can be preceded by one little big last hurrah. All right, number 11, what is that? It's definitely torsade. So it's VTAC, it's getting smaller and bigger. Next one is wide complex tachycardia, so it's VTAC until proven otherwise. All right, there's other clues in there too. There's some AV dissociation, which we're not going to get into. All right, so then next one also, you can see these little P waves are on top of the, like, doing their own thing. We mentioned when they're doing their own thing, they're divorced like that, it could be VTAC, right? And that, that's an example of VTAC. All right, top right, what's that? Number 14. That's pretty much a Sisley. And number 15, what is that? So it says no pulse with this EKG. So on a test, we have to tell you if there's a pulse or not. If there's no pulse and there's an EKG rhythm, it is likely PEA. What's the exception? Is if it's another lethal rhythm, such as VFib, VTAC, or torsades, that you know, it will tell you if they have that. That is something you can identify. But if it's anything else, then it's and they have a, an electrical activity but no pulse, then it's called PEA. All right, next one. That is torsades. It says no pulse is EKG. That's like a hack. All right, that's that's that's, gonna, that's telling you that it is likely what PEA. You have electroactivity. You might start trying to interpret it to say, oh, that's you know, it looks like a, I don't know what that is, but that is going to be. There's no pulse with it, so it's a PEA. Next one. That is definitely VTAC. It's not a turn of the points, but it is VTAC. Charging. So there's VTAC there, they're charging. What do you do for VTAC and VFib? You shock them as soon as possible. If they have a blood pressure, you do what? Synchronize cardioversion. If they have no blood pressure, you just shock them. We don't, we don't care. All right? They shock them and they went back into a narrow complex there, right? I have a quick question. Yes. Yeah, you could. Yeah, but yeah, I would make it very clear if they have a pulse or no pulse. All right. All right, and then we added some more examples here. What's the top left one there, number 19? That is VTAC. All right, so it's wide complex and it's really, really fast. And this one, you can 
it's starting to make sense. They, it's kind of getting smaller and bigger, smaller. It's VTAC. You can see here it's the same. It's just all we're doing is squeezing it down and making it bigger. What about number 21? So go with sinus rhythm with ST elevation, but it's also no pulse. So that's called pulseless electrical activity. Okay. And then bottom left, number 22. That is asystole. You could argue maybe it's fine B-fib, but it's, we're probably done. All right, number 23. That is definitely irregular. That is V-fib. What about 24? That's a flutter with slow ventricular response, but it says what? No pulse with this EKG. So that is PEA. But the next one, you could say not VTAC. It'd be V fibrillation. It's fibrillated, just shaking. Okay. And then next one, 26. That's also pretty obvious V fib. Right? Or just fibrillating. If you imagine AFib versus VFib, they're very similar. This one is the atrial fibrillating, so you'll have normal QRS and T waves, whereas the VFib, they don't have any kind of QRS or T waves there. All right, so let's take a really quick break, five minutes, and then we'll finish off with AV blocks. <laughs> All right, so AV blocks. So AV blocks, you have to, when you understand AV blocks, you want to look at it like an algorithm. You want to try to figure out yes or no this, then yes or no that, and you'll get it every time. If you try to memorize AV blocks, it's almost, it's very, very hard. All right, so I'll, I'll walk you through the algorithm, how it works. All right, so the first thing is PR interval long. That is always what you're going to have an AV block on your hands if your PR interval is long. And some people might raise their hands, well, sometimes second degree type 2s have a normal PR. No, but on the test, it's going to be a prolonged PR. On the quiz, it'll be a prolonged PR. All right? There are three types or for three degrees of AV blocks. And obviously, as you get worse, as the, uh, the worst, the first degree, second degree, third degree, a third degree AV block is a lot worse than a first degree AV block. Sometimes we do nothing for first degree AV blocks. We really don't care too much. We just got to look to see what's causing it, right? And first degree blocks is just prolonged PR interval. That's it. You've got a prolonged PR interval, you, and you have no dropped QRS complex. Why would a QRS complex be dropped? Well, if you have an AV block, the AV node is blocked 100%, then, or not 100% because it's 100% blocked, that's, our, that's the worst type, right? But if it's partially blocked because we have medications, we have ischemia, we have something that's blocking that AV node, that's going to cause a drop in the QRS. Not every P wave is going to make its way through the, uh, eight, the AV node, right? So we have a first degree AV block, and then we have dropped complexes. So dropped complexes are second degree blocks. And they can be type 1 or type 2. But if you have a drop QRS, it is guaranteed to be a second degree AV block. Okay? And then third degree AV block. We talked about that's the worst one. They, there is a complete blockage between both chambers. They are divorced. They're doing their own thing. The R to R and the P to P are different. Right? When you look at the P wave and the R and the QRS complex, they don't follow each other. It's like, well, sometimes, look, they, they, over here it looks like it does. But if you actually really look at the whole thing, you realize they're doing their own separate thing. All right. Even the P waves might get buried inside of the QRS complex or buried inside the T wave and make it look different. All right. So we have some practice questions. We'll look at those as well. All right. So this little table kind of summarizes it. But again, tables are not the best way. On the last slide, we have the, the algorithm for how they work. All right. So AV blocks, again, as you get worse and worse and worse, that's because first degree, second degree, third degree AV blocks. Junctional, idioventricular, those guys are next semester, right? But these are all in the bradycardia camp, right? When we talk about sinus bradycardia, they can get worse and worse and worse until we are blocking the heart completely, at the AV node specifically, okay? What's the cause of blocks? is usually meds. That's usually the most common reason. Someone has taken their beta blocker and then they have... Their, their, beta blocker, their AV node just starts shutting down to the point where it stops letting things through. It's getting prolonged, 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 and then psh, it's gone. You don't have any QRS that gets um, produced because you've blocked it, right? Or you can block it completely, and you have P waves and you have QRSs, but they are unrelated, right? And your QRSs are going to be coming from the bundles and the, the ventricles because the, the AV node stopped, right? 
60 to 100 is SA node, 40 to 60 is your AV node, and then less than 40 is usually ventricular. So they're going to be doing their own thing. Okay, and the treatment is usually the same as sinus bradycardia. All right, so if they have really, really low, uh, they have this block happening, the first thing is obviously treat the underlying cause. If digoxin is on board, let's stop digoxin. If they have too much, uh, you know, of rapid mill, non DHP calcium blocker, let's stop that. Okay, and usually their symptoms are going to be the same as sinus bradycardia. They're going to have a low output state. They're not putting out a lot of cardiac output because they're missing out QRS complexes and second degree blocks. They're missing out on, uh, like, they have a third degree AV block, they have a really, really slow uh, ventricular rate of like less than 40. So it can be, be very, very symptomatic. Okay. So the causes are just like bradycardia die, drugs ischemia, they have electrolytes that are, that are causing this blockade to happen at the uh, AV nodes. All right, so this table will come back to at the end of this AV block section, but this should all make sense, right? Second degree blocks always have drop QRSs, no matter what. First degrees, third degrees do not, right? First degree AV blocks are usually just, oh, cool, they have it, and let's figure out what the reason is. When they start having second degree type 1 and second degree type 2 blocks, now we are at risk for, you know, poor cardiac output. Third degree blocks are always a problem. We have, that's always something that needs to be addressed and usually get admitted to the hospital. They are going to be in trouble. We have to fix that. Okay. So first degree blocks, prolonged prolong PR. That's it. All right. And you, when you interpret rhythms, you don't say they got a first degree block. That is just a feature of sinus rhythm or a feature of sinus tag. Right. Is it a feature of AFib? No, you can't measure a PR interval with AFib. Is that a, for VTAC? No. This is usually an attachment to a sinus rhythm. Okay? You can't have A flutter with a first degree AV block because A flutter does not have P waves. It has flutter waves, technically. Okay? So when someone has a PR interval, though, you want to make sure that's prolonged. You want, that's an AV block, and you want to avoid further AV blocking medications, which are what? Your, a, your ABCDs, right? And then the other thing is what tells you if you have a first degree or second degree is whether the QRS dropped or not. Was the AV node blocked to the point of the QRS shutting down or the AV node just shutting it down and let, not letting the QRS go through? That's a the key difference between first degree and second degree. That's the only difference, really. All right. PR interval is prolonged in both, but one of them has a drop QRS and one doesn't. So does first degree AV block have a drop QRS? No, that's the, that's the difference. Okay, so second degree type one. So if it's a second degree AV block, that means we have a drop QRS, right? And these are usually unicorns. So when you see these, you want to print them out and then show it to all your friends. And they're going to say cool. But either way, it's it's something you don't see very often. It's where the PR actually gets longer, longer, longer than drops, right? It's quite rare to, to find these guys. Okay, but the key thing that makes it a second degree is what? We had a dropped QRS. Our AV node is blocked to the point where we didn't let an impulse get through. We didn't let a P wave get through. The P wave's there, but there's nothing following it, right? So second degree blocks always have a dropped QRS, right? And this is the only, um, sorry, the second degree AV block type one, this, this, uh, this guy right here, it has that PR interval that gets longer, 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 and then it drops, okay? So the PR interval is prolonged, right? And then we got a P wave, and where'd it go? Where's my QRS? It got blocked completely. Right? We got a PR interval, it gets longer, see how th this is longer than this one, and then sh dropped. Okay? That is drop QRS a second degree, but if it gets longer, 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 that's a unique finding of type one, second degree type one. All right, type two, that is it's second degree type two, second degree meaning that it has a dropped what? QRS. So if you have a drop QRS, it's second degree. Now, how do I know if it's type 1 or type 2? It's whether it gets longer, longer, longer than drops, or it just drops out of nowhere. It's like, it just doesn't show up. It just flakes on you. It's like when you invite your friends out to Denny's, right, for a study group, and they don't show up. They drop a QRS or a second type 2. It's like, oh, that's all, that really hurts my soul. You call me a second type 2. Either way, we got a drop QRS complex, and so you got a P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS, and the PR interval is, is usually always long, prolonged as well, but this can be normal but again on the test or exam i give you a prolonged pr right and then we have what a dropped qrs a dropped qrs dropped qrs right just chugging along right and then now we dropped a qrs where to go 
right? It wasn't that it got longer, longer, longer. It was just prolonged to begin with, right? So this is a blockade of the AV node, and some things are not getting through, all right? A P wave is there, so atrial contraction. It hits the AV node, but the AV node is suppressed, and it does not let that impulse get through, okay? So third degree is the worst one. That is where you have P waves, but the AV node is completely blocked. Look at that P wave adding to the T wave. So nothing is getting through. So what's going to happen? The ventricles are say, why can't I get, why, where's my P wave at? So it's going to do its own thing and it's going to depolarize on its own, right? Every cell in the heart has automaticity. It can automatically set its own intrinsic rate. Usually it's 60 to 100 with the SA node, 40 to 60 with the AV nodes, and then below that it will be ventricular. So the ventricles are doing their own thing, right? And the atria are doing their own thing as well, right? And sometimes that little deflection can add or be inside of other complexes. And that's a clue also that you have a third degree AV block. Okay, so also regularity, I didn't point out on the second degree blocks, they're always irregular. Why are they always irregular? Because you dropped a QRS complex, it's going to look irregular, right? You, you would have had five, but you missed one, so it's irregular, right? Third degrees and first degrees are always regular. They have a regular rhythm. The QRS complexes are all there. They're all where you expect them to be, but again, none of them dropped. If none of them dropped, it's either a first degree or a third degree. First degree and third degree both have prolonged PR intervals, but the key difference for the third degree of your block is that the PR interval is ridiculous. You get like a PR interval of 0.56. It's like, what, what the heck? Why is my PR interval 0.56? That's almost, that's literally possible, right? And you take a closer look and you realize that the P waves and the QRSs are, diff, are on their own thing. They're not, they're not married anymore. They are divorced. All right, so this is a little algorithm you want to study and you want to kind of write out a couple of times. Like my PR interval greater than 0.20. Well, shoot, I got a, I probably have an AV block in my hands. And then do they have a drop beat? Well, the PR interval is prolonged. I got an AV block, so now I got to figure out is it first degree, second degree, or third degree, right? So if I have drop beats. That's only what kind of degree? Second degree. So now I have a second degree type what? Type one or type two? Well, is it get longer, 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 and then dropped? That's type one. If it's just long, or this PR interval is long and then it just drops, well, shoot, that's a type second degree type two, okay? So if my PR is greater than 0.20, my next question I can ask myself, is it ridiculous? If it is ridiculous, congratulations, you're a third degree heart block, right? There's some other clues you can look at, but that is the big clue that it's a ridiculous PR interval. If it's not, it's like 0 0.24, 0 0.28, that is, that's just a first degree AV block, okay? There's a Q poem here but that might help you figure it out, but then it uses the, the guys who discovered the, the, the AV blocks. It doesn't really help me that much. Okay, so that's the idea behind blocks, right? And they become very troublesome because people try to memorize what they look like. But when you try to do the algorithm, you'll get it every single time. Okay, so let's do some practice with them and then we'll finish up with FTP. All right, so number one. So what's going on number one? Is the PR interval prolonged? Is it greater than how many boxes? One big box, one big box is 0.20. So if I'm bigger than one, look at this guy right here. This guy's, this is definitely bigger than one big box. So my PR interval is yes, greater than 0 0.20. So I have an AV block in my hands. Is it first, second, or third? Well, is there a P wave after every QRS? Yes. So that means it's not a second degree. Because second degrees have blocked, have dropped beats, right? The other thing that really is a, a shortcut is, is it regular or irregular, right? Because which ones are irregular, first, second, or third? All second degree blocks, no matter what, 100%, there's no exceptions, are always irregular. Okay? So if I have like a P wave and a QRS and I have irregularity, that's not AFib. Remember I said like 8.5 times out of 10 irregular rhythms are AFib. But if I have like a P wave and a QRS, it's like, well, now I'm going to switch gears. It might be a second degree AV block. Okay? So number one is what? First degree AV block is, is only half credit. That's like saying, I want to order some meatballs. Some people order meatballs, but what's the spaghetti? That's just sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block. Okay, next one. It's regular, so it's either first or third degree. Is it third degree? Third degree means you, means you have ridiculous PR intervals. It's getting there. That PR interval right here is getting pretty long. 0 0.20, 0 0.32. 
but there's a PQ, P followed by every, there's a QRS following every P wave, all right? So that is a sinus rhythm because we measure the rate, it's 60 to 100 with a first degree AV block. Next one, that looks somewhat what, regular or irregular. It kind of looks irregular, but if I were to march these out, it probably lines, it probably, that looks pretty regular to me, right? This one might be fooling us, but look at the, P, the PR interval. What's the PR interval here? 0 0.20, 0 0.40, 0 0.56, 0.58. That's ridiculous. I've got a ridiculous PR interval in my hands here, right? So really, and then how would I confirm that? If I look at the, the P rate here, there's my P rate. Right, so that is a, those those are different. So if I have, an, that, that's AV dissociation, H or ventricular dissociation, that is a third degree AV block. Let's see if I, yep, third degree AV block. Next one, what's this one? That looks regular or irregular? That looks regular, no? Or irregular? It looks irregular. Look at this space right here and this space right here. Those look different. So I got a P for every QRS, but look at this PR interval here. Look at this PR interval here, and look at this P wave here. There's, I'm missing something. I got a drop QRS. I got a drop QRS there as well, All right? So that's automatically we're in a second degree, right? Second degree means drop QRS, and irregular means also uh, a second degree. So that means we have a second degree type one or type two. The only difference between the between the second degree type one and second degree type two is if the PR gets longer, longer, longer drop or if it's just PR is long and drops. So is it just PR long and drops, or is it longer, longer, longer? So longer, longer, longer is second degree type one. All right, so then next one, what's that? I got a P wave here, and I got a drop QRS, right? I got a P wave and a QRS there, but is this trying to fool me, or is this actually a, a drop QRS or not? Because look at this PR interval here. That's 0.48. That is kind of ridiculous. So I could say, well, maybe that's a drop QRS. I expect one there, but that's also a ridiculous PR interval. So how do I know which one's which? If it's a drop QRS or if it's third degree. I don't know if it's second degree or third degree. Is the regularity, right? The regularity is going to tell me as well. All right, is that regular or irregular? It looks pretty regular, so that's a third degree AV block. Oh, that's messed up. That should be number five. And number six, what's that one? That's definitely a third degree AV block. There's, or there's actually there's a lot of. We got P wave QRS. You can expect QRS is here, right? So that's actually a second degree. Number six. Yeah. So I, these are both. This is third degree up here. Sorry. I'll. I'll update this, but this is a, you got a, I don't know, that's, you got P wave, you expect a QRS there, so that is, I, again, I would not fool you and make it, make you think, because there's a wide complex there as well. It looks like a secondary type two. All right, but up there, third degree AV block, do you agree? Look at this PR interval right here. That looks mighty ridic ridiculous, right? There's no drop complexes. You can see the QRSs are nice and even, right? QRS are nice and even, so it's a regular rhythm, but ridiculous PR interval, that is a AV block. This one measured it for us. We've got a 0.31 QR, uh, sorry, PR interval. Do we have any drop QRSs? No. Is there a P wave fo followed by a QRS? Yes, right? So that is a, a first degree AV block, okay? And then the next one, look at the, those little eyes are getting longer, right? So it's longer, 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 and then dropped. So the secondary type one is the one that gets longer, longer, longer dropped. Number 10, what's going on there? I got a PR interval that's prolonged and I got a missing beat. Look how this is irregular. That's what clues me in that I probably have a missing beat. I'm missing a beat here as well. I'm missing a beat here as well. I'm dropping QRSs left and right. Is it getting longer, 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 or is it staying the same? Staying the same makes it a second degree type two. All right, and then 
I said type 1 there, it should be type 2. All right, so number 11, what's that? We got a definitely dropped QRS there. So that's irregular. Is it getting longer, 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 or is this the same? It looked the same. So it's a secondary type 2. And again, you have this is flavor on top of your underlying rhythm. All right, number 12, what is that? At 0.46 PR interval. It looks like maybe there's P followed by QRS, but what's going on here? We got 0 0.25, 0 0.46 in long. It's almost borderline ridiculous, but look at how it's irregular. If it's irregular, that means it's a second degree block of some sort. So is it type 1 or type 2? Second degree type 1. Okay. I said third degree. That's actually, sorry, I made a mistake there. Second degree type 2. Type 1. All right, so then what's number 13? That looks irregular. So I have a drop QRS right here. I got a drop QRS right here. Is it getting longer, longer, longer? No, it's just staying the same, but then it just drops. So that's the secondary type 2. All right, and then what's the number 14? That looks really weird, but those little dots here are the P rate. The P is doing its own thing. It's divorced, but also it's a regular rhythm. So we know it's either first or third, but how do I know if it's a third? Well, it's a ridiculous PR. So if you look at the PR interval here, for instance, it's like 0.5 as a ridiculous PR interval. All right, number 10, what is that? Do I have dropped QRSs? Not really. Look at how regular this is. And that looks like it could fool us, but look at this PR interval here. That is a crazy long PR interval. It's doing its own thing. So they are divorced. They're AV dissociation. All right, number 16. What is number 16? We just got a prolonged PR interval. That's pretty much it. There's no drop QRSs, right? There's a P following every QRS. So if there's no drop QRS, as we've already said, it's not second degree. So it's either first or third. How do I know if it's first or third? There's association. There's P wave QRS, P wave QRS. Okay, so that's a first degree AV block. What about number 17? What is that? That's a third degree. Why? Because A, the PR interval is ridiculous here, but also look at the P rate. This kind of little dots kind of helped us out, but it's... That's our P rate doing its own thing. Look at the P, P wave buried inside that ST segment. All right, it's doing its own thing while the ventricles do their own thing. This one, that looks regular or irregular, number 18. It's irregular. I got a drop QRS here. Is my P PR getting longer, 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 or is the PR the same? If the PR is the same, that means it's a second degree type 2. Okay, so second degree AV block type 2. What about 19? I got it's a second degree. Why do I know it's a second degree? Because it's irregular and also I got QRS complexes missing, right? It's the back of a milk carton. I don't know where they're at. So do I have longer, longer, longer drop or is the PR interval the same? PR interval is the, the same every time, right? It's not getting longer, it looks the same. So it's a secondary AV block type, type two. All right, what about number 20? Yeah, there's, it, they're doing their own thing. Look at the ventricle rate. There's one, there's one, it's super, super slow. And the P waves are doing its own thing. And they're even buried inside the ST segment and such. Number 21, what is that? I got regular rhythm there. It's probably a little bit too fast for a third degree AV block. But also, are there drop QRSs? No. So it's either first or third. So it's a first. Why is it first and not third? I got P wave QRS, P wave QRS, P wave QRS. There is association there. They are not divorced. Right? What about 22? So that's a first degree AV block, right? So we have a prolonged PR. There's no drop QRSs, right? First degree AV block. All right, 23, what is that? We got 
stuff that's dropped, right? We got an irregular rhythm, so it's a second degree AB block. Therefore, it's, how do I know if it's type one or type two? Is it longer, 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 or is it the same every time? See, look how this is kind of short, that's longer, and then it's dropped. That is a second degree AB block type, type one. What about 24? There's a P wave following, every, or so there's P wave QRS, P wave QRS, so it's not dissociated. So it's not third degree. It's not ridiculous either. So that's a first degree AB block. What about number 25? The P waves are doing their own thing, right? Maybe that one's already buried right there. It's doing its own little thing. So also the rate's like super, super slow. And how do I know it's not first degree? Well, there's, well, you could say, oh, maybe there's drop QRS complexes. But not really. The P rate and the R rate are, are doing their own thing. Same thing with number 26. Number 26, uh, are they doing their own thing? No. Look at look they got P wave QRS. P wave QRS. P wave. Whoop, where'd you go? Right? P wave QRS. P wave QRS. We just drop complexes all all of a sudden. Also, that's irregular. The fact that it's irregular makes it look like a makes it a second degree AV block. Okay, all right. So XAP, we're gonna skip that section. You still have to know it. It's it's not it's not terribly you know hard to understand that one is wide, one is narrow. If you're looking at PVC versus PACs, okay. So PV, you don't have to know PJCs if you read that somewhere, but PVCs and PACs, right? And our last slides, last two slides are just summarized uh, everything we've been talking about. What are the causes? What are the treatments? And what do the you know indicate the nursing interventions have to do for our patients? All right, so PVCs versus PACs, really quick, quick tack on here. So PVCs, they are going to be wide. So how do you know you have a PVC or a PAC? One of them's wide, one of them's narrow. Which one's wide? That's going to be the PVC. What is wide? I'm talking about the QRS. The QRS is wide. It is a PVC. QRS is, wit. QRS is narrow. That's a PAC. We're not really talking about PJCs right now. That's not what you're responsible for. A PVC is wide and irregular, and it happens where you don't expect it. It happens all of a sudden, right? All of a sudden, you got a, a premature contraction of the ventricles, or it could be, and it could be a PVC most commonly, or a PAC. The only way you tell the difference between a PVC and a PAC are early beats, and one's wide, one's narrow. So what causes it is ischemia. A, and your lights can be low, right? When your lights are low, your heart is uh, more prone to get depolarized real quick, such as a PVC or a PAC. So it's the same causes for both, really, right? And then stimulants. So uh, drinking too much caffeine, more than 400 milligrams in nursing school per day might do it, all right? And again, characteristics are it's irregular. The PVC is wide and bizarre. Okay, and it's always why there's not a PVC out there in the world that is narrow, just PACs can be narrow, right? And PACs, as we'll come to find out, have a P wave preceding it because they came from the atria. Uh, PVCs come from the ventricle, they're premature ventricular contractions, therefore, they're YQRS, no P wave before it. Okay, there's no real treatment until you have how many in a row? Three in a row, three plus equals VTAC. All right, so again, dangerous PVCs, three in a row equals VTAC. And what's worse, whether you have polymorphic or monomorphic, and how do I tell, heck do I tell if it's mono or polymorphic? So this is coming from the same site, same source in the ventricle, whether it be the right or the left, whereas a polymorphic comes from multiple sites. So you can see, for instance, let's see a good one. This one came from over here in the bottom left. This one came from a different part of the ventricle. This came from, looks like almost another part of the ventricle. That is much more dangerous than just one source uh, of one little ectopic site. You don't want to have multiple ectopic sites. Otherwise, you're putting us at risk for not only VTAC, but also VFib. Okay? And also, it's not great to have them in a row. If you have two in a row, that's called a couplet. Three in a row, that's called a triplet. And three plus really is VTAC. Right, and that requires intervention. So here we have multiple um, PVCs. Uh, sorry, PVC that's happening on the on the T wave, and that's causing us to have polymorphic VTAC. Right, so that puts us at risk. Bigeminis not great because that can lead to just 
plain old VTAC. The next you go from quadrigemony to trigemony to bigemony to just unigemony or VTAC, right? That's an ectopic focus. So if this keeps going faster and faster and faster and faster, more frequently, that is VTAC, right? So this you can this rhythm right here, you can see every other beat that's bigemony. So bigemony versus couplets, you can kind of see the difference. Couplets is just a pair, whereas bigemony is a pattern where it's every other. This is every other second beat. So it's one, two, trigemony, one, two, trigemony, one, two, trigemony. And here's one, two, three. And there's a little quadrigemony, one, two, three, quadrigemony, right? So that's a way to tell a difference with PVCs. There's different characteristics of PVCs. All right, so PACs. Are PACs wide or narrow? PACs are narrow because they came from a ectopic site inside the atrium. The little spot in the atrium is irritable and it fires off and it gets conducted normally via the uh, his Purkinje system and normally through the ventricles. The ventricles are not impaired. It's just a premature atrial contraction. All right, so you have a P wave that's going to look different. So if you look at this P wave here, that's the intrinsic P wave, and this P wave is kind of early, right? You can also tell over here, for instance, all right, we got this P wave. This is actually by Gemini. Not a beautiful example. This is a good, better example here. All right, there's our normal P wave, normal P wave, normal, normal, normal. This beat came early, right? And look at this P wave upside down, right? So that is a not from the normal SA node. That is from somewhere else. Okay, in the atria. And because it came from the atria, it's going to go down the AV node like normal, and it's going to be a narrow complex. All right? So PACs versus PVCs, what's the difference? One has a P wave. Which one's that? That is our PACs. And which one is narrow? That is our PACs. Which one's wide? PVCs. Which one's early? Both of them are early ectopic beats that happen unexpectedly. Okay, so a little practice here. So what is this? Well, they are all narrow. So that clues us in. It's probably a PAC if this is the PAC chapter. But how would I know, recognize this if it wasn't the PAC chapter? Look at this irregularity here. So this is irregular. This rhythm looks irregular. Why is it irregular? Well, I would probably bet money might be AFib, but I see P waves. So the fact that I'm seeing P waves might think and it's irregular it's like well maybe shoot they have a dropped qrs complex and they have a second degree type one or type two av block but look the pr interval is nice and narrow it's less than one big box so it's not that so what's the other option i got a little pac look how different this pac is that this little p wave than the normal p wave so it came from somewhere else in the atria an ectopic site All right so this is just p a pac but is that the the completion of our interpretation. No, PAC is a extra spice on, on our, our rhythms. So we have to identify the underlying rhythm and what's the underlying rhythm. So let's find a normal, this guy kind of lines up 300, 150, 175. This is sinus rhythm. Is it normal sinus rhythm? No, because normal sinus rhythm does not have PACs. Okay, so that is sinus rhythm with PACs. Next guy. So I got narrow complex, wide complex. Why do I have a wide complex every other beat? All right, is that expected? No. So the fact that it's wide and it's not expected makes it a PVC. And what's the underlying rhythm? Um, it's hard to, hard to tell if it's sinus rhythm or sinus tack, but this is you know actually pretty regular, and this PVC is occurring regularly. This PVC has a pattern to it. So this is happening, what, every other every other beat so that's called bigemony all right so it's probably sinus rhythm with bigemony a little t wave inversion too yep right before the pvc a little t wave inversion and this is getting a little close for comfort that's going to be right on top of that t wave okay all right number three so everything's narrow but it's irregular yeah i got p waves so it's not a fib so why is it what's going on when i have p waves and an irregular rhythm so maybe i could have a drop beat but that's not the case this is just early beats here little pacs that are early and you can tell how the p wave looks a little bit different between these two okay that's a clue to say that if it's early and narrow it, and it has a p wave which it does that's a pac all right next one Ooh, that's wide and irregular 
it's already a PVC, and I can maybe name it as well, give me give more detail. If that PVC happens every what? One, two, three beats. One, two, three beats. So that is trigeminy. Why is it not a triplet? Triplets are one, two, three, and then your regular rhythm, right? This is happening every third beat. And that's, again, spice. So this is sinus rhythm with PVCs. I can be more specific. I can say with trigeminy or trigeminal PVCs. Okay, next one. Well, I have like a bundle branch block under, underlying it. So that's a little, that's thrown us for a little bit of loop, right? But look at this P wave. There's our normal P wave, normal P wave, normal P wave. But look at this P waves upside down. So that is a, uh, looks pretty fast too. So it's a sinus tack with a PAC, right? Does it happen to have a pattern to it? Got one there, one there, one there. Yeah, it's happening every fourth beat. So I got one, two, three, four. That's supposed to be a one and a two. Then we got one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That is a quadrigeminy, quadrigeminal PAC, and it's sinus tack with a quadrigeminal PAC. Okay. And also a bundle branch block, forgot about that. And also we said our PAC was quadrigeminal, if we're looking at more patterns there. All right, next one, we got a wide QRS complex amidst normal stuff, right? And again, this is happening every fourth beat, looks like. So this is a quadrigeminal PVC, all right, amidst a sinus rhythm. Is that really sinus rhythm? Let's double check our work here. So we got, let's find one that lines up pretty nicely. This guy lines up, we've got 300, 150, 100. It looks like it's almost sinus tack. Also, remember this is irregular, so we can use, we should be using our um, our 300, or sorry, our 10x method, where we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight beats in the that six second strip. So that's a heart rate of 80. Okay. All right. What else we got here? We got a premature beat there. So you can see that this P wave looks different than this P wave. It's also a narrow complex. There's some ST depression there. But this is sinus Brady with a uh, ST depression with a PAC. What's next? We have a big PVC. Look how different those PVCs are. That's a multifocal or um, polymorphic PVC, right? And it's definitely PVC. Why do I say PVC and not PAC? Because it's a um, it's wide, bizarre. It's like, well, shoot, the underlying rhythm is also wide. They might have a bundle branch block. Why is this not the one in like number five? Well, it's because there's no P wave really preceding this, right? That I can I anticipate. Okay, so that's a multifocal PVCs. And also, those first gravy block. We didn't mention that. Just look how big that's bigger than a bigger than a big box, right? Here definitely has some ST elevation, right? The ST, that's supposed to be a straight line. So you can see the ST elevation is there, there, all the way across. And then we have an early beat right there, all right? It looks the same as the other ones, so it's just early. And so it's probably getting a little ectopic site. So that's a PAC, but it's definitely pretty fast. This looks like a fast rhythm here, right? 300, 150, 100 beats per minute, and it has a PAC thrown in the mix. All right, so sinus tack with a first degree AV block. Shoot, missed it again. So you can see how that's bigger than a big box. So there's a first degree AV block, some ST elevation, and PJCs. We're not going to fool you with PJCs. We'll just stick to PACs for now. But technically, yes, I don't really see a P wave on this one. So that would technically be a PJC when you, when you discuss PJCs, which we can talk about more at clinic. All right, so I added these ones in here. So we got a wide complex all of a sudden. So that's definitely PVC. I mean, am I gonna say this happened every one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven? What is eleven? Octo plus tri? I don't know. Is that is that gonna be no, there's not really a real pattern to it, but it is just unifocal. It just looks the same, given the same sight in the ventricles. There's definitely a fast rhythm. So it's sinus tack. Well, is it sinus tack? Well, I don't really see P waves, so it might be SVT, right? It's a really fast rhythm. It came from the atria because it's narrow, so it's SVT with PVCs. Yeah, proximal SVT with unifocal PVCs. This definitely looks like some flutter activity here. We got three flutter waves there. We got three there, three there. We got three there, and then all of a sudden we got a big PVC, right? So we got a flutter with PVCs. 
a flutter usually is 3 to 1. It's rate controlled because the heart rate is what? 60 to 100. And here we got some PVCs. Oh, shoot. Because well, how do I know the PVCs? They're wide, irregular. There's also what's, what's called a compensatory pause afterwards, which is extra credit. But you got two PVCs there, and they look different in shape. That's not good. That's really set us up for VTAC. If I just had three beats there, that'd be VTAC, right? I got a P wave and a QRS complex. My heart rate is pretty fast. My underlying rhythm is 300, 150, but 140. And I got some two PVCs in a row. That's not good. Sinus tack with uh, multifocal PVCs. By Geminal. Mm, that's, that's actually an error. That is a couplet. All right, and then next, everything's narrow but irregular, and I got some P waves, so that's leaning me more towards a um, some PACs on my my rhythm here. And then I got a little P wave right there, which looks different than this P wave here. So I got a P wave, I got a PAC almost every other beat, right? Almost. So not a true pattern there, but I have what happened this is irregular so i got one two three four five six seven eight nine i got a rate of 90. i got sinus rhythm right with pacs okay up top i got a this wide rhythm right here we'll learn about next semester that's an idioventricular rhythm but the key thing is i got a pvc mixed in this idioventricular rhythm that's a pvc attached to it okay so you'll talk about that next semester but this one we know about, we got a P wave, we got a QRS followed by a QRS, and we got a PVC here, PVC there, PVC there. How do we know it's not a PAC? Because it's wide, right? And it's, I know my normal rhythm is narrow, so it's a wide complex thrown in the mix here. So also what's concerning here is it looks different every time. That's called a multifocal PVCs. Do they happen every beat? Just about, yeah multifocal pvcs here we got almost it looks like a borderline bundle branch block but we definitely have an abnormal situation here so that's a pretty fast rhythm sinus tack with pvc all right and what's next this looks pretty dang slow we got 300 150 100 75 60 50 we're going really really low there and we got a pvc to proceed it Sinus braided with the PVC. And right down here, we got, that looks pretty early. Got a space in here for some reason. So that's abnormal. This P wave is like all over the place. That looks normal. That looks normal. But then we have this early PAC. It's narrow. It has a P wave. It ab, it's occurs earlier than, than expected, premature, if you will. And that's considered a PAC, sinus rhythm with a PAC. All right, some more practice. So we got pointing to a P wave that is upside down. So it's coming from somewhere in the atria, probably close to the AB junction, and it's early. This looks like a slow rhythm, right? So this is a sinus Brady, or let's we've got a first degree AB block there too. Look at that, it's longer than a big box. This might be computer generated. I'm not sure if this is an accurate patient or not, but sinus Brady with a first degree AB block, plus we got a little PAC thrown there. Let's see what we got here. Yep. And then next, we got our normal intrinsic rhythm is a narrow complex, and they got this huge pause here. So that looks like some AFib in there, because those aren't really, you know, P waves to write home about. And I got a little couplet right there, and I got a big PVC right there. They look different. That's not great. So I got AFib with a what rate? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. AFib rates controlled with some PVCs. A PVC and a little couplet as well. This guy, everything's narrow, and I got a P wave QRS, P wave QRS, and this looks a little bit different than this guy over here, right? So I got a PAC proceed on unexpectedly. I got a premature beat. It's early. This little PVC, this little B right here is earlier than expected. Otherwise, everything's regular. I just got that early PAC. So it's a sinus rhythm looks like with a PAC. All right, and then this guy. There's my normal intrinsic rhythm right here, and then I have a um, wide, bizarre, early complex that looks different every time, which is not good. It looks like multifocal 
bigeminal PVCs attached to my sinus rhythm there. Okay, and then I got uh, so it's like plus multifocal, multifocal. All right, and then this guy 23, we got a wide early complex, no P wave, but also it's super wide, and our normal rhythm is narrow, so that tells me this is unexpected. So this is a what, sinus rhythm. We got 300, 150, 100, just borderline. Might be sinus tax, sinus rhythm, somewhere in there with a PVC. Okay, and over here we got a miss. Is that a drop beat? Mm, let's see what's going on. We got P wave QRS, P wave QRS, P wave QRS, and this actually might be a block thrown in here. This might be an error because that's that's unexpected. That P wave actually didn't get conducted. It's an early PAC, but didn't get conducted because they might have an AV block of some sort. So that's a little bit tricky. I would not do that to you. Okay, that PAC is is missing in action. MIA. Okay, that's supposed to say MIA. All right, and the next one, we got a PVC, PVC, looks the same, but it's every other beat, right? So that's uh, bigeminal PVC. And the underlying rhythm looks pretty slow. One, two, three, four, five, six. If I multiply by 10, it's a heart rate of 60, but it looks pretty slow. It might be a sinus Brady with, a, um, with bigeminal PVCs. Let's see what we got here. Yep, all right, this guy. PVCs look good, it's happening every one, two, three beats. So that has a pattern to it. So that's what's called bigeminy, trigeminy, quadrigeminy. That is trigeminy. How do I know that's not a PAC? Well, there's no P wave, but also it's wide. It's wider than the underlying rhythm. Okay, so it's sinus, but not the too fast. What, 300, 150, 100? So it's between 60 and 100, so sinus rhythm with PVCs. What kind of PVCs? Trigeminal PVCs. And this one right here, this is we kind of just demonstrated this in the slides, but we got a PVC that happened right on the T wave. We had a PVC before, we had a PVC right there. That one almost did it. And we got a, this PVC is right on the T wave, it's R on T. And now we've gone from multifocal bigeminal PVCs into torsades de point. They got a torsades pattern to a V tag that gets bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. So that's what we got there. We had sinus brady with bigeminal multifocal PVCs, which led to a RNT and torsades. All right, so EKG summary. So intervals and uh, important intervals are the PR interval, because that's going to tell you if you have an AV block or not, right? First thing is PR intervals prolonged, and then I have a drop QRS. That's a second degree AB block, but this PR interval is really going to be the first and it prompts us to figure out what's going if they have an AB block or not. QRS prolonged, that's just bundle branch block. It also might be a PVC, right? Especially if it's unexpected early. And then P wave morphology, T wave morphology, we're not really focused on. T wave inversion, ST segment stuff, that's more med search three. But QT, that is important to discuss, right? We have the QT all the way down here qt is important to just to figure out if they are at risk for torsage or not which they are if their qtc is prolonged greater than what greater than 0.45 okay and pr interval greater than 0.2 right so summary what are the causes and what are the symptoms what are the diagnostic tests i can do what are the um, complication, the treatment that I'm going to do for my patient. What are the complications? And then finally, what are the nurse interventions? This just summarizes everything we've been talking about. All right. Causes is just, it could, if you have, if it's not sinus tachycardia or sinus bradycardia, it's probably you have scar tissue or ischemia that's happening, you have myocardial ischemia, the heart attack in progress, or you have anatomical stretching and uh, valve issues or something going on that's making the heart not conduct correctly because it's been not a normal heart, but it's been stretched out atrial-wise or the right ventricle has been stretched out. So there's problems there that might be causing like a VTAC or this one might be causing an atrial TAC of some sort. It might put you at risk for PSVT or a flutter or AFib if it's very unor unorganized, right? And then irritants and electrolytes. The lower our electrolytes are, the more uh, prone we are to ectopic activity like PVCs, PACs, VTAC, tachyrrhythmias, and like, right? 
SNS causes an important thing that causes every tach arrhythmia. The only reason why someone has VTAC versus sinus tach is a person with VTAC has a sick heart that's anatomically scarred or has electrolyte issues, right? Otherwise, the own, yeah, you're still going to have a tachycardia because you still have hypoxia, you still have uh, acidosis, you still have fever, you still have stress and anxiety, right? It's just which heart is more sick. Is it a 75-year-old heart with multiple open heart surgeries or is it a 35-year-old heart, right? And then H's and T's, this is for all lethal rhythms. We want to examine and make sure if someone's heart has stopped or they're really, really sick and keep having these lethal rhythms, what are we missing? So this is H's and T's are designed to figure out why is our heart not working? Why is our heart rhythm not working? So this is a nice T right here and kind of almost an H. That's also a T. But anyway, so I thought there was an H there somewhere. That's my fault. So let's find out where the H went. There's a, there's a picture somewhere about an H. Either way, we got low volume circulating around, our blood pressure is low. That's going to make us have a VTAC if we have a sick heart, or that might have a sinus tac if we have an, an okay heart, right? Hypoxia we talked about, hypokalemia puts us at risk for episodes of uh, ectopy and VTAC and such, and VFib. Uh, hyperkalemia makes really bradycardic and PEA. Hydrant ion excess does the same thing. And actually, hydrant ion excess actually can cause a rise in potassium. Hypothermia causes really severe bradycardia to the point where we, our heart doesn't but beat at all, all right? Because it can't, those enzymes can't function. And pneumothoraces and tamponades is more like kind of leading towards trauma. But uh, MIs we've talked about and PEs, MIs, PEs especially risk factor for which arrhythmia is AFib. If AFib doesn't cause a stroke, it can put you at risk for a uh, pulmonary embolism, a, a clot that travels to the lungs. And then toxins. You can overdose on, on medications and, uh, and drugs that can make your heart go into a lethal rhythm. What's every patient can complain of if their heart rate's fast? Palpitations. It's for every tachyarrhythmia, right? Bradyarrhythmias, they're not going to have palpitations. They're just going to start not going to, they're going to have low cardiac output, just like you can get with fast rhythms. So you have chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion with any arrhythmia bradyarrhythmias or tachyarrhythmias, right? That's just a sign of poor cardiac output. And what's the worst one of these? That's hypotension, because that's going to tell us whether we can give our medications or not, right? Diagnostic tests you do for EKGs in general, 12 lead is our, our bread and butter. That's going to take a closer look to see what else is going on. Labs are looking for electrolytes, especially magnesium. The magnesium's low, all the other ones are low too. And also low mag is a risk for what lethal rhythm? For torsades. An echocardiogram, as we'll find out in cardiac, that's going to, you know, that's really the bread and butter of cardiac. So you can't figure out what kind of cardiac disease they have, throw, do an echocardiogram. An echocardiogram will, on a, if they figure out why they have all this AFib, you realize, oh shoot, look at how big their atria is, right? Or they have this valve issue or they have something going on there. And EPS study is a specialized thing. They can go and take a look at their heart in the cath lab, and they can look to see exactly where an ectopic site is, exactly where the AFib or A-flutter is coming from, exactly where the PVCs are. And they, if they, they can figure it out, they can go ahead and cook it at 95 degrees and stop that uh, ectopic site from causing problems. All right, so treatments. It's the underlying cause. That's always the right answer. Ages and T's are important for our lethal rhythms and for sinus tachycardias, you're treating the hypoxia, treating the fever, treating the low blood pressure, treating the low blood sugar, right? Treating the dehydration and low blood pressure, right? That's for all uh, tachyarrhythmias. For bradyarrhythmias, we mentioned dye was our uh, mnemonic for bradyarrhythmias. Are there drugs, ischemia, or electrolytes that are causing uh, problems? And we might need to treat those underlying problems, but in the meantime, we're going to hit them up with some atropine, some dopamine, epinephrine, and we might even need to pace them. All right, and then tachyarrhythmias. So again, what kind of medication you give? You give your ABCD drugs. Uh, you can give, if they have ventricular rhythms, amiodarone plays double duty, right? Amiodarone is the only one that does both. Beta blockers, calcium blockers that are non-DHP, and digoxin, those only work on the um, on the atria. And yes, there are there is an exception to one of the beta blockers, but we're not gonna get into that. All right. 
but when blood pressure is less than 90, it's time to shock them with cardioversion. And usually when the blood pressure is less than 90, the reason why you have a blood pressure is because you have a pulse, so we're doing synchronized cardioversion. You would not have a blood pressure if you had no pulse. That's a lethal rhythm, and you only shock certain lethal rhythms. Okay, but if you have a really, really fast heart rate and they still have a pulse, you're doing synchronized cardioversion. No pulse, it's CPR and epi, plus or minus uh, uh, a unsynchronized cardioversion or defibrillation. So you defib rhythms that have no pulse when it's not asystole or PEA. Everything else you shock, basically. And what is everything else? Well, there's only five, right? You have VFib, VTAC, and VTAC has torsades also. <clears throat> So that's three. And then we have our PEA asystole. We don't shock PEA asystole. We just do CPR and epi for all five of those, looking for the H's and T's at all times. And then we are going to either shock or not shock. What's shockable? VFib, VTAC, and a flavor of VTAC called torsades or polymorphic VTAC. Okay. What are the nurse interventions for every EKG ever? It's ABCs and less it is CABs, which is your compressions, airway, breathing. So when you do compressions first over airway and breathing, when there's no pulse, no pulse is compressions at first. Otherwise, you got time, you're going to get some oxygen, you're going to do some vital signs, especially the blood pressure, because the blood pressure will tell you if you're symptomatic or not and what medications you can or can't give. All right. And systematic approach, you can have a system to, <clears throat> a system to it, but Basically, as long as you hit all the boxes, that's what's important. To look to see if it's regular or irregular really guides you down the right path. What the rate is will then tell you even more, because if I have an irregular rhythm, it's probably AFib 8 times out of 10. But then I look to see, well, shoot, what's my rate? Do they have AFib RVR or do they have AFib that's controls? And then I look to see, do I have all my complexes? If I, if I have an irregular rhythm and a P wave, it's like, well, shoot, what do I have a, a block on my hands or what's going on? All right. Intervals are very important because how do I know I have an AV block? I have a PR interval that's prolonged, right? If my QT interval is prolonged, I need to be on the lookout and look to see if their patient's at risk for torsades, like what's causing the QT to be so prolonged, right? So PR interval greater than 0.20, that is an AV heart block. And all of our AV heart blocks are flavor to the underlying rhythm. The only exception is our third degree AV block. That's its own thing. Okay, so ischemia. So ischemia is a important thing to see uh, when MedSearch 3 comes around because that's always on our worrisome list because that requires everybody kicking the gear. That's a medical emergency if someone has ischemia on their EKG. Okay, and that you can tell that because of the ST or T wave changes. And then ectopy. That is just more flavor to add on to our sinus rhythms or to our AFibs and such. And that's going to be a PVC or PAC. There's such thing as a PJC, but we're just going to focus on PVCs and PACs. Why, Why is my heart, heart rate coming down? down? You're already having blown through straws like an idiot. idiot. Then, then you almost, almost drowned me in a bowl of ice water. water. <laughs> now none of the medications, medications were working. How, how are you guys going to get, get my heart rate down? down? You going to tell them? Tell me what. what? We're, We're going to have to electrocute, electrocute you. you. You're going to do, do what? what? Honestly, it's the, the only thing, thing left to do. I'm pretty, pretty sure, sure we got, got it down, down by now. now. What do you, what mean, do you mean pretty, pretty sure? sure? Well, I mean, well, I mean we, we shocked that, that guy on the P wave, and then uh, that, that guy shocked him on the T wave, and then uh, oh, this, this dude back here, we just closed our eyes, pushed the button, and hoped for the best. It was the best for him. But we're going to shock you on the R wave. Guys, I mean, R's got to be right. Right? Guys, got to be right. Guys, does it wrong start with R2? What? I don't know. Anyway, it's clear. Maybe next, Maybe next time. time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, think I think I beat myself. myself. Yeah, yeah, that happens. happens. All right, that's it. Thank you.